Hello everyone I wanted to. Try a different what if for Naruto and this what if is about how three years ago Naruto Uzumaki was marked as KIA by his superiors. Found in another dimension with little to no memory of his past or how he got there, Naruto was experimented by the organization who found him, Group 935. Several months after Naruto vanished, the elemental nations are invaded by an enemy that slowly adapts to their every move. Three years later. Naruto returns. Hope everyone enjoy and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Is it ready? A blonde-haired, blue-eyed teenage boy asked. A middle-aged man with blue eyes and short-cut blonde hair nodded. His attire consisted of an open-buttoned light green military-grade jacket with the sleeves rolled up. Revealing the man's arms. Underneath the jacket he wore a black shirt with dog tags hanging loosely from his neck. A cartridge belt was over the jacket with a sheathed combat knife securely underneath. His combat trousers which were the same color as his jacket, leather leggings and brown boots were covered in dry mud and blood. Hanging from his shoulder was an M-16 assault rifle. AM-1911 Colt. Was holstered securely at his waist. The boy he is talking to, is Naruto Uzumaki. However, unlike the boy who always wore a smile when he was younger. He is older, wiser, and had a stoic look on him that didn't seem right to see on his face. His bright blue eyes that seemed to draw people in, had dulled over the years he had grown. Unlike his fellow blonde who was a fully-fledged soldier, Naruto wore clothes that were the exact opposite of what he wore when he was younger. There wasn't a speck of orange anywhere on him. Instead the blonde-haired, blue-eyed teen wore a pair of olive-colored trousers and black boots that are dirted with mud and dried blood and a light green jacket with the sleeves rolled up to show off his bare arms. Like his fellow blonde Naruto had a M1911 holstered at his waist. However this one had a silver cameo look to it and was engraved. He also had a M14 assault rifle too it being one of his favorite weapons. Just about, Naruto. The man answered with a heavy American accent. He frowned looking concerned as he gazed toward the large gate-like mechanical structure in front of them. But are you sure you want to go through with this though? Going back to your birthplace I mean. He questioned as he tore his gaze away from the gateway and back to the kid. The teen let out a bitter laugh before looking at the man. Dempsey, we both know I hate the place where I was born. Back there I can scarcely remember being ignored by nearly everyone for most of my childhood. Even if I can't remember much of it, what I do remember leaves bitterness in my mouth that I can't get rid of. He sighed and shook his head as he ran a hand through his hair. A little backstory is needed for others to understand. Naruto Uzumaki has amnesia. The first thing he remembered upon waking up was him remembering his own name, age and day of birth. Other details such as where he came from, he could not remember. It wasn't long until he was found and promptly knocked unconscious before being taken to some secret facility. It was in this facility where he quickly found the people there were being experimented on by these scientists who are trying to see what side effects element 115 has when they've been injected into corpses and living people. He joined them days after he arrived and like the others had undergone the same experiments as the others. This had made his memories, which were barely there to begin with, get even worse than before. Naruto from then on was a blank slate. Having no memories except his name and age, and being able to talk. This was the primary reason for his change of attire. He didn't like the fact that his clothes were so bright and a new change of attire was needed. Urgently. He quickly learnt the people who were experimenting on him and the others are part of an organization called Group 935, who was researching in the ways of creating super soldiers, and super weapons. This involved a lot of experimentation on weapons development, and a lot of people being kidnapped to take part in these super soldier experiments. It was where Naruto first met Tank Dempsey, Nikolai Belinsky, Takeo Masaki for the first time and through them he met Dr. Edward Richtofen. 
For months he and the other three were experimented on by the doctor and his associates, being injected daily with element 115 and being studied for its side effects. It wasn't long until it was discovered there were several of them. Frighteningly most of these side effects were fatal. The ones who had survived the initial experiments, if he overheard them correctly had lost their memories, but became much more healthier and stronger. Their personalities would undergo some changes thanks to these side effects. Tank Dempsey's attitude becoming a lot more aggressive in nature. Nikolai Belinsky becoming a drunkard and himself not wanting to dress in sickeningly bright colors were perfect examples of personality changes. For those that haven't survived, what Naruto had heard of what became of them were pretty disturbing. Rumor was the dead had been reanimated and came back to life with glowing yellow eyes. But they were always out of control and aggressive. Even more disturbing is they had grown a taste for living flesh. Thanks to being a blank slate and retaining most of his personality, Naruto was able to befriend Nikolai, Takeo and Dempsey fairly quickly. When the three met him for the first time, they were all appalled how a child was undergoing these experiments and took it upon themselves to look after him. Takeo in particular was furious upon seeing Naruto being dragged away forcibly by scientists to undergo more experimentation. It took several people to subdue the man. Such was his fury at the dishonor the men had. It wasn't long until they began experimenting on other things other than humans. Naruto could vaguely remember Richtofen and, someone called Maxis, or Maxwell, testing a new piece of technology that could theoretically teleport people from one place to another. Their subjects to test these out, were at first the walking dead. But every time they tried to teleport them to the mainframe outside, they always turned up dead. Again. So they moved on to the living. They couldn't test the test subjects who were being experimented on with element 115, so they had to use other methods, such as dogs. That didn't turn out so well however. Edward Richtofen, who had mysteriously gone under some rather drastic changes, betrayed his leader during one of the experiments. Then he set the undead who were trapped loose upon the facility, presumably killing everyone in the process while he freed Tank, Nikolai, Takeo, and himself before bringing them along to sure no Numa to begin a master plan they had no idea about. Through their journey together, fighting zombies and other monstrosities, the four began to recover bits and pieces of their past life and learn more about Group 935 and the people who were part of it. A little girl, who was the daughter of Dr. Maxis, or Maxwell, was the one who was sending the dead after them because of what Richtofen did. Throughout all this, through their journeys, everyone began to realize what was going on. They promised that once this was over and done with, they would take care of Richtofen. They never tried killing him during these different locations however, since he was more useful to them alive than dead. Plus he seemed to understand what the hell they were doing. The rest from there is history. Do not worry comrade. If you want us to come with, just say word. Nikolai exclaimed loudly. Nikolai Belinsky is garbed in a standard Red Army uniform, with the addition of a cloth tied over his head like a bonnet. He carried a sack on his back. No one ever found out what was in it, but there was a running gag between Dempsey and Naruto that. That is where the Russian keeps his vodka. Since he is always drunk, even in the middle of combat. I do want you all to come with me. I want people who I trust to watch my back. Good. It would not do if you were to go alone. Takeo said as he walked up to the blonde with a stoic look on his face. The palm of his hand resting on the hilt of his katana. He had a Type 100 hanging from his shoulder. It would bring me much dishonor, if you were to go alone. Takeo Masaki is a samurai and a former solitor in the Japanese Imperial Army who has a high belief in honor and discipline. To him dishonor is unthinkable and would not hesitate to strike you down should you insult him, his family or his ancestors. After fighting side by side with Nikolai, Dempsey and Naruto he has mellowed out. And he is highly protective of the whisker-faced blonde. Naruto chuckled softly at that. Out of everyone I know, I trust you three the most. That about me? A feminine voice asked in a thick German accent. 
Naruto smiled and turned to the person who spoke. Correction, I trust the four of you the most. Samantha Maxis, the daughter of Dr. Ludwig Maxis and their former antagonist who controlled the zombies. After Richtofen had tricked Dempsey and the others into completing his grand scheme, he had switched bodies with Samantha, becoming the new master of the undead while she was trapped in his old body. Luckily for her she found a body of a teenage girl that was not reanimated when she got off the moon with the others. She was able to possess the body, leaving behind Richtofen's to rot. Long ago when they were still on the moon neither Tank, Nikolai or Takeo trusted her. After all she had done to them they had no reason to trust her. The three were considering getting rid of the girl once and for all after all the grief she put them in. Hearing that from them made something snap in Naruto. Getting up in their faces he admonished them. Telling them not to blame her for something that was out of her control. They all knew what Richtofen did to her and her father, and, bringing that point to their attention, he asked them what would they have done in her place. Would they have done the same thing if they were in her position? The only reason she sent the undead after them in general was because they were helping Richtofen, and after learning what he had done they still helped him when they could have easily turned against him. It was through Naruto vouching for her that Samantha was allowed to stay with them. But Dempsey gave her a not to subtle warning in front of everyone, if you stab any of us in the back, there won't be anywhere in the world where you can hide, good. Samantha said with a relieved smile. I would have been worried if you had forgotten about me. I cannot believe we are going to use this teleportal gateway to return to your home comrade. Belched out Nikolai as he staggered he way toward the group, holding a bottle of near-empty vodka in his left hand, and a drum magazine PPSH-41 in his right. I wonder what is like over there, eh? He wondered before taking another swig of vodka, emptying the entire bottle in one breath before he tossed it carelessly aside. Everyone looked toward Naruto expectantly for the answer. Blinking at the looks he was being given Naruto stared for a moment, before he deadpanned at them. Just because I came from there, you think I know the answer? He asked, to which they nodded simultaneously, causing him to shake his head. He said to them, I barely remember anything there. But from what I do remember they are not as advanced technology-wise. What do they use then if not guns like us? Dempsey asked, looking suddenly curious. Naruto rubbed his chin, scrunching his face as he tried to recall what little he remembered from his childhood. From what I remember in school, the academy, or whatever they called it back there, they use this energy they call chakra. From what I remember, everyone back home has it and if you're trained from a young age to manipulate it, you can do all kind, of godlike shit. Being able to shoot a stream of fire from your mouth is an example. There was an astonished silence. It was suddenly broken when Dempsey contemplatively asked, Can you do that? This had gotten everyone apart from Naruto to stare at him as if he were an idiot. Naruto answered by forming a cross sign both with index and middle fingers. Closing his eyes to search for the inner energy he had, he grabbed onto it and as if it were instinct he pushed the energy into his digits. Soundlessly a cloud of smoke appeared beside him, causing everyone to jump back in alarm and reach for their weapons simultaneously. They were astonished to see, when the smoke cloud went away. Another Naruto wearing the same clothing as the original looking around the room curiously. Hesitantly Tank Dempsey approached the clone, reached up and shoved it lightly on the shoulder. The other Naruto grunted in surprise as he stumbled back a few steps before glaring up at the man who pushed him. In retaliation the other Naruto went over to Dempsey and shoved him back in the same way. Through all of this Naruto was watching in amusement. What he did just now didn't faze him. He didn't know what would happen when he made his fingers form that hand seal, and push his inner energy toward his digits. But when he did everything from there felt natural to him. Well, what do you know? I guess I can do it. Naruto said simply to Dempsey, as if he hadn't done anything that defied all logic in the world. Then the clone dispersed into smoke automatically getting everyone to stare at him with wide eyes. Naruto just blinked at them, what? 
Could you do that all this time? Dempsey slowly asked with a twitching eye. Naruto not seeing Dempsey's irritation answered honestly, honestly? If I did that now, then yes I could have done it back then. But take into account that back then I didn't know much of my own past. I didn't even know I could pull off shit like that, with much of my past gone in the first place. That answer erased Dempsey's annoyance toward the blonde. It made sense. When they all first met Naruto in Doris, he didn't even know where he came from. Much less how to fight. But when the undead were let loose on the facility and Richtofen busted them out, Naruto had been forced to adapt on how to use modern weapons. He had done this by observing them and copying what they've done. Through that learning process he was quickly able to help fight off the zombies. So how does this thing work exactly? Naruto asked turning to look at the gateway behind him. I assume we have to let it build enough power before pressing the big red button or something? Samantha answered that question rather eagerly. Vel from Vat I have gathered from my father's notes, it is a gateway to Zat brings you to another locations. It would require a small amount of power to activate. It was here Samantha sighed a little in annoyance. However, with Vat you are trying to do, to rip open a rift in the fabric of reality itself, it would, need a lot more energy than required. She then smiled brightly at them. Luckily for us however it is nearly done. That is good news. Naruto replied turning to give Samantha a smile of his own. So how long until it is completed? He questioned. A few more minutes. It should give us enough time to get ourselves ready for the journey to your world. Samantha answered giddily. Duh. Nikolai crowed, punching the air cheerfully. Let us arm ourselves for new journey to new land. Maybe they have vodka there too, no? He questioned looking at Naruto expectantly. Naruto in response shook his head negatively. He wasn't even sure if his homeland had vodka other than sake. Nikolai stared blankly, no vodka? That is blasphemy for this Russian. He threw his head back and cried out toward the sky righteously. Naruto covered his mouth to stifle the laugh that was threatening to come out of his mouth. This was why he liked Nikolai. He was just hilarious. And someone you can get along with. Once you get past the drunkenness first. Hey, if they don't have vodka, then maybe you can use that to your advantage? Use it to drink people under the table? Since that stuff is so strong it's not like people are going to be able to hold it in. Dempsey suggested to the Russian who liked the idea Dempsey provided. That is good idea. Play to my strengths. Naruto and Samantha stared at the two with amusement. Takeo was shaking his head in mild annoyance in the background. The American and Russian became the best of friends ever since they were trapped inside that ship in Siberia. They always did have some interesting conversations together. Takeo had always put up with their stupidity. It was a miracle the samurai hadn't snapped at them yet. Goes to show just how much patience the warrior has. And so the group waited patently for the gateway to build up the needed amount of power to get it working. They all checked their weapons. Making sure they were all fully loaded and that they had the needed amount of ammo for them. All of them had M1911 Colts on their possession. Along with three magazines including the one that was already in the chamber. Naruto and Dempsey for their primary weapons had M-16 assault rifles, along with five magazines along with the one already in the chamber to go with them. Takeo had a Type 100, and had the same amount of ammo as both Dempsey and Naruto. Nikolai had a PPSH-41 with four barrel magazines, including the one already on it, to go with it. Samantha Maxis had an MP40 and three magazines, including the one already in the chamber. They all turned to the gateway when it suddenly whizzed to life. They quickly backed away when electricity began to shoot through the cables connecting it to the outside. The energy buildup was insane. It was so big, so huge, they could actually see the energy racing across the metallic surface of the gateway. Giving it a glowing effect. Tank, Nikolai, Takeo, 
Samantha and Naruto looked at one another uncertainly. They weren't sure if this was going to work. The likelihood of this failing and blowing up in their faces was too high. They knew this. The worst that could happen is the structure exploding on them, bringing down the facility they were all in and killing them in the process. However luck was on their side. Thanks to the notes left behind by Dr. Maxis on the gateway the others, with Samantha translating word for word, was able to adjust the settings. So if the energy buildup reached critical, the gateway would automatically turn on while still gathering energy. It was good that had done that too. If they hadn't, not only would the gateway exploded from the overload of electrical power, they would have been killed from the energy released from said overload. The gateway stabilized after a few tense minutes of waiting. Then in the middle of the structure a portal opened showing the group their reflection. They saw the energy still going inside the contraption, most likely to keep it activated until they'd gone through. Tank whistled in awe at it. Dang. For a moment there I thought it wasn't going to work. He admitted. He turned to Samantha and asked, out of curiosity here, just what would have happened if it didn't work? The girl shrugged her shoulders looking a little clueless about the results herself. Your guess is as good as mine. The worst thing that could happen is the machine exploding, killing us in the process. The best thing, it would shut itself down before it could get any worse. Well. Naruto awkwardly began while scratching the side of his head. That's somewhat comforting. I think. He looked rather unsure at that. Coughing into his fist the young blonde looked to his companion in arms, so how should we do this? Hold hands as we walk in just in case we get split up. Nikolai shrugged his way past the others and made his way toward the portal with his PPSH-41 shouldered. He stopped just in front of the portal and turned to the others with a what could have been a cool smirk, if it not for the fact he was hammered. With his weapon raised above his head Nikolai yelled out, for the motherland, while everyone else was watching him in growing disbelief, bewilderment and realization. Please don't tell me he's going to do what I think he's going to do. Naruto pleaded with dread growing in the pit of his stomach. Before anyone could reply or stop the drunk, Nikolai leapt back into the portal leaving everyone there in a state of disbelief. There was an awkward silence in the room as everyone tried to comprehend what they saw. Yep. The moron just leapt into the thing. Dempsey stated blankly before pinching the bridge of his nose and sighing in mild irritation. He looked up and with another sigh, this one in reluctance. He approached the gateway while bringing the M-16 that was still hanging from his shoulder into his hands. This way he would be prepared for whatever was on the other side of that. And provide Nikolai with some support if he was in way over his head. Stopping in front of the gateway Dempsey turned halfway to look at the others and gave them a two-fingered salute. I'll see that Nikolai doesn't get himself in trouble. I'll see you all on the other side. With that said the former United States Marine turned back to the portal before stepping through, leaving Takeo, Naruto and Samantha on their own. Suddenly Takeo turned to the two youngsters. Particularly Naruto. He was concerned for the boy. Being ignored by everyone when you were a child. Having no parents to look out for you. Comfort you. Having that done to you as a child is bound to leave some scars. No matter how well they're hidden. With that in mind Takeo reached out to Naruto to take his hand. Seeing this the blonde narrowed his eyes in confusion before looking up. Perhaps it is not wise for us to go in separately. The samurai told him. It was mostly an excuse for him to make sure they don't get separated the moment they do step into the portal. Naruto nodded in confirmation. It did make sense after all, and took hold of his hand, while turning and offering his other one to Samantha who grabbed hold of it with a small smile. Nodding to them Takeo turned to the portal and holding the hands of Naruto and Samantha the three approached the gateway. They all stopped right in front of it then looked at one another before stepping through together as one. They were all blinded by a flash of light and they felt a sensation covering their body. As if they were being shoved through a tube. Then they felt weightless like they were flying in the sky. 
Lastly they felt their feet meet solid ground, and the cold biting winds against their skin. The three immediately fell to their knees gasping and gagging, as if they were about to hurl their guts up and out of their mouths. Hearing footsteps in front of them Takeo, Naruto and Samantha looked up and saw Tank and Nikolai walking over to them. They were frowning and appeared to be dragging something behind them. And that was never a good sign. It was then they finally took in their surroundings. Everything around them was nothing but ashes and dust. No grass. No trees, bushes or flowers. Everything was dead. Even the ground they were kneeling on was nothing but mud, ashes and dust. What the hell happened here? Naruto exclaimed in shock looking around with eyes wide in disbelief. I dunno, but it deals with something we five know all too well. Dempsey stated before he and Nikolai dropped whatever they were dragging to the ground. Moving out of the way so the three could get a better look, Naruto widened his eyes again, not out of shock but out of anger. The blonde bared his teeth aggressively in an angered snarl. It was a body. A very decayed body of a nameless man that was missing large chunks of flesh. There were teeth marks on the exposed skin too. His clothes, what remained of it, was a tattered black long-sleeved shirt and blue trousers, a torn dark green flak jacket, and arm guards that had claw marks on them. God fucking damn it. Naruto cursed under his breath. Dempsey nodded grimly before looking at the corpse with a deep frown. Yep. We're dealing with zombies. Again. Dempsey told them. Sighing Naruto took his M1911 from its holster and aimed the barrel of the gun at the top of the deceased man's head and pulled the trigger. The resounding bang echoed out to the distance. Naruto lifted the barrel from the man's dead and placed the weapon back in his holster with another sigh. He ensured the deceased man wouldn't rise up again. At least he won't rise up again to turn anyone else. The young blonde murmured solemnly. Getting up off the ground Naruto patted himself down and looked around. The portal the five came out from was long gone now, so there was no turning back for them. I wonder where the hell we are. You don't know? Dempsey asked incredulously. Of course I don't know. I have amnesia, remember? Naruto replied irritatingly. Shaking his head Naruto looked around again before bringing M-16 to his front and in his hands. Let's just, see where we are in terms of location first of all. If there are zombies about I want to know where the hell they're coming from. Dempsey gestured Naruto to take the lead. Then lead on kid. We'll follow since you know this place better than we do. Naruto growled in irritation. I have amnesia damn it. He complained but took point anyway. Smirking with amusement Dempsey followed the younger blonde and made sure to stay close to him. The others were quick to follow and do the same as Dempsey. They were rather protective of the young blonde they had befriended. Even if he could handle himself they still want to make sure he's safe from harm. They watch out for one another. It's what friends do after all. It is what Naruto would do. What is your name child? My name is Naruto Uzumaki. I don't remember where I live. Where I came from. I don't even remember the day I was born, only the month. Was Naruto's almost bored tone as he spoke into the radio recorder the German scientist provided him. Sitting opposite him was a bald elderly man with a white scruffy beard. His name is Ludwig Maxis. The leader of the organization who had found him, bloodied and unconscious in the middle of nowhere a few miles from Der Ries. That was three days ago and the blue-eyed whisker-faced blonde hadn't regained his memories as of yet. What is the furthest you can remember? Ludwig asked as he leaned forward on the table. Naruto scrunched up his face as he tried to think. He eventually shrugged, coming up with a blank. The furthest I can remember is literally three days ago when I woke up here. Ludwig sighed and stopped the tape recorder from playing, having heard all he needed to from the Asian in front of him. It appears, young one, that you have a severe case of amnesia. Now I see two possibilities. Either it will resolve itself in time, 
or you may never regain your memories. Naruto shrugged his shoulders not looking bothered at all. Oh well. It's just memories. I can easy replace those with new ones. Ludwig narrowed his eyes confusingly at the blonde. Do you not wish to know of your own past? Naruto crossed his arms against his chest and negatively shook his head. No, I don't. Why should I bother if I can't remember anything about that is worth bothering? XXXX. The Elemental Nations is in the middle of a crisis. Three years ago a month after the disappearance of one Naruto Uzumaki, the Elemental Countries was suddenly invaded by an enemy the likes no one had ever seen. With no explanation at all the dead started to rise from their graves and attack the living. In the beginning of the crisis the conflicts was easy. The shinobi and kunoichis of each hidden village were able to fend off the zombies during the first few weeks and were able to push them back. Just when the undead were close to being defeated something completely unexpected had happened, the zombies began to adapt to their method of attacks and the ninjas learnt that some of their attacks had little to no effect on the zombies themselves. It was quickly learned that Genjutsu was completely useless against the dead. Most ninja techniques that involves disturbing an individual's chakra network was also proven to be useless. Fortunately lot of the offensive techniques are still effective against the zombies and were able to keep the undead at bay. It was then they discovered another setback. The zombies adapted once again to their method of attacks and all of a sudden they became faster and more agile. They're now able to jump up several feet in the air, being able to reach places a normal person wouldn't be able to. All without the use of chakra. As the days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, more and more different type of zombies began to appear across the nations, overrunning countries that were not protected by a hidden ninja village within the span of a month. Within the first two years of this only the five hidden villages and a few others were left standing from the continuous onslaught of the undead. Humanity as a whole had suffered heavy casualties during the first two years. The zombies being able to adapt with each encounter and with new type of zombies appearing out of nowhere it was beginning to take its toll on the survivors. For two years it had gone like this. Two years that the hidden villages fought against the onslaught alone. And very rarely fought together. Two years since the zombies appeared out of nowhere. Tsunade Senja the fifth Hokage of Kanahagakur, knew unless they did something the complete and total annihilation of the human race would be inevitable. She called a Kage summit in the land of iron, and with all the Kages from their respective countries in one place Tsunade began to discuss the enemy that threatens all life as they knew it and suggested that they all band together to face their common foe as one, or die as many. It was the shortest Kage summit in the history of the elemental nations. Not only did the Kage agree with Tsunade they began to share information on what type of zombies they have encountered thus far and to their shock and horror they realized just how many there are. In total there was six types of undead. Kumogakure was where the sixth zombie type was spotted. It was almost completely impervious to damage and powered itself on electricity. The rakage I had learnt this the hard way when he tried to use his lightning armor against it, only for said armor to get absorbed and regenerate the zombie from any damage it had sustained. In the end, the Kage summit ended up with all the villages allying together and sharing their resources with one another and experiences with the different types of zombies they came across and what strategy they used to take them down when they're encountered. It was one year later and the alliance was still going strong but were at a stalemate with the undead legions that seemingly keeps on growing every day. And on the anniversary of Naruto's disappearance the elemental nations is about to receive a visitor from a familiar face who was long thought to be dead. XXXX. We find Tank, Nikolai, Takeo, Samantha and Naruto standing in front of a bridge. They're all staring up at the sign that had Japanese writing on it. For some reason Naruto was getting some weird deja vu vibes from just looking at it. It was like he had been here before, but he just can't remember when. Hey Takeo, what does that say? Dempsey asked as he jerked a thumb at the sign that is on top of a bridge the five were standing in front of. The Great Naruto Bridge. Takeo translated after a short bout of silence. 
The writing is in his language so Takeo was easily able to translate the kanji to English. The samurai looked at the craftsmanship and added, the bridge appears to have been recently crafted. Two to three years if I am correct. Naruto arched an eyebrow before chortling in amusement. Well, isn't that a kicker? There's a big-ass bridge that has my name on it. The whisker-faced blonde said with a shake of his head. Dempsey scanned the landscape on the opposite side of the bridge with narrowed eyes and saw it was in far better condition over there. There is a village on both sides of the bridge with a lighthouse on the right side. However being on the mainland that is only connected to the island through a bridge, which is almost a mile long, made the village appear abandoned to the naked eye. If they want to get a better look then they'll have to get closer. What do you say we cross the bridge and see what's what? Dempsey asked, turning to the others with an expectant look. Well we have nothing better to do than wander around aimlessly. Naruto answered with an almost bored sigh. He squinted his eyes, noticing the village up ahead. We might as well. If there are people in that village up ahead then they can at least tell us where we are in terms of location. Dempsey nodded in complete agreement with Naruto's assessment. They have no idea on where they are and information is something they sorely need. The only place that has this information happens to be the village on the opposite side of the Great Naruto Bridge. All right. Keep your eyes peeled and your weapons ready. With zombies lurking about we don't know what state the village up ahead is in, so get ready for the worst. Dempsey told them and upon seeing them all nod their head in agreement he turned around and walked across the bridge cautiously with the others following. Hopefully the inhabitants speak English too. If they don't they're going to have a problem. Unless Takeo translates what they are saying word for word for them. As for Naruto, the further he crossed the bridge the stronger his deja vu became. He narrowed his eyes as he looked around and they slowly lit up in recognition. He had been here before. The country they were about to go into was called the Land of Waves. Naruto uttered to himself causing everyone to look at him. Seeing the looks he was getting Naruto added, that is what the island we're going to is called, Land of Waves. A memory from your past? Nikolai asked. Do you know anything else about the island? Dempsey questioned Naruto after the blonde nodded in confirmation. Naruto narrowed his eyes in concentration as he tried to remember anything else from his already fractured memories. After a moment of tense silence the whisker-faced blonde finally got what information he was looking for and nodded. From what little I remember, where we're going to is a trading island. It stays on its feet by its shipping for trading and commerce with its neighbors. After that nothing much except for some fighting. Which was true Naruto could not remember much else after that. He remembers fighting against a man with no eyebrows who had a big-ass sword. Some bratty little kid who thought he had it worse than anyone else in the world. More fighting against the eyebrowless man on the bridge they're walking on and after that nothing much else. That do you remember of the fighting? Samantha asked as she was genuinely curious. Naruto shrugged. I don't remember much. There was a man with no eyebrows who had a sword that was three times his size. A masked man with gravity-defying silver hair who had a forehead protector slanted over one eye was fighting him. After that it gets a little blurry. But the eyebrowless man was fighting again with the silver-haired man on this very bridge when it was still unfinished. That's it. That's it. That's it. Naruto reaffirmed, smiling slightly at the disappointed look Samantha was sending him. Oh well it's not like all stories have to be exciting. After all there are thousands of stories being made every day and not all of them are interesting. Too bad Naruto never realized his story was one where he and the people he was with liberated an entire country, and he himself helped bring back hope for the villagers and became a hero to the inhabitants. It took them a while but they eventually reached the other side of the bridge and as they looked up they saw another sign had the name of the bridge on it. Huh, the name of the bridge is down here as well. Dempsey remarked before turning to the team the bridge was, unknowingly to them, named after. Whoever named and built this bridge wanted to make sure the people who crossed it to remember the name. 
Naruto blinked at a thought that came up before shaking his head dismissively. I was here at one point a long time ago if you remember me saying. But I doubt whatever I had done back then, was enough cause for someone to actually name a bridge after me. Excuse me. A deep, gruff masculine voice called out. The group of five turned and saw a large gray-haired, bespectacled elderly man with a large beard and dark eyes approaching them with a few people armed with crossbows, swords, and kunais following him. The man's attire consists a dark sleeveless v-neck shirt with an obi tied around the waistline of his pants and a pair of sandals. The man and the group of people following stopped before the group, and warily eyed at their odd attire and equipment. Pausing for a moment he took in the entire of their appearance in case he needed to identify them later on. The man coughed into his hand and said, I'm afraid the land of waves is on lockdown, so, you'll have to move on. With the dead rising from their graves and turning anyone they get their hands on, one cannot be too sure as to who is bitten and who is not. How long has it been like this? The dead rising I mean? Dempsey being the reasonable one out of the group asked, fishing for information. The more they know about the situation in the elemental nations the better understanding they'll know of what they're dealing with, apart from the completely obvious. The elder sighed stressfully as he rubbed his forehead. It's been like this for three years now. And the dead have been getting smarter and stronger through every encounter they have with the ninjas of the hidden villages. He paused mid-answer, the question he was asked finally registering in his head. He stared at the group hard, his eyes narrowed in suspicion. Just where have you been living for the past three years? Under a rock? Just about everyone in the elemental nations knows of the dire situation we're facing now. Takeo quickly answered before anyone else in the group could respond. We are foreigners from a distant land from across the seas. We have recently arrived and are not knowledgeable in the ways of this land. It was partially true. Everyone in the group with Naruto being the sole exception are foreigners. But not from the sea, and they did recently arrive to the elemental nations. Plus they don't know the current status of the country they're in. Besides it's not like they can just go and say, we came from a different dimension and we just arrived here recently. Please tell us what is happening because we have no idea, otherwise everyone would look at them as if they are a bunch of nutcases. The elder scratched his chin and stared at the group for a long and tense moment. Eventually he nodded his head, believing that Takeo was telling the truth and bowed to them. In that case, I apologize for my behavior earlier. The recent attacks by the walking dead have taken a toll on all of us. My name is Tazuna, former bridge builder and acting leader of the Land of Waves. The man introduced himself. No one noticed the wince and subtle side head grabbing from Naruto. The blonde quickly recovered however just as Dempsey introduced himself. I am Tank Dempsey. Dempsey introduced himself he jerked a thumb at the Russian standing next to him. The fat bastard next to me is Nikolai Belinsky Dash. Fuck you, American. Shouted the Russian in retaliation to the insult. The guy with the katana is Takeo Masaki. Dempsey continued as if he were never interrupted with Takeo and nodding to Tazuna from beneath his cap. The girl beside Blondie here is Samantha Maxis and lastly the blonde himself is Naruto. Dempsey purposely neglected to say Naruto's surname because of Tazuna's former occupation, Bridge Builder. When the Great Naruto Bridge was being built when Naruto himself was here, there is a good chance that the man in front of them was one of the many that helped to construct it. And with Naruto being here three years ago. You get the idea. Naruto. Tazuna said, now looking at the younger blonde with arched brows. That name takes me back. There was a young boy called Naruto Uzumaki who came to Wave Country as part of a mission I paid for three years ago. In fact, this bridge was named after him after he helped return the freedom we've lost to a tyrant. Everyone that crossed the bridge gave Naruto a meaningful look at that. Naruto himself was astonished at the fact these people have named a bridge of all things after him. He takes what he said earlier back, what he did here three years ago was enough cause for a bridge to be named after him. What did the other Naruto look like? Naruto asked. 
While he didn't much care about his own past, this is an opportunity to learn what he was like back then. Way to contradict your own words kiddo. The kid had blue eyes and blonde spiky hair. Three whisker marks on both cheeks. He wore an orange tracksuit with blue on the shoulders and on the waist and a large white collar. There was a red swirl crest on the back of the orange tracksuit. The kid had orange pants with a shuriken holster attached to his right knee. He wore a pair of blue sandals, and a blue forehead protector. Tazuna answered he squinted his eyes as he got a closer look at Naruto. Now that I think about it, you look a little like him. The same spiky hair, blue eyes and... Tazuna's eyes slowly went wide in shocked disbelief upon realizing who was in front of him. His mouth dropped open soon after as he stared at the missing hero who was long thought dead. Naruto blinked when he saw the man literally go immobile upon realizing who he is. He was as still as a statue and only the sound of his breathing told him that the old man was alive. Amusingly enough Tazuna's eyes were so wide that they looked as if they were about to bulge out of their sockets. He gazed at the men behind Tazuna and saw they were in a similar condition the bulgy eyes and the gaping mouth. It was amusing. There was an awkward silence between the two groups. Who knew they would react like this? I think it's safe to say he found out who I am. Naruto stated with a sigh, as he shifted his M-14 so it was resting on his shoulder. Hold on a minute. Naruto, if he knows who you are and that you are a hero of this place would that mean he'll let us in? I'm not sure tank. A lot of things can change in three years. Hero or not, I don't think he'll just let us waltz on in willy-nilly. It was by this time that Tazuna snapped out of his shock just in time to hear what Naruto said. You would be right on that part. However, I can let you five in the land of waves if and only if you promise to help us with our undead problem. Well. Naruto trailed off as he slowly turned to stare at Dempsey, Nikolai, Takeo and Samantha to gauge their reactions to the offer. They seem indifferent to the offer given to them. But Naruto knew better. Being with them for three years he learned a thing or two about their reactions. The slight twitch in the eye from Dempsey told Naruto he was mildly irritated at the offer, take the job being offered or they can fuck off. It was obvious what Dempsey was going to choose. Takeo was the most calm. His face held a look of indifferent. However the drumming of fingers on the hilt of the katana hanging from his belt showed how displeased he was. The fingers were tapping against the hilt rapidly and the noise emitting from the finger movement was loud enough for Takeo to convey his annoyance, even if no one else could not pick up on it. Nikolai, well, he was completely hammered from the vodka. So he wasn't paying attention. Samantha had a sickeningly sweet smile as she stared at Tazuna. Naruto would have freaked out at the dangerous glint in her eyes. Seeing their reactions Naruto internally nodded to himself. Knowing what he had to do. Sure. Point us in the direction they're at? The blonde asked cheerfully as he pointedly ignored the scathing glares he was given from his companions. Tazuna let out a relieved sigh and as he turned around. He gestured the group to follow him as he walked towards the wave village with his guards following. As the group made their way back Tazuna began to tell them everything they needed to know. The dead have been attacking the village every night for the past week. As far as we know, the undead always come out of the tree line to the north. No one ventured into the woods because we are stretched too thin as it is and need all able men and women to help defend the village. Tazuna sighed in exhaustion and ran a hand through his hair. We were lucky enough to have suffered no casualties so far since the attacks begun. We made spiked barricades to help defend the village from the onslaught. It's been effective so far but I know it is only a matter of time before they break through. Do you know what types these zombies are? Naruto asked the elderly man. Tazuna looked over his shoulder questionably at Naruto. Types? Yeah there are several types of zombies. The first type are walkers. You usually see them stumbling or limping around with their arms outstretched in front of them. They are the most common you'll encounter. 
the second type are runners. These are zombies that run instead of walking. The third type are the sprinters, they're just like runners, but are much faster and can easily catch up to you in a matter of seconds. Naruto paused a moment to catch his breath and to see if Tazuna was following word for word. Seeing that he was Naruto continued. The fourth zombie type are undead animals such as dogs and monkeys. These zombies are usually as tall as a preteen, perhaps even taller and some have a special ability that makes them unique to the others. An example would be being able to teleport a few yards in front of you. The fifth zombie types are are able to use a single element such as fire or wind. Everyone in the group I'm with apart from Samantha has encountered two zombies who are part of the fifth type. They were able to use fire and wind against us. The first one, the pyro zombie, was able to burn anything it touches and would explode whenever we got close to it. What was worse was that it is impervious to damage dash. They were tough bastards too. We had to get close to it in order to get rid of the fucking things. Dempsey interrupted bitterly as he emphasized the word, had. Yeah. We had to get close to it so it would fucking explode. Don't get me started on the wind user. That fucker could use wind to disorientate and blind us with just a wave of its hand. Not to mention the fucker was fast moving. Naruto and everyone in the group nodded in complete agreement to Nikolai's words. And then there's the last type, super zombies. Naruto spat the word out like acid. These assholes are the worst sort of zombies you can encounter. Not only are they inhumanely strong, they are almost impervious to damage, have unlimited stamina and are able to do feats that should not be possible. With every sentence spoken to Zuna and the men following him began to pale slowly with each zombie type being revealed. Never in all his years did he think there are six different type of zombies. All of them much deadly than the last. And from what Naruto revealed they've been dealing with the first and second types. The third and over are the only ones they haven't faced against, and from what Naruto says they are in a whole another league. So which type of zombies are you up against here? Naruto questioned. The first and second. We haven't encountered the third and above, thankfully. Naruto nodded at that and shared a look with his group who were staring at him with grim but determined looks. While they are not happy about being dragged into this dilemma without being asked first, they knew the situation had to be resolved. It might as well be the ones who are properly equipped to deal with them to resolve the attacks. So we got walkers and runners attacking your village every night from the tree line to the north. You had no casualties since the attack so far, and you've held the walking dead back for the past seven days. You've done well in keeping your village up and running. Tazuna inclined his head at the compliment given to him. Keeping order was difficult. During the first day people have panicked, but we kept order once we gave them a choice, defend or die. The group frowned but nodded in understanding. As you now know the entire elemental nations have been under constant attack for three years. With the hidden villages stretching themselves thin with keeping the dead in check and overrunning their countries we have been unable to request aid. And since you've been fighting the zombies for an entire week you were unable to send people out to get help. Because everyone has been trying to keep the barricades up and making sure they have enough food and water to last. Dempsey said in Revelation. When Tazuna nodded in confirmation the group of zombie slayers could not help but shake their heads in disapproval. It was rather stupid to not try and send someone out to get help from these so-called hidden villages, which were not really hidden if they are found so easily. But with the mainland in the same crisis it would not have been a good idea. Although the group did find it strange that the zombies had lasted this long if the military force of this dimension is able to pull off godlike shit out of their ass as if it were an everyday thing. While we have done a good job keeping the dead at bay, the smart thing would have been going to the mainland and get help. But with the elemental nations under the same crisis as we are, there was a good chance anyone we would send out would get attacked by the walking dead before they would reach the nearest hidden village. Tazuna said grimly. Plus, the dead seem to be getting smarter with every encounter and adapt accordingly to their experiences. Motherfucker. This is just like back at home. 
Dempsey cursed. You all have been facing the same crisis as we are. Tazuna asked in surprise. Yeah, been fighting the walking dead ever since I can remember. Naruto replied a little bitterly. Zombies were overrunning entire cities and countries at a rapid pace. We basically had to destroy everything in the end. Ever since I can remember. What do you mean by that? The kid has amnesia. Dempsey revealed for Naruto's benefit. The furthest he can remember is three years ago, and ever since he has been fighting zombies with us. The only reason all of us as a group are here, is because the kid recently remembered where he came from and wanted us to come with him. Dempsey had wisely told the man the partial truth. Leaving out where Naruto along with Takeo, Nikolai and himself were experimented on by an organization who wanted to win a war they had started and were the main cause of the zombie outbreak from where they came from. Who knows how they would react to that? Tazuna nodded his head in understanding. Any questions he wanted to ask died in his mouth. He wanted to know why the kid never tried to make contact with Kanoha, the answer provided by Dempsey had gave him that answer. Still the kid has people back home who miss him. Kanoha had to know that one of their own is back and has amnesia. XXXX. As the group converse time flew by and before they knew it, they were standing in the middle of the village. There are several spiked barricades with rotten corpses of the dead impaled on them in the streets. The doors and windows have been boarded up to keep the civilians safe. As for the civilians themselves, they were either carrying makeshift weapons like knives and cleavers or real weaponry like katanas and crossbows as protection from the zombies. The citizens who had crossbows were on the rooftops acting as lookouts. The group consisting Naruto, Tank, Nikolai, Takeo and Samantha were looking cautiously around. The only ones outside were all adults, or teenagers who are well in their way into adulthood. There are no children in sight whatsoever and while concerning they pushed it to the back of their heads. It wasn't something that was at all interesting. The most likely explanation is they are more likely to be inside the safety of buildings, rather than outside where the danger is. As they walked through the village everyone pretty much stopped what they were doing and stared as if they had seen a ghost. Naruto to his credit ignored the staring and whispering in the background, though he was tempted to fire his M-16 in the sky just to make them shut up he resisted the urge. Such an action would bring repercussions on the group as a whole, as it would bring attention on them quicker than it is needed. Not to mention it would be a needless waste of ammo. Eventually the group of five were led through a spiked barricade that was littered with dried blood and rotten decaying corpses, that was currently being yanked off and taken to a large pile of corpses that is nearby waiting to be burnt, and were brought before the tree-like on the outskirts of the village where the zombies would emerge every single night for the past week. So this is where the unholy demons appear every night? Takeo asked staring at the tree line with suspicion. Tazuna nodded once and the Imperial Army Samurai grunted as he shouldered his Type 100 submachine gun. Humph, then this is where we shall part ways for now. Samantha narrowed her eyes in suspicion as she stared at the tree line. There was a presence out there. Something old and ancient that was rooted to the very earth. What she found unnerving about this is the fact she could tell it is watching them. Yeah. Don't worry old man will be back before you know it. Naruto added in confidence as he gave the bridge builder an assured look complete with a thumbs up. Tazuna nodded again and stared at the back of the group as they walked in and passed the tree line. Waiting a few minutes to make sure they were out of earshot, Tazuna suddenly turned to the man next to him a serious expression on his face. Get me a messenger bird and a sheet of paper. I need to send a message to Kanahagakur and inform them that a member of Kakashi's team is alive. XXXX. How much you want to bet whatever the situation here is, is a lot more complicated than it looks. Naruto suddenly asked aloud a few minutes after they breached the tree line. Pretty much like everything else we do? Nikolai asked. Nah, not everything we do is complicated. Dempsey replied in dismissal. Oh really? Naruto said, giving Dempsey a raised brow. Then let me give you a few examples. He raised his forefinger. 
Ascension where we had to do a very complicated puzzle in order to rescue a mysterious voice from Samantha Dash. Hey! Said girl cried out in dignity. Then there is Shangri-La, where we had to go into the past to rescue two people from being killed by zombies repeatedly. Naruto added as if he weren't interrupted by Samantha's outcry, while putting up his middle finger to tick it off. And then there was the moon dash, he paused and gave Dempsey a pointed stare. Do I need to remind you what happened back there? No. No you don't. Dempsey replied with a light scowl. The moon was still a sore subject for the group. Fucking Richtofen for tricking them. Fucking Maxis for getting them to blow up the earth. So. Nikolai drawled out. In other words, everything we do, we make worse. Naruto shook his head negatively. Not exactly. We did do some good in the places we've been to, and we did what we could. It's just the four of us were played for fools all along by Richtofen, who made us believe Samantha was the enemy when it actually was him all along, and we never knew until it was too late. Samantha as she listened to them became depressed and angry at herself for trying to kill the other four. Naruto particularly who has been nothing but kind to her ever since she and Richtofen had switched bodies. While Naruto, Nikolai, Takeo, Dempsey and Richtofen were fighting her armies in multiple locations she had come to learn, she could have contacted them at any time by electronic devices. But she didn't. She did not try to warn them that Richtofen is the cause for all the problems they've faced since the zombie outbreak. She could have told them that Edward Richtofen is the real enemy not her and that she was trying to kill him. She could have told them that Richtofen was just using them to fulfill his own ends. She could have told them but she never did. Naruto sensing the depressing aura around Samantha put a comforting hand on her shoulder, getting her to turn and look at him. He smiled reassuringly at her, his way of telling her that he did not blame her for what had happened. Samantha seeing the reassuring smile the whisker-faced blonde was giving her returned it. Takeo scowled bitterly at the grim reminder and clenched his fist tightly. He looked down at his katana and wondered if he should commit seppuku for the atrocity he had had helped commit against humanity. He would regain the honor he had lost once he did, but, was it the right thing to do? As if to answer this question the former imperial officer turned his eyes to Naruto, thinking of everything they went through together and how they had helped one another during the undead crisis, and how close he and the young teen had become. Naruto wouldn't want him to commit suicide. In fact if he knew the blonde, he would, dare he say it, smack him across the back of the head for thinking of doing such a thing. Protecting one another. Helping one another. Watching each other's backs, coming to aid one another when they are in a tight spot and trying to save the world. Yes. Now that the samurai thought about it he still had honor left in him. That alone will be enough to keep him from committing seppuku. A short while later the group of six came to a scene that put them all on guard. For almost two yards the earth's soil was dead. The tree surrounding the soil was dying too. The leaves are a rotten brown and the tree barks are a twisted sick parody of its former self. The soil was also upturned looking as if someone or something was either digging down or trying to get out. Samantha shook her head she felt the presence from before once again. This time however the presence was closer to them. Narrowing her eyes in suspicion she suddenly started walking forward, ignoring the others calling for her, and stood in the epicenter of the rotten ground. Closing her eyes in concentration Samantha got down on one knee and set her MP40 on the ground beside her. What the hell is she doing? Dempsey asked himself aloud with astonishment in his voice as Samantha began to look like she was about to pray. I am not too sure. Naruto replied slowly with his eyes narrowed. It's like she's praying or something. He trailed off questioningly. Perhaps the child is contacting the spirits of this place? To know where our enemies lie. Takeo suggested as he surveyed their surroundings cautiously. Possibly. Naruto began contemplatively. Samantha is technically a spirit, so maybe she can contact with people who are on the other side? Dempsey stroked his chin as he stared at the kneeling girl with interest. 
Aha, uh -huh, if that is the case, then we may know just what is going down quicker than we first thought. Everyone nodded in agreement to Dempsey's words. Since Samantha has supernatural powers, she is able to do things that normal people are unable to do. With the exception of Samantha herself, Naruto is the only unnormal person in the entire group as he is able to do supernatural things too. Even though he can't remember much of his abilities, a comfortable silence settled among the group as they watched Samantha do her thing. Only for it to be suddenly broken by Nikolai who just remembered the lack of reaction old man Tazuna had when he saw their weapons. Hey! I just remembered something odd. When everyone turned to look at him questioningly, they gestured him to continue, so he did. That fucking old man, he had serious lack of reaction to our guns. For something so advanced in his eyes, he should have been more interested in knowing what our guns can do. Everyone narrowed their eyes, realizing Nikolai was right. Tazuna did have a serious lack in surprise and interest in their guns. Considering how technically underdeveloped this dimension is, they'd have thought everyone would have been more interested in their technology and what they can do. But instead they weren't. Very odd indeed. Takeo said with narrowed eyes. Dempsey slowly nodded and said. Yeah. If I were in his place I would have been more aware of something I had never seen before. I would have been curious to know what it was too. Perhaps he had seen something like it before? Nikolai suggested reasonably. Probable. But not likely. Naruto answered in response as he scratched the side of his neck to get rid of an itch that was beginning to annoy him. If there are guns in this dimension they would have in terms of the weaponry we use, obsolete flintlock pistols, muskets and blunderbusses, or something familiar to them. But with the chakra they use to fight. Dempsey began, before he pinched the bridge of his nose in annoyance upon realizing just how screwed these people are. You have to understand, since these people have been using chakra against the zombies in every single encounter. The undead have quickly adapted to their method of attacks and now their chakra is almost ineffective against them. With six different types of zombies, chakra would still likely be effective against the first, second, third and fourth types for a while before they adapt themselves to avoid and dodge those attacks. The fifth and sixth zombie types would likely be close to immunity to chakra-oriented attacks. Talk about severely fucking themselves over. The undead was able to adapt to their method of attacks with each encounter. Naruto finished with a grim look. They've become so dependable on this energy of theirs they won't be as effective without it. The former marine scoffed in disgust. I won't be surprised that once they find themselves unable to use their energy, they'd find themselves as weak as a child. As the group quietly talked among themselves Samantha had discovered what the presence she sensed before is. She learnt the presence is in actually an ancient spirit who was awoken from its slumber when someone from the village they had come from took something that did not belong to them. An image of a teenage boy, wearing a dark grey sleeveless v-neck shirt, dark pants and a pair of sandals flashed in her mind, showing her who the perpetrator is. The spirit then sent Samantha an image of the stolen object in question, it is an elemental staff that is capable of unleashing balls of molten rock. Strangely enough Samantha thought she had seen someone who looked like a younger version of Takeo Masaki wielding the elemental staff, and was in a war-torn battlefield with trenches and bodies impaled on spikes in the background. The next image sent to her had the boy shown to her previously holding the staff in his hands before taking it away from its resting place. In retaliation the spirit raised a small army of the walking dead and sent them to the village she and the others had came from with the intent on taking back the elemental staff that was stolen from its resting place. Opening her eyes and knowing the true reason behind the attacks, Samantha grabbed her MP-40 submachine gun off the ground, stood up and turned to face the others and walked to them. Did you get anything useful out of whatever you were doing over there? Samantha stared Dempsey unflinchingly in the eyes and said, Yes, and I now know the true reason behind these attacks. The others were taken aback at the belief in her voice. However their surprise at her convicitin did not stem the unconvinced looks she was being given. 
Naruto on the other hand knew something was up and knowing Samantha is able to see things that they are unable to because of her condition, he gave her a chance. What did you see? The whisker face blonde asked. Samantha told them everything she had seen. She told them about the spirit that was in the area. She told them about the elemental staff and the boy who stole it from its resting place. She told them of the mental image of a younger version of Takeo Masaki, using the elemental staff in the midst of a war-torn battlefield that had trenches and corpses impaled on spikes. Then she told them the reason behind the attacks so far. So let me recap on what we've all learned so far, we got an ancient spirit who got robbed. An elemental staff that fires balls of molten lava. A teenage boy that took the elemental staff from its resting place and now the spirit is pissed and raised the dead in an attempt to take back the staff. Dempsey said, raising a finger to mark off everything they had learnt so far. Anything we miss? What about the guy who looks like a younger version of Takeo using the elemental staff? Naruto pointed out. Dempsey snapped his fingers in remembrance. Oh, yeah, that as well. Samantha shook her head negatively. Nian. That is everything. The child thief has unleashed an army of fallen warriors upon his home. The samurai, a veteran of two world wars, said in a disgusted tone as his lips pulled back in a nasty scowl. He has brought shame and dishonor upon himself and his family. The thief is only a kid. Naruto fiercely said in the child's defense. We don't know the reason behind the thieving. So before we make any judgment, we get some answers. Then we judge him upon with what we've learnt being the catalyst. While reluctant Takeo had to concede to Naruto. The young blonde had a point after all. Not only do they not know the whole story, they can't judge someone when they only had one perspective. But that never stopped anyone from judging people since the beginning of time. Knowing what they had to do Dempsey laid out their choices, they either had to take back the elemental staff and bring it to its resting place, or, ignore the spirit's request to bring it back and try to stop the zombies right there. I don't know about you but I say we go find staff of element. Nikolai slurred out his suggestion. He hiccuped and added, I have enough of zombies for one lifetime, so, let us do first choice. I agree with the Russian. For once I'd like to not fight any zombies while trying to complete an objective. Dempsey said with his head nodding in agreement to the Soviet's words. I'm all for not re-killing zombies. Let's get the staff back. Naruto supported. Dempsey nodded in satisfaction seeing everyone in the group wanted to avoid re-killing the undead. The former marine shouldered his M-14 assault rifle and said, It's settled then, we go look for the staff back in the wave village and bring it back here? and we have until sun goes down before another attack comes. Nikolai reminded them helpfully as they turned and went back in the direction they came from. Since they were on the clock the group of five were running back to the village. They kept their guard up along the way though, just in case the spirit Samantha discovered decides to pull a fast one on them. As they ran Takeo left some parting words that spoke of what would happen if they don't get the elemental staff back in time. The light keeps the dead at bay. Once it leaves, the fallen, will rise once more amongst the living. Naruto and the others nod their heads in agreement, and Naruto concluded by saying, once the zombies are back, we'll have no choice but to fight. So let's get this done before it comes to that. The group made it back to the wave village in record time and stopped to regain their breath just out of the barricade. Because they were running for most of the way three of them were out of breath. Naruto and Samantha being a former ninja and a spirit were in better condition. They were panting but not completely out of breath like their companions. The villagers standing guard over their village were surprised at their quick reappearing. Did you find a way to stop the dead? One of the villagers asked in a hopeful voice. We may have found a way. But we need to see old man Tazuna to tell him the situation first. Naruto answered for everyone else, seeing as they, excluding Samantha, were out of breath. Another villager directed the way to Tazuna's house. 
and gave them a description of the house and told them it is near the great Naruto Bridge and they couldn't miss it. They had to look out for a two-floor house, with a windmill in front of it, that sat on stilts over the water. Basically like nearly every other house in the village. Still it couldn't be that difficult to find a single house near a bridge that was named after him could it? It turns out it wasn't. When the man told them Tazuna's house was near the bridge they didn't think that the house was literally a yard away from it, and unlike the other houses that were on land, the houses here were held up by wood platforms and stilts. Another thing they realized the houses that were built on land they look new as if they were recently built. The ones that are on top of water, those ones look more worn and aged but are still in good living condition. Plus the man they were looking for was outside of the house. And there was a pigeon that with a message tied to its leg standing on his arm. As they approached him the pigeon leapt off of Tazuna's arm and flew off in the distance. Towards the mainland. Hearing footsteps Tazuna turned and was surprised to see Naruto and his companions back in the village so quickly. Did you resolve our undead situation? The former bridge builder asked, trying not to sound too hopeful. The group negatively shook their heads causing Tazuna to sigh in disappointment. Oh. Well, if you haven't taken care of our problem then maybe you found something that had caused it? Well. Naruto began almost hesitantly. We have in a sense. Samantha here is able to see things that others cannot. He explained as he gestured to the girl in question. When we found the origins of the zombies, she had a vision of a teenage boy holding a staff of some kind and took it from its resting place. The five of us believe that this teenager is the region behind the attacks your village has suffered, and, if we return the staff that was taken from its resting place, the undead will stop attacking. Tazuna narrowed his eyes in thought. Now that he thought about it his grandson was acting a little strange the day before the attacks happened and he was carrying something wrapped up that was twice his size up into his room. But just to be sure. What did the teenage boy look like? It was Samantha who answered seeing as she was the one who saw what he looked like. He vas wearing a dark grey sleeveless v-neck shirt, dark pants and a pair of sandals. Closing his eyes Tazuna exhaled tridly knowing from the basic description he was given that they were looking for his grandson Inari. From that basic description you have given me, it looks like you're looking for my grandson Inari. He told them. The former bridge builder then gestured the group to follow him as he turned and walked in his house. The zombie slayers shared a look with one another before following Tazuna inside. What makes you think we are looking for grandson? Nikolai asked as he and the others followed Tazuna into the front room where the former bridge builder sat on a couch. A few things actually, Inari was acting a little strange a day before the attacks. Plus on that same day I saw him carrying something wrapped up that was twice his size up into his room. It looked like a seven-foot pole with the top end looking wider than the rest. Plus when I asked him what it was he would act secretively and be evasive. He revealed to them as the group either sat down on the couch or on the floor itself. Has the child revealed the location of the device to you at all? Takeo asked stoically. His stoicism was good at hiding what he truly felt about the situation. They first had to find a staff. Now to find that staff they have to look for a teenage boy who had hidden the staff somewhere. If they find out that Inari had moved the staff and they had to find the kid in order to know where he put it, then fuck this he was going to murder people. Tazuna negatively shook his head and scratched the back of his head as he leaned back on the couch. No he has not. However there is a chance he kept it in his room. He hardly takes anything out of there so there is a good chance it may still be up there collecting dust. Dempsey abruptly sat up. What are we waiting for, Christmas? Let's get up there. He exclaimed and everyone in the room got to their feet. Right. Follow me and I'll take you to his room. Tazuna instructed as he coughed into his hand. The others followed the elder upstairs where he took them to his grandson's room. The group stopped outside of the doorway. Well, here it is. Do you know what you're looking for? He asked as he turned to the group. The group nodded and Tazuna stepped aside sighing through his nose. 
hoping beyond hope that the staff they need to find is in Inari's room. Because if it isn't, then they are going to have problems. As Naruto and the others walked into Inari's room Tazuna went back downstairs to get a bottle of sake. Meanwhile in Inari's room the group of zombie slayers slung their weapons over their shoulders. Thanks to the sling that is connected to their respective weapons. Then Naruto, Dempsey, Nikolai, Takeo and Samantha got to searching the room thoroughly for the elemental staff. Tazuna had said Inari carried something up to his room so bearing that in mind there is a good chance the kid may not have moved it since the attacks begun. A few minutes is all it took them to find what they were looking for. With a triumphant yell Nikolai pulled a wrapped up object out from beneath Inari's bed and set it flat in the middle of the room. It had the description that Tazuna gave them, a seven-foot pole with the top being wider than the rest. Underneath your bed is not an ideal hiding place for things but it worked out for them. Taking off the cloth the elemental staff was revealed to them. Everyone arched their eyes in awe. It was something that not even they were expecting. They were expecting a staff that was made out of wood, and had a majestical feel to it. Instead the elemental staff was mechanical and very futuristic in its appearance. Holy shit! Naruto breathed out in awe. That's the elemental staff you were talking about Samantha? Samantha merely nodded in response. She too was in awe at the sight. Seeing it in your memories was one thing, but to see it up close was a different experience. Takeo, Nikolai and Dempsey however felt there was something very deja vu-ish about the mechanical-looking staff. American, Russian, Takeo suddenly said, prompting Nikolai and Tank to stare at the Asian with questioning looks. Do you two feel, something familiar about this staff? He asked, his eyes never leaving the staff. Dempsey slowly nodded and looked down at the elemental staff with a contemplative look. Yeah, I think I saw this staff before. I can't place where I had seen it though. Now that you mention it, I had seen this shortly after I was exiled from the motherland. Nikolai told them, that was almost thirty or so years ago in France I think. He finished looking and sounding a little unsure. Naruto narrowed his eyes suspiciously. All three of them had seen the elemental staff before. Nikolai mentioned he saw it in France shortly after he was exiled from his home thirty years ago. Samantha said the spirit implanted an image of a man who looked like a younger version of Takeo wielding the staff they were looking at right now. You three say you saw this thing before. Samantha said she saw a man who is a younger version of Takeo using the staff. Nikolai says he saw the staff in France thirty years ago. You know what I think? I think, that the staff came from your dimension and ended up here somehow. How do you figure that? Dempsey asked Naruto as he and the others stared at the younger blonde with a questioning look. Call it a hunch. But if you think about it, it makes sense. Naruto replied. The blonde got to his feet and added. Now, we'd better get this back before night falls. I'd rather not face another horde of seemingly endless zombies thank you very much. The group nodded in agreement and stood up as well, with Takeo taking the elemental staff and made their way out of Inari's room and back downstairs. They went without fighting any zombies at all up until now and they'd rather they keep it that way for a little longer. Dempsey stared at the blonde-haired kid sitting in the corner just a little ways away from himself, Takeo and Nikolai. He frowned a little worryingly as he saw the kid glancing rapidly throughout the room. He looked vulnerable and scared, the way he sat there hugging his legs to him. While he didn't care much for the Russian or the Tojo even he was surprised to see them take an interest in their new resident. The Russian, Nikolai Belinsky was his name? He was staring at the blonde with genuine concern. Something else that took him by surprise since the Russian didn't seem to care much about anything. Hell even the Asian, Takeo Masaki, was giving the kid a worried glance every once in a while. And he was as stoic as a brick wall. Since he was the closest to the kid Dempsey decided to go and move toward the kid and talk to him. He always did have a soft spot for kids. Didn't know or remember why he did though. He just does. 
When the kid quickly brought his eyes to him when he started to move, the boy's bright blue eyes began to widen in panic and he frantically began to push himself away. Stopping Dempsey slowly raised his hands to placate the kid. To show that he wasn't going to hurt him and he was a friend. It seemed to work when the boy stopped and stared at him. Contemplatively. Like he were looking for any sign of a lie. Dempsey with his hands still raised in a calm manner slowly sat down as well as he could without using his hands. He grunted a little in pain when he sat on his backside rather roughly prompting the blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy to try and stifle a laugh with the sleeve of his bright orange jacket. Chuckling aloud Dempsey both asked and offered with a warm smile. So what's your name kiddo? If you tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. He always had a soft spot for children. They always bring out the nice side of himself, no matter who they are, and this child was no different. The blonde-haired kid blinked and stared in surprise. After a moment of silence the kid coughed and replied. Naruto. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. The boy answered softly. Dempsey arched an eyebrow. The kid has surprisingly good English and spoke in an accent similar to Takeo's. But in comparison to Takeo Naruto's accent was much clearer and easier to understand. The marine smiled and offered his hand. Well, Naruto, I am Tank. Tank Dempsey. Pleased to meet you. It only took a moment but Dempsey saw the look of uncertainty in Naruto's eyes. But after a moment of being left hanging Naruto finally took the offered hand and shook him, prompting the marine to smile even wider which caused Naruto the smile too. I am, pleased to meet you as well Tank. There was a hesitant pause. Can. Can we be friends? Dempsey nodded his eyes softening at how vulnerable the boy sounded. Sure. He said to him, still shaking Naruto's hand. We can be friends. What he got in return was a wide thankful smile and a hug. XXXX. When Tazuna saw the group coming down from Inari's room, he put the sake he was drinking on the table in front of him and got up from the couch and made his way to them. He stopped in mid-stride and went wide-eyed when he lay his eyes on the mechanical and futuristic-looking staff in Takeo's hands. What the hell is that thing? The former bridge builder asked while pointing at the elemental staff with a look of astonishment. That thing old man is what we came here for. Never thought I'd see something like that in my lifetime though. Naruto answered before he stared at the staff admiringly. How could he not admire it? It is made entirely out of metal, and it is futuristic in appearance. The staff? That thing in his hands is the staff? Tazuna asked with growing disbelief. This was not something he imaged the staff to be. He thought it was going to be an ancient-looking wooden stick, not the mechanical monstrosity in front of him. Why so surprised? You've seen the type of weapons we carry and didn't show much of a reaction. Why are you looking so surprised to see something like this? Dempsey asked gesturing to the elemental staff in question. Tazuna closed his eyes and took a deep breath to calm his nerves. Exhaling through his nose he opened his eyelids and stared at the group and said in the calmest tone he could muster. The reason I didn't show much of a reaction to your weapons, is because I saw similar ones being taken to the hidden leaf village from the land of spring. Takeo, Dempsey, Samantha and Naruto turned to stare half-heartedly at Nikolai. Him mentioning that Tazuna saw weapons similar to theirs was actually right. With a slight frown pulling at his face Nikolai shrugged his shoulders as if to say, you win some you lose some. The group quickly brought their focus back to Tazuna when he continued. As for why I was so surprised to see that staff. Well, look at it. It's monstrous looking. He exclaimed in a wild gesture. You know, you are living with people who can blow fire out of their mouths like it's an everyday thing. Dempsey replied pointedly. So are you really surprised to see something like that? Tazuna opened his mouth to reply but quickly closed it again when he realized that the man was right. He was living among with people who can do god-like abilities. He saw it for himself three years ago when Naruto was still a loud-mouthed brat. 
So really, he shouldn't be surprised at seeing something like the staff in Takeo's hands. Tazuna sighed and stroked his beard. Truth be told I shouldn't be. I live in a world where children are being taught to kill. Where people are now dying every single day thanks to these walking dead. He trailed off and looked out of a nearby window. Seeing the sky beginning to change to an orange color the tall tail sign of the sun going down the former bridge builder let out another sigh and brought his attention back to the group. You all better get moving. It won't be long until the sun goes down again and the dead come back. He said to them as a reminder, gesturing to the window to show them that the sun was indeed beginning to go down. Following his gesture the group of five became alarmed when they saw that the sun was beginning to settle. Cursing loudly Dempsey quickly beckoned the others to follow him and quickly made his way to the front door. The others quickly followed him, with Naruto giving Tazuna a thankful nod for allowing them to search through his grandson's room as he passed by. This is just fucking great. We have less time to get this done. The former marine complained in irritation as he opened the door and made his way back outside with the others. What makes you say that? Tazuna asked, who was now standing behind the doorway to his house. This made everyone turn around and stare at him as if he were an idiot. What? He asked, looking a little confused at the looks they were giving him. Naruto let out a sigh of irritation and said in a rapid, yet, clear pace. Let me explain it this way for you, this staff is the cause of the mess your village found itself in. Which if you remember your grandson took. To stop this from happening continuously we need to bring the staff back to the place it was taken from. If we do that not only will the dead stop attacking you but they'll leave you alone. Not to be a spoil sport, but if VE stay here Jean V will have less time to return Xi's staff to its resting place. Samantha piped up with a single finger raised. You'd better listen to the girl. Tazuna said. The more time you spend here the less time you have to put that thing back. Unknowingly to Tazuna the moment he said that Naruto suddenly had the urge to throttle the man. Since he was the whole reason they weren't moving yet. I mean really, they waste time trying to explain to the man what would happen if they don't get there in time. And he goes and asks even more questions that ends up wasting even more time. Cracking his neck with a mildly irritated look on his face Naruto took a deep breath, closed his eyes turned around and walked off in the direction they took earlier. The others quickly followed and when they were out of ear shot Nikolai said, I think he was drinking. I know when someone was drinking. Because you drink too Nikolai? Samantha asked. Duh. A drunk knows when someone else is drinking. Is instinct. The Soviet exclaimed pounding his fist against his chest proudly. Makes sense I suppose. Drinking I mean. Naruto muttered with a twitching eyebrow. He did seem a little more, well, stupider, than he did a few minutes ago. Not to mention there was a bottle of alcohol on the table in front of the couch he was on. No way, Naruto. The group stopped and turned to see a teenage boy that fit Inari's description standing there, staring at Naruto with disbelieving eyes. Rubbing his eyes to make sure he wasn't seeing things he added shakingly, they said you were back from the dead. I didn't believe them at first but. Naruto didn't know why but something was compelling him to talk to the kid. Pinching the bridge of his nose Naruto turned his head to look over his shoulder and told the others to go on ahead, and that he would catch up to them later. You sure? Dempsey asked. Naruto nodded in confirmation. Yeah. You go and put the staff back. I'll catch up to you in about five minutes. The older blonde nodded in response. Okay. I'll see in you five. Let's move everyone, we have an appointment to keep. Barked the former marine. Takeo, Samantha and Nikolai nodded their heads and followed Tank as he led them to the outskirts of the village. Now alone with a someone younger than himself, God that sounded wrong, Naruto rubbed the back of his neck awkwardly. Despite what people think and what he has done in the past, the present Naruto is inexperienced when it comes to talking to new people and comforting them. Let alone someone who is younger than yourself who looks like they're about to cry. 
So facing the unknown Naruto did something he always did, he winged it. Still rubbing the back of his neck awkwardly Naruto blew out of his mouth nervously. Suddenly he had an idea for a conversation starter, even if it was pretty lame considering what has been happening for the past week. So, I know this is going to sound pretty stupid, but how have you been? Apart from the constant attacks on the village for the past week? Fine. Inari replied lowly. He then stared up at Naruto imploringly, just where have you been for the past three years? Everyone here and back at the hidden leaf village thought you were dead. And if you were alive all this time why didn't you try to send a message? Naruto gave an amused snort to those questions slash demands. He can easily answer them, with a little bit of a lie here and there. Where have I been for the past three years? Well, in the order you asked, I was on an entirely different continent on the other side of the world, which is in the same situation here. So no one would have ever be able to find me. 2. I have amnesia and the furthest I can remember is literally three years ago. I only came back here because I recently remembered where I was born. Inari blinked and gave Naruto a look over. That explains why you're dressed so differently. Then the rest of what he said registered in his head and he stared at the whisker-faced blonde with comically wide eyes. Wait a minute, you have amnesia. You've been fighting the dead on the other side of the world? Pretty much. Naruto confirmed with a small smile. Then as if a switch had been changed he stared down at Inari with a deep frown and hard eyes. The sudden mood shift had taken the younger of the two teens by surprise. So care to explain to me why you took a certain staff that did not belong to you? Naruto firmly asked as he crossed his arms. The tone he was speaking in told Inari that Naruto was being serious. It was a dare? Inari lamely replied. The look he had gotten from the blonde he admired told him that he did not believe him. Yeah, I thought you wouldn't believe that. He muttered with a sigh. You got that right. Naruto stated with a disappointed look. You know, considering what you did you're very lucky this village hasn't suffered any deaths yet. What I, what do you mean, what I did? Naruto was not surprised Inari did not know. The boy doesn't seem to be smart. Though that may be because Inari isn't a full-grown adult yet and would therefore not act on his common sense. I mean think about it, if there is a highly advanced mechanical staff just sitting there in the middle of nowhere. What would you do? Take it or leave it alone? Now that Naruto thought about it he would probably have taken it as well. It does look pretty cool, you don't know? Seeing the genuine confusion and cluelessness on the boy's face Naruto quickly looked around his surroundings to see if anyone was in the vicinity. Seeing there wasn't he leaned down to whisper in the boy's ear. The zombies here are controlled by a spirit, a severely pissed off one at that. They're attacking the village because you took the staff from its resting place. How do you know that? Remember the group I was with? He received a curious nod from Inari. Well the girl is special, because she can communicate with the dead. The spirit who you accidentally pissed off showed her what the staff looked like and you taking it. And we have until the sun does down to bring the staff back or the dead will come back to attack the village again. Do you understand? He asked the young teenager patently. Inari slowly nodded his head to show he did understand. Then he scrunched up his face in thought and looked towards the sky. They were talking for about 5 to 10 minutes and the sun was quickly going down, which meant Naruto and his new team would have a few hours until the zombies came back from the dead once more. Naruto seeing Inari look towards the sky followed his gaze and smiled faintly. Straightening himself back up Inari brought his focus back to the older teen when he pat him on the shoulder and found the whisker-faced blonde looking down at him with a soft reassuring smile. I'm going to have to get going now. I have less time to reach the others and return the staff now than I had before. Will I see you again? Inari asked with a pleading look. Naruto looked away looking a little uncertain, but answered truthfully with what my group and I are about to do. Probably not. 
Rolling his shoulders Naruto hefted the M-14 and began to walk off in the direction Samantha and the others took earlier. He kept on talking even as the distance between himself and Inari grew. The dead are difficult to defeat. Once they learn to adapt to your method of attacks they adapt to it. So the likelihood of us surviving is very slim. The distance between them was steadily growing bigger as Inari strained his ears to the brink. The only thing we can do, adapt as they do. Only then can we survive. With those parting words said Naruto sprint his way through the village, to the barricade that would take him outside of the village itself. All the while Inari stood there in the same spot pondering on Naruto's words, then he turned and made his way home. The boy was worried about Naruto and his new comrades. But he had faith in that the hero of the wave would pull on through in the end. He had given back his faith and strength in the village three years ago and he would use that faith and strength to help keep the village up in their vigilance for any more undead attacks. If he did not have faith in Naruto and his new friends, then who would? Several minutes later we find Naruto sprinting through the woods with his assault rifle in hand. The blonde was keeping a fast pace while expertly dodging and weaving his way through trees, branches, logs and shrubbery as he came across them. Never slowing down and never faltering. As he ran the whisker-faced blonde began to think, what would happen once they returned the staff to its rightful place? Would they be instantly teleported to another location like the several dozen times before? Or would they be rewarded with something that can help them immensely in their fight against the overwhelming numbers of the undead? Nevertheless whatever would come once this was over and done with is bound to be interesting. But he finds out that the reward is them teleporting to another location that is already overrun with the undead then he will fucking call it. It wasn't long that he ran across Tank Dempsey himself who was leaning up against a tree, fiddling with his M-16 while he waited for him to catch up. Seeing Naruto approaching Dempsey pushed off the tree trunk and said, It looks like you took the scenic route, eh? Slowing to a walk so he and Tank could walk side by side Naruto slung his M-16 over his shoulder and shrugged while shoving his hands in his jacket pockets. Yeah, well, you know me Tank. I do love seeing the sights. He replied in a joking manner. Oh I know what you mean. Dempsey said in mock seriousness. There is nothing like seeing the breathtaking scenes like Shangri-La. Naruto even though he knew Tank was just messing around, he nodded in complete agreement. Yeah. But then again, nothing else we've seen beats seeing the earth from the moon. Or seeing it blow up. Dempsey pointed out plaintively. Yeah there is that too. Naruto said mournfully. Seeing the planet blow up because of their actions was both breathtaking and heartbreaking to watch. But who else apart from the five of us can say we watched the earth blow up? Dempsey was silent. The kid had him there. Takeo, Samantha, Nikolai, Naruto, and himself are the only humans to have seen earth blow up. While the planet wasn't destroyed, completely, it was shattered into multiple large fragments, so they were still able to return to earth. The only problems they faced were the thousands of zombies that came as a result to the missiles hitting the planet. The two spent their time walking in contemplative silence until they reached the clearing where the others are. Naruto blinked when he saw something that wasn't there before. The dying husk of a land that was there before, now had a pedestal that was of a similar design to the elemental staff right in the middle of it. Along with that there was a faint aura-like glow surrounding the already dead land, the dying or the already dead trees and the pedestal itself, giving it a holy-like aura you would often see on angels. That wasn't there before. Naruto said in a bland tone. Considering what he had seen already and what he had done to get this far, seeing something like this did not have the impact it should have had on him. It appeared before us Venja Elemental Staff Vass in close proximity. Samantha explained to him so he could catch up on what he had missed when he was absent. I think VE need to put your staff on your base of your pedestal? Naruto nodded at Samantha's words and scratching the side of his face as he stared at the pedestal seriously. It appeared out of nowhere. At Samantha's nod Naruto nodded again and added, if that's the case then we should do it. However, 
We need to prepare ourselves just in case something we don't expect happens. Like what comrade? Nikolai asked. The blue-eyed teen sighed and palmed his forehead as he stared at Nikolai in disbelief. Think about it everyone, what happened to us when we completed an objective after solving a tough puzzle or something similar? Takeo, Dempsey and Samantha were the ones to have gotten it moments after the words left Naruto's mouth. Nikolai still intoxicated by alcohol was unable to think properly. We get taken to another place that is overrun with zombies. And we get disarmed as well, so we're reduced to only using a pistol. Dempsey answered with a deep scowl. This revelation made Nikolai widen his eyes in realization too and his eyes then narrowed dangerously. There was no way a freaky spirit was going to take his PPSH-41 away from him. Yeah. Another possibility is that we may end up separated from one another. As the group conversed with one, Takeo was frowning as he stared down at the elemental staff in his hands. Scowling lightly he looked between the pedestal and the staff multiple times before he put on a look of determination. Making his decision he wordlessly made his way to the pedestal staff in hand. Takeo? Naruto called out questioningly upon seeing the samurai moving to the pedestal with a purpose. The others stopped their conversation and as one looked at Takeo who was now standing in front of the pedestal and while they couldn't see it, the former imperial officer had a conflicted look as he looked between the staff and the pedestal. He was beginning to second-guess his decision to put the staff on the flat top of the pedestal. His instincts, which was rarely wrong, was telling him that something about this was off. But yet there was also something that was compelling him to put the staff on the pedestal. Takeo? Naruto called out again uncertainly. The samurai turned to look over his shoulder and saw the concerned look on Naruto's face. Are you alright? Yes. I am alright, Takeo answered and brought his gaze back to the pedestal. I am merely, conflicted. Naruto shared a look with Dempsey, Nikolai and Samantha and brought his attention back to the former imperial officer. Conflicted about what? On what I should do. Naruto scratched his left cheek in thought before sharing a meaningful look with the others. Gesturing to Takeo with a jerk of his head, Naruto moved to the samurai and stood by his side and placed a hand on the man's shoulder. Put the staff on the pedestal Takeo. Whatever happens will be ready for it. Naruto said, and to emphasize his point he brought his assault rifle which was hanging from his shoulder to his front and raised it ready to fire at anything that would threaten them. The kid is right, Takeo. Go on and put that staff on the pedestal. We'll be ready for anything. Dempsey spoke up and like Naruto, he too was ready to pull the trigger on his assault rifle at anyone appearing threatening to them. Knowing their shoddy luck, the second Takeo puts that staff in place, they will suddenly be attacked by zombies from all sides. And truth be told that was likely to happen to them anyway even if this spirit watching them had no hostile intentions toward them or not. Nodding at their support Takeo cautiously moved to place the staff upright on the pedestal. While he did this Naruto, Nikolai, Dempsey and Samantha quickly moved to make a defensive perimeter around Takeo. So if they were attacked they would be able to cover one another from all sides. When Takeo put the elemental staff on the pedestal something happened. Something that took them by surprise but happened so quick they were unable to react. The moment the staff was placed on the pedestal it began to sink in. While that happened the pedestal itself began to vibrate and glow brightly. The aura surrounding both the pedestal and staff and the environment around them had brightened so much that the group was forced to cover their eyes or risk themselves blindness. The aura expanded outwards like a dome slowly arching past the trees. In the distance the villagers in the land of waves saw the aura of light and they all stared with their mouths agape in sheer awe at what they've seen at the light show. Moments later the dome exploded and a pillar of light shot towards the skies shocking the villagers from the suddenness of it. After what seemed like hours, which in reality was only a few seconds, the pillar of light slowly faded away and dispersed into air. At the center where the pillar of light originated tank Dempsey, Takeo Masaki, Nikolai Belinsky, 
Samantha Maxis, and Naruto Uzumaki were nowhere to be found. The pedestal and the elemental staff were gone too. The dead earth and shrubbery that was there before was now filled with life as if the land there wasn't rotting away moments before. By the time the villagers came to see what had happened they would find no evidence of Naruto or his group being there. To them it would be like they had just upped and vanished without warning. It would also be the last time that the wave village would be attacked by the undead on their soil. XXXX One week later in Kanahagakur no Sato, Tsunade Senja V and current Hokage was doing the thing that was the bane of all Kages across the elemental nations, paperwork. For once however instead of the towering stacks of paper that usually finds its way on her desk, she is only signing a few of them which is less than she would normally receive during the week. And unlike the sheets of paper that is mostly filled with requests, these ones had contained information regarding the undead or any strange events that occurred that may be related to the outbreak. So far Tsunade and the other Kage know there are six different types of undead. The walkers. The slow and stumbling zombies are generally easy to kill. Just stay away from them and bombard them with jutsu after jutsu from a distance. They don't appear to show any sign of intelligence and would take punishment after punishment with no concern for their body until they drop. The runners. The faster and slightly smarter zombies. The runners appear to have some form of intelligence as they would often dodge the jutsus launched at them. When they're alone they are not a problem but when they are in groups they can prove to be a bit too much to handle for the genin. The sprinters. A more deadly and faster version of runners. They're able to keep pace and catch up with ninja in all ranks. They usually appear in large groups and it is recommended that any ninja who encounter these type of zombies to engage them with extreme caution. And then there are the animals. They are a special type of zombies that most people have difficulties with. The dogs from hell, upon seeing them appear in a ball of electricity for the first time, were thought to be summon animals. But when they started attacking the ninja and civilians, and ripping them to shreds in front of everyone that thought was quickly tossed aside. It wasn't long until they saw other zombified animals such as monkeys. The element users. These zombies are able to use a single element such as fire and wind, and are immune to said element. Not to mention the fire user is impervious to damage and the wind user can blind and disorientate you with the element it uses. And the electric zombie literally not be touched or it would shock people, or absorb the electricity shinobi and kunoichi use against it like I found out when he tried to take on. And then there is what the kage have dubbed as the super zombies. Zombies who are literally almost impossible to kill and have freakishly inhuman strength, durability, unlimited stamina and speed. Despite their differences they all have one thing in common, they slowly adapt to their every move with each encounter and they become more and more difficult to kill. When the undead first appeared out of nowhere it was thought that Orochimaru was to blame for their existence. His crimes and conducting twisted experiment on the people he kidnapped was well known throughout the elemental nations and wasn't that far-fetched to assume that he had something to do with it. That assumption was thrown out of the proverbial window when it was discovered that Orochimaru himself was researching in how to permanently kill them with little success. While he was obsessed with immortality he knew what kind of threat the undead are to the living and was trying to come up with a solution to deal with them in a permanent manner. During the early days of the zombie attacks, his research on the zombies he had managed to capture was invaluable to the Alliance as the notes entailed on how to effectively kill them and detailed on what would happen if someone was bitten. In the early months of the zombie invasion, destroying the brain or severing the head from its shoulders were most effective in reducing their numbers. It was also discovered by one of Orochimaru's experiments that if you were bitten by a zombie then there would be a 50 50 chance you would die within hours to several days. After that your body would reanimate almost instantaneously and would crave for living flesh while being reduced to your primal instincts. After another meeting between the five Kage, Orochimaru was offered to join the alliance and help them in the fight against the undead. Orochimaru while reluctant had agreed to join the alliance out of self-preservation. What Tsunade was doing right now was reading a report concerning the event that had happened the week before. A strange energy, 
unlike anything they had seen before, appeared out of nowhere near wave country and then vanished as just as quick as it appeared. Then the very same energy appeared once more, only this time within wave country itself. She sent a recon team there to see what the situation is. When the team she sent there to investigate arrived, it was revealed that in the previous week Wave Village was under attack by the undead for the past week. Then one day a group of five people appeared at the Great Naruto Bridge. On the day they arrived they somehow stopped the constant night attacks on the village before they mysteriously vanished in a blinding flash of light. They later learned that these people had appeared just hours after the mysterious energy signature came out of nowhere, and mysteriously vanished and the second energy appeared in wave country. When asked who these people were all they were told was that they came from across the seas and had contraptions on them that looked way more advanced than anything they had seen. They also gave a brief description on what the five looked like, saying they all had worn clothing that looked really out of place. They were never seen again after they mysteriously vanished. Her attention was taken away when she heard someone tapping on the window behind her. Frowning the curvaceous woman turned in her chair to the window and arched a single eyebrow when she saw a bird with a message tied around its leg. Frowning a bit more Tsunade got up out of her chair went to the windowsill and opened the window. She untied the message from the bird's foot and sitting back in her office chair, opened it with a furrowed brow. As she read her expression slowly changed from being indifferent to shocked disbelief. When she reached the end she slammed the letter on the desk and abruptly stood from her chair. Shizun, get in here. The bodacious blonde bellowed frenziedly. Not long after she yelled out to her assistant, a fairly pretty young woman with long straight shoulder-length black hair, dark eyes and carrying a piglet slammed open the office door and entered the room. She wore a long bluish-black kimono with white trimmings that is held closed by a white obi. The woman known as Shizun stared at her master with wide eyes and asked frantically. What is it Tsunade? Tsunade handed her the letter she received, Shizun took it and slowly read it. While confused at first after she read it, her head snapped up to stare at her master with wide, yet hopeful eyes. It this accurate? Because if this is then. It's the genuine thing Shizun. Tsunade replied, now that she regained her calmness and sat back down in her chair. What is in that message matches to what we know of the mysterious five that appeared and vanished just a week ago in the land of waves. One of the five is described as a young, blue-eyed blonde teenager in olive-colored trousers, black boots and a light green jacket. If he is part of their group then his friends should know of it. Then I will send for them. Shizun asked before she turned to hurriedly make her way out of the office. Tsunade nodded before she added as a last-minute thought. One more thing, get the Jonans Kakashi, Asuma, Guy and Kurinai to come here too. They need to know, especially Kakashi, that the brat is alive and well. Shizun nodded and went to call for the now-defunct Team Kakashi, with Sakura as Tuzan's apprentice and Sasuke betraying Konoha to go to Orochimaru for power and Naruto's presumed end at the Valley of the End, his body was never found, Kakashi's team was no longer in service, along with Team Guy, Asuma and Kurinai. Almost twenty minutes later all of the assembled people who were friends with Naruto, along with their teachers were in the office standing at attention. Even Kakashi who was known to be a very laid-back individual and to be a few hours late to every meeting was there on time. Tsunade stared at the assembled ninja with a mastered blank expression, allowing none of the ninja assembled in front of her to know what she was thinking. Gazing between them the Hokage nodded to herself before starting off. Tsunade put her arms on the desk and leaned forward with her fingers intertwined. I have asked you all here regarding recent information coming from the land of waves about the people we have dubbed as the mysterious five that has mysterious appeared and vanished a week ago. Hearing that the assembled ninja straightened themselves. If they weren't paying attention to her before then they were now. The mysterious five was as the name suggested a mystery to the ninja of Kanahagakur. As the hidden village closest to Wave Country they were the only ones to have sent a reconnaissance team there to investigate. Other hidden villages such as Kumogakure and Iwagakure have also felt the disturbance this mysterious energy had caused, 
but being far away they were unable to send aid to help them in their investigation. To keep their allies in the loop Tsunade sent information regarding the mysterious five to them to let them know who they should look out for concerning this group. Which wasn't much in the first place. What is this information you have received Lady Tsunade? Sakura Haruno, Tsunade's second apprentice asked respectfully. Tsunade took a moment to prepare herself for the outcry from her subordinates once she reveals the information to them. She knew how affected the brat's friends were after he was presumed MIA during the Sasuke retrieval mission and them reclassed to KIA once they never found his body. The information I received is about the mysterious five dot. She began and inwardly smiled to herself when all the jonin were staring at her intently now. It came from Tazuna himself and regards the identity of at least one member of this group. The information on this person is accurate considering it matches to what we know already. She grabbed and held up the message in front of Kakashi. I think you Kakashi should read the message considering it concerns someone you once knew. Kakashi narrowed his one good eye in confusion. Someone I once knew? He murmured curiously as he read the note. Who did he know that is part of the mysterious five? Not one minute later halfway through reading the whole thing did Kakashi's lone eye widen to epic proportions. He shakingly tore his eye away from the letter and to Tsunade in a pleading manner. Tsunade nodded in confirmation to the unasked question. She closed her eyes and prepared herself for the outcry she was likely going to receive from this next bit. Yes. Naruto Uzumaki is alive and is one of the members of the Mysterious Five. Dot. She dropped the bomb on them. The room was filled with shocked silence before it was broken with all of Naruto's friends talking loudly all at once. The Jonin, while shocked were more reserved and held their tongue and waited for their Hokage to speak. A few minutes of patently enduring the loud commotion Tsunade twitched and quickly and firmly held up a single hand in a stop gesture with a no-nonsense look on her face. One at a time please. I can't hear what you are saying if you are all talking at once. She admonished them. Once she had gotten her subordinates she had picked the first one of her ninja to speak who stepped forward in a respectful manner Hinata Hyuga. While she was a timid girl who had a severe lack of self-confidence growing up, she had gained a lot of confidence fighting against the zombies along with her comrades. Taking a deep breath Hinata Hyuga began to speak. How can N. Naruto be alive? Lord Jiraiya said his name was marked off from the Toad Summoning Contract, which only happens when a summoner dies. Being a clan heiress and being friends with Sakura who learned under not one but two people who also had a summoning contract, Hinata was able to learn the basics of what would happen to your contract if you died. Being marked off is the result. Tsunade shrugged her shoulders helplessly. Even I don't know that. Naruto's name was marked off the summoning scroll. I saw it myself. However I can assure you that the information is accurate. Tazuna says he talked to Uzumaki himself and even had the same facial features. The spiky blonde hair, the blue eyes, the whisker marks on both cheeks. I don't understand, if Naruto was alive all this time then why didn't he come back to us? Sakura asked with narrowed eyes and mounting frustration. Her hands were clenched at her sides and the skin around her knuckles were turning white. Kakashi put a hand on Sakura's shoulder to calm her down. I am sure there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. Isn't there Tsunade? Yes there is Kakashi. The woman replied in confirmation. From the letter it is said Naruto has amnesia. I don't know the severity of it. But. Feeling her voice trembling she abruptly cut herself off to collect herself for a moment. Taking a deep breath she continued. But from I have read, Tazuna says one of the mysterious five explained that the furthest Naruto can remember is three years ago, which is around when he went missing. Might Guy said, in a serious tone. Tsunade nodded once more in confirmation. It is safe to assume that Naruto does not remember any of us. From what Tazuna was told the only reason he came back to the elemental nations was because he recently remembered where he came from. Asuma rubbed his bearded chin with a thoughtful frown. 
If Naruto is part of the mysterious five what I want to know is where did they meet? Where did the other four come from? Tsunade shrugged her shoulders helplessly. That is something I want to know too. Tazuna described the other four as being foreigners. And given what we already know of them it is safe to assume they do not come from the elemental nations. We would have known of them otherwise. Tazuna says they all had weapons similar to the Kanai launchers. Kakashi stated as he continued to read the letter with a furrowed brow. He had seen the Kanai launchers in action when he and his team had taken a mission over to the Land of Snow, now known as the Land of Spring, three years ago before this whole zombie invasion began. Not to mention Kanahagakura had gotten several hundred of them over the years thanks to their alliance. He also says they looked a lot more advanced and slim in appearance. Do we know where they are currently? Karinai asked. Kakashi shook his head negatively. Unfortunately, no. I was part of the team who were sent to gain information on the strange energy readings that appeared near Wave Country the week before. The Mysterious Five appeared at the Great Naruto Bridge, shortly after the first burst of that unknown energy appeared. Then when the same kind of energy appeared again the five vanished not long after. They were never heard or seen since. So we know Naruto is alive but still don't know where he is. Kiba stated with crossed arms. Shaking his head Kiba looked at Tsunade and asked. What are our orders Lady Hokage? For now we do nothing. Without knowing where Naruto is we won't be able to find him and bring him home. Tsunade said before glaring firmly at her subordinates when she saw all but Shikamaru and her jonin were about to protest. You may not like it and neither do I, but we cannot forget the fact that none of us has any idea on where Naruto is located. Until we get an idea of his whereabouts or a possible location then all our resources must be focused on the undead. Understand? Yes, Lord Hokage. The assembled ninja said simultaneously. Good. You are all dismissed. XXXX Naruto blinked and blinked some more at what he saw. Or more correctly the lack of visibility. He looked around and saw nothing not even his comrades. Just a blank white in every direction that seemed to go on forever. What, what is this place? He asked. You're telling me kid. I can't see shit. Came Dempsey's unexpected reply and caused Naruto to let out a surprised cry. This place is bad for eyesight for this Cossack. I see nothing but whiteness. Is Nikolai blinded? Loudly cried out Nikolai in despair. Nian. I do not think you are. Was Samantha's calm reply. Strange. I should be able to see main own hand and yet I cannot. Curious. Perhaps we are in a realm of some kind? Takeo suggested. Samantha made a thoughtful, hm, sound and snapped her fingers in remembrance. It is possible. If you all remember, Vivir blinded by a blinding flash of light Ven Takeo placed the elemental staff on Je pedestal. V may have been taken some fear. Yeah that's possible. Maybe we were teleported? Naruto suggested. I mean think about it, we completed a task and stopped the undead from attacking a village when we brought back the elemental staff, and then we were all blinded by a flash of light something we all know is related to teleportation. To Naruto this seems to be the most logical explanation as to what happened to them. Not to mention this has happened to them several times already. But that still doesn't explain as to why they can't see anything. The group was silent as they thought on Naruto's words and came to realize that the whisker-faced blonde was right. That seems perfectly logical. Dempsey said after a moment of silence. It's odd that we're stuck in this blank-looking place though. We usually get teleported to the next location almost instantaneously. He added as an afterthought. Naruto let out a thoughtful sound prompting Takeo to ask, What is it, Naruto? Hmm. Oh, nothing Takeo. Just thinking is all. Dempsey arched an eyebrow at that. Whenever Naruto thinks it whatever he comes out with gives them a lot of sense of their current situation. What about Kiddo? 
the former Marine curiously asked. I'm just thinking about what Richtofen did. Hearing that man's name had provoked aggressive growls from everyone in the odd realm. What do you mean what that dishonorable man did? Takeo growled out viciously, just bear with me for a moment everyone, please. Naruto pleadingly told them. After getting their acknowledgement Naruto breathed a sigh of relief and continued. Takeo, Dempsey, and Nikolai you all remember that Richtofen seemed to know where we were every time we got to a new location right? Hearing their affirmative grunts Naruto added, Richtofen, somehow, some way brought us to those locations on purpose. My guess is because we have no idea on what to do, we ended up in this godforsaken place until we find a way to get out of here. The unknown dimension was filled with silence but Naruto knew they were all thinking on his theory. That, is an interesting theory. Takeo finally said, breaking the silence that had been dominating the realm. A most interesting theory. I would never thought that you would think of this Naruto. When you've spent your time watching and observing you pick up on a few things. Naruto honestly replied with a chuckle. I didn't think of it back then because well I didn't think of anything suspicious of him at the time. Not until Shangri-La when he got that rock. So if this theory of yours is right, then what do we do to get out of here? Dempsey asked. We need Samantha's help in doing that. Me? Samantha said in surprise speaking for the first time since the conversation had started. Yes, you Samantha. Naruto said with so much confidence that Samantha and the others had stopped to listen to what he had to say. Where we were taken, you followed us in pursuit. You were able to control thousands of zombies before Richtofen took control. You are, no offense, the closest thing to Richtofen we've got right now. As much as it pains me to say it, you are right. That do you need me to do? Can you try to show us the entire continent? I can try. Almost one minute later a gigantic tactical-like map, showing the entire elemental nations appeared in front of them. The first thing they noticed was a lot of the elemental nations appears to have been reduced to a barren wasteland. Towns and villages were burned to the ground leaving remains of the buildings that once stood there as a remainder to the survivors of what happened there. Much of the landscape was reduced to a barren wasteland, similar to what they have seen when they first arrived in this dimension. The elemental nations from their point of view looked like shit. But still better off than Earth. The tactical map was in real time too and they could see hordes of zombies of all types slowly moving across the entire landmass. Infecting and turning other people into zombies themselves. Not only that thanks to the map being there for some reason unknown to them Dempsey, Nikolai, Takeo, Samantha and Naruto were now able to see one another. Naruto while he didn't care much about his former home couldn't help but be angry at the state of it. It hit a nerve that this place was being reduced to a wasteland and this world military was steadily losing ground. The spiky-haired blonde narrowed his eyes dangerously at the sight. Fucking hell. This place is worse off than I thought. The others nodded in agreement, yeah. A lot of the landmass have been reduced to a barren wasteland. Dempsey said aloud before turning to Naruto. So do you see anything familiar to you on this map? Naruto furrowed his brow in thought as he tried to remember what he had learnt in the academy back when he was training to become a ninja. But with his amnesia it made remembering a little frustrating as the memories of his past is still fractured. Yeah. I remember a few things. The blonde eventually replied as he stared at the tactical map with narrowed eyes. The land of fire my birthplace, and is the largest country on this continent. You can see it here surrounded by massive trees. He said as the map helpfully pointed out to the group where Kanahagakura is. Surrounding the land of fire are six or seven other countries, several of them have been reduced to a barren wasteland however. As Naruto said this, the tactical map pointed out to the group where the other smaller country surrounding the land of fire was located by bullet points and showing them names of the country. The land of hot waters, land of rivers, land of sound, Kyuzagakure and Amigakure have all been shown to the group as the ones to have been reduced to a barren wasteland and most likely overrun with zombies. 
The hidden village Takigakir was, by the tactical map's point of view, surrounded by zombie activity and the land around it was already dead. It would be a matter of time before the zombies find a way to invade and overwhelm them from sheer numbers. They could choose to go there and help them fend the zombies off if they wanted to. To the east is the land of earth and the land of wind. I can't recall much about them though apart from the fact that the land of wind is the land of fire's ally. The land of earth has much animosity towards the land of fire for a reason I cannot remember. Naruto paused to take a breather and to allow the map to mark off the other two countries that is on the east side of the land of fire. To the northwest is the land of lightning and to the west where there are a various of islands is the land of water. I can't remember much about them unfortunately. Naruto finished while the tactical map pointed out where the land of lightning and the land of water is located to the group. A lot of these countries has most of their land reduced to a wasteland too. Dempsey grimly pointed out. Although the land of water seems to be fairly safe from the onslaught considering where they're located, they'll be screwed if they are invaded by an army of Hellhound's tank. Naruto dryly pointed out. One bite from them and you're fucked, unless you are immune like us. Not to mention they are likely to be isolated from outside world. The situation there may be worse than anywhere else on this fucking map. Nikolai added in a not-so-helpful manner. Takeo rubbed his chin in thought as he stared at the tactical map with a calculating eye. Many locations are open to us. But we can only choose one. But which one shall we choose, well? Naruto began as he stared at the tactical map with a keen eye. Several countries surrounding the Great Five are already overrun. If we want we can choose one of them and search for any weaponry we can use against the undead or we can try and liberate them. Another choice is we can go to one of the Great Five, and try and help them fight against the zombies there. But we don't know just how they'll react to five people appearing out of thin air. Dempsey nodded his head and as he stared at the different locations the former United States Marine stated in a militaristic tone, so we have locations and points of interest marked out for us. Some are already beyond help and others are steadily losing ground against the undead horde. Question is, where, bouts do we go to next? All Dempsey received was silence as his answer. Naruto had lost track of how long he was in the Darius facility. Most of his time spent there was undergoing experimentations that had the unfortunate effect of making his amnesia even worse. What little memory he had to begin with and the ones he was eventually regaining was now gone. Apart from knowing how to speak, knowing his name and age and to function on his own he was essentially a blank slate. He had miraculously retained the memory of his friendship with Dempsey, Takeo, and Nikolai however. He did not know how long he had been there but he knew he was never brought out of his room he shared with Dempsey, Takeo, and Nikolai unless it was to be experimented on. So he was confused and a little suspicious as to where he was being led as he followed Ludwig Maxis through the corridors of the facility. From what little interaction he had with the man Ludwig Maxis is a nice man. A kind man even despite the experimentations he had allowed his subordinates and assistant to preform on him. Maxis? Can I please ask you a question? He suddenly asked, You may young one. The man replied without looking over his shoulder. Where are we going exactly? He asked with curiosity in his voice. The only time I've been allowed out of my room is when I have. He trailed off before sighing in depression. He didn't need to finish what he was about to say. Maxis already knew what he had went through in this place since he got here. Ludwig did not say anything for the longest time. I am taking you to see someone I hold very dear to me. Maxis replied after gathering his thoughts together. She needs to interact with someone that is close to her age. Naruto had his interest piqued. There was someone close to his age and she was important to the doctor? Who is she? Naruto asked as he and Ludwig Maxis stopped outside a closed door. Ludwig wrapped his hand around the handle as he looked down at the curious boy who was staring between himself and the door with barely concealed interest. Maxi seeing this allowed a small smile to pull at the sides of his lips. My daughter, Samantha Maxis. 
the doctor said before opening the door. XXXX. The border between the land of fire and the land of hot water was currently peaceful. There was no invading army of zombies. No life or death battles that decides the fate of a village or town. It was a rare moment. As Jiraiya, the toad sage of Mount Mayaboku, sat on a hilltop overlooking the barren wasteland that was once part of the land of fire he silently mused as to how the world came to this state. If he were a guessing man then he would guess that Naruto, his godson, going missing was the catalyst. It may have been mere coincidence that the dead rose from the grave a month after Naruto vanished, but in truth, it could have been anything really. A ninja somewhere in the elemental countries could have tried to test out a new technique and it backfired which resulted in what is happening right now. Another guess could have been a novice seal user who designed a seal that was far too complicated. One thing led to another and the dead rose from their graves. A ninja could have been experimenting on people like Orochimaru is widely known to do. If he were a religious man then he may have believed that the dead came back to life in order to punish them for all the misdeeds they've caused. Three Shinobi World Wars The Abuse of Jinchuriki Giving away the tailed beasts literal forces of nature to villages that sealed them in human containers in order to control their power. He knows that the Shinobi world has brought a lot of death and misery to others for the benefit of their village. For their country. And instead of learning from their many past mistakes they continue the cycle anew. Nevertheless the world as he knew it was being decimated little by little by an enemy that does not know how to stay dead. No matter how many zombies the ninja alliance manages to put down, a hundred more would come and take their place. Almost all forms of chakra was useless against the walking dead. For example, what happens when you use techniques that attack one's chakra network on something that does not have one? Nothing. Nothing happens, and that is because illusions don't do shit on the dead. Techniques that use elements such as water, lightning, fire and earth however have proven to be effective against them. Even the raw chakra that Jinchuriki use have proven to be most effective and so far the zombies have been unable to adapt to the raw chakra of a tailed beast. And since Kanoha had lost theirs when Naruto vanished three years ago they were at a major disadvantage. But they held their own against the undead without a Jinchuriki backing them and this had shown the shinobi world just why the land of fire was known as the strongest country in the elemental nations. Another form of chakra that was effective against the zombies much to Jiraiya's relief was nature chakra. Since nature chakra was part of nature itself the zombies were, for a reason unknown to him, unable to adapt to it. Using summon animals to help fight off the dead was as of two years ago off limits. To his surprise all summon animals were being invaded by the undead as well. Unsurprisingly the summons were having more success in fighting off the dead than the humans were. Almost being the size of a small mountain did have its perks. However in spite their successes in pushing back the undead they too were having problems. The zombies seem to be growing more and more in number with each death every day and they are slowly adapting to the way summons fight as well. But until the summon animals find a way to keep the dead from finding their way into their realm then summoning them was prohibited unless the situation really called for it. That was two years ago. Then not more than a week ago he felt a new energy source appear just on the outskirts of the land of fire. The land of waves if he remembered correctly. He did not travel over there to look into what was the cause of the strange energy source considering he was helping ninjas of different nationalities fight off zombies at the time. By the time he got there the trail was cold, but had gotten information from fellow Kanoha Shinobi of a group of five people who mysteriously appeared out of nowhere and somehow stopped a zombie invasion that was plaguing the village for the past seven days. After probing the Kanoha ninja for more information he had gotten a small description of the dubbed, mysterious five and the weapons they held. When he heard of the blue-eyed, spiky blonde-haired teenage boy being with them it caused alarms to go off in his head. He had his suspicions on who the boy was and after reverse summoning himself to Mount Mayaboku he quickly checked the summoning scroll to see if his suspicions about the boy was correct. To his dismay the name he had been wanting to see back on the scroll was not there. Therefore his suspicions were not correct. 
sighing aloud with depression Jiraiya shook his head to get rid of the depressing thoughts and got to his feet. From his current location he was near Yugakure and beyond that is a large division of Kyomo Shinobi, along with one of their Jinchuriki leading the division, is stationed and is attempting to delay the advancement of the undead horde into the land of lightning. He was on his way to support them after catching wind about it from civilians who were fleeing the land of hot water. Not that it would do them any good considering the undead are almost everywhere. From his estimate it would take him about three to four hours tops. Two if he really pushed himself while traveling at ninja speed to get there. Sending Chakra to his legs the toad sage leap off the hill and sprinted the way of the way to his destination. Every second was crucial and if he wasted it resting then the changes of the division succeeding holding their ground was becoming less and less likely. As he made his way to the land of hot water the toad sage felt a large spike of Chakra near the border of the country he was going to, and the land of frost. Knowing of the defense stationed there Jiraiya guessed it was them doing something big to increase their chances of success. XXXX Dempsey, Samantha, Takeo, Nikolai and Naruto narrowed their eyes in interest as the group stared at a rather large defense force preparing themselves to protect the land of frost. Not more than four miles away is a large force of type 1 zombies, and they are closing the distance at a shocking pace. The location the group are looking at is in the land of hot water, a country that stands between the land of fire and the land of frost. It is also one of the many countries that has been overrun with zombies is now nothing more than a wasteland. So that is where we're going next, huh? Yep, that is where we are heading tank. Naruto replied with his head nodding. Appearing in front of your defense group before the undead get Jura may not vark in our favor. If V.E. veer to suddenly appear without any varning, then they may become hostile towards us the moment V.E. reveal ourselves. V. may have to appear somewhere else so V.E. do not startle them. That's true. Dempsey admitted. Appearing right in the middle of them may work against us than for us. So where do we go from here? He asked himself before he turned to stare at the others for suggestions. Takeo has a keen tactical mind. Naruto surprisingly can think up plans and tactical ideas on the spot. Nikolai whenever he isn't completely hammered to the level he can't tell his own ass from his foot can think for himself and is fairly intelligent. But that was rare. Samantha he was not too sure about her, since she hasn't been with the group that long. But she has been more helpful to them than Richtofen had ever been since she had joined their little group. Grumbling to himself Nikolai sat down, unstrapped his back sack, opened it and took out a bottle of vodka. After uncorking the bottle Nikolai took two mouthfuls of the alcoholic liquid and recorked it. Smacking his lips Nikolai put the bottle back in his sack and made a suggestion. What if we were to wait? And then once the hellspawns are engaged with the defenders we make our appearance when they're fighting? A viable method. But not a good idea. Naruto replied as the tactical map zoomed in on the defense force so the group would have a better understanding on their placement. I may not remember much about these idiots who have the gall to call themselves a ninja, but I do know they are likely to have a lot of widespread based chakra techniques. So appearing in the thick of the fighting may not be a good thing to do. These widespread techniques you mentioned, just how widespread are we talking, here? Dempsey asked. Naruto shrugged helplessly as he scratched the back of his head. I don't know. Let's just assume, because they can defy all logic, that they can wipe out entire battalions in a matter of seconds. Dempsey nodded his head conceitedly. Okay, fair enough. While he could ask more questions to get more answers he decided to conclude the conversation there. Naruto barely remembers anything of this dimension anyway. But he did have a fair point, Naruto did defy logic by making a solid copy of himself and considering he came from here, it is safe to assume these, ninja, and he is using that term loosely because the things these people do not have the right to call themselves that, can use similar techniques. What in the name of? The group heard Samantha say in disbelief. Nikolai, Dempsey. Takeo and Naruto who weren't looking at the map at the time brought back their attention to the tactical map. 
Just when they saw a large concrete wall that is several miles long in length suddenly spout out of the ground in front of the defense force. What? Dempsey began as he stared at the newly appeared wall in shocked disbelief. The. Takeo added, looking equally shocked as the American. Fuck. Nikolai concluded looking and sounding as shocked as Takeo and Dempsey is. Naruto merely stared at the scene with arched brows and a slightly gaping mouth. He knew that the ninja of his dimension are capable of a lot of great and terrible things. But he never really expected them to be able to create a large solid concrete wall from the ground itself. Well that's new. I wonder where that came from. Just as Naruto asked that question he took notice of several ninjas kneeling with their hands planted firmly on the ground in front of them. He analyzed the scene and quickly came to a theory as to what had happened. The ninjas that are kneeling on the ground must have done one of their logic-defying techniques and made that concrete wall spout out of the ground. Taking a minute to gather himself Dempsey slapped himself across the face to make sure he wasn't hallucinating. He wasn't. Sighing shakingly the former marine turned to Naruto and said, Okay, this dimension of yours Naruto is just getting weirder and weirder by the minute. What's next, being able to summon a god? Even though it was a rhetorical question Naruto replied anyway. Defying all laws of physic and logic remember? You cannot be serious kid. They could summon an actual god? Dempsey questioned with mounting disbelief. If Naruto was being serious about his people being able to do that then fucking hell. I dunno. The whisker face blonde mumbled lowly. I came to your dimension through unknown means. Not to mention we exited your dimension and came to mine from a portal made by a machine powered by element 115. If that is possible then anything is. Takeo nodded in agreement with Naruto. If that is possible then they can't do things half-ass here. They will have to be careful and make sure they don't piss off the people here. I believe we can all agree with one another that we should to expect the unexpected? Naruto clasped his hands together enthusiastically after they agreed. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get back to what we were doing before, finding out where we should appear. He said with so much enthusiasm in his voice it sounded fake to be real. After Naruto said that the group then began to plan on where they would enter the battle from, teleporting right in the thick of battle was something they agreed not to do. They would be at risk from attacks from not just the zombies but from the ninja as well. They also agreed to not appear in front of the defense force, just in case they might take the five of them as hostiles by accident and attack them. But they can be too far from them either. In the end Samantha got fed up over their bickering and indecision and picked the location for them without their consent. XXXX on the border between land of hot water and the land of frost we find the ninjas from Kumogakur standing and in some cases kneeling on top of the concrete wall they had created to delay the zombie advance. Ever since the zombies learned from each encounter with the ninjas they've engaged, the ninjas from different nations were having difficulties in trying to stop the zombies from advancing deeper in their territory. They were forced to go back to their basics that involved using anything at their disposal such as hand-to-hand -hand combat or projectiles weapons. Unfortunately they were unable to get their hands on any of the Kanai launchers that Kanoha had gotten recently from the Land of Spring. They would have helped tremendously. However they knew that some chakra techniques were utterly useless against the dead while others were more effective. Earth Release, Earth Style Wall is a defense technique. Used by the user or users to either help defend their position or themselves, and as the name of the technique suggests, it isn't ideal for attacking but defending, or in some cases delaying an enemy's advance. In this case the technique is used to delay the zombies from advancing into the land of frost and in turn the land of lightning. Have you heard about that group that appeared out of nowhere near the land of waves? A Kumo ninja of Genin rank suddenly asked as a conversation starter and as a way to pass the time. The so-called, Mysterious Five? Yeah, I heard of them. A Kunoichi of Chunin rank replied with a nod of her head. They were said to have stopped the zombies attacking the wave village on the day they appeared only to vanish into thin air not long after. I wonder why they are called that though. 
We barely know anything about them, and what little we do know of them makes the five of them mysterious. A third Kyumo ninja also of Chunin rank said including himself in the conversation. I heard they are all foreigners that come from a distant land across the seas, far beyond the elemental nations. I have never heard of any other lands that lie beyond the elemental nations. That's because we never sent anyone to explore the world beyond. It is of no surprise we never heard of them until last week. And even then we still know next to nothing about them. What about the Kanohanines? They were looking into it since they are closer to the land of waves. I heard they got little to no information regarding the mysterious five. Just a basic description of them among other things. The Kumo ninja that began to conversation replied, How long do you think the dead will arrive? That is something we don't know. They all turned and saw the commander of the defense force, Yujito Ni standing behind them with her arms crossed as she stared ahead unflinchingly. Yujito Ni is a 29 years old woman, a jonin and the second Jinchuriki of Kumogakure. She has dark eyes and long straight blonde hair that was bound with tight bandages that reached down her mid-back. Her attire consists of a short-sleeved black and purple blouse and black pants with both of them having a similar design of clouds on them and a red belt around her waist. On her arms and legs she also wore bandages of a similar design she used to bound her hair. Lastly the woman wore purple fingerless gloves and a chain of blue beads wound around her left arm and hand. The blonde-haired woman looked at her subordinates and added, seeing as they never tire they could arrive at any time at any moment. That is why we must remain vigilant. Commander Yujito. All the ninjas in close proximity jumped to their feet and stood in attention respectfully. The ninja who spoke continued. What do you think our chances in succeeding holding back the undead? Yujito stared at her comrades with a hard look. Do you want the optimistic or honest answer? She asked. The honest answer. Yujito nodded and then answered honestly. Very well then I won't sugarcoat anything. The honest answer is this, with the enemy being able to quickly adapt to our abilities with every encounter our chance of defending the land of frost successfully is slim. So we have no chance then? I never said that. Yujito replied sharply, giving the nameless ninja that spoke a fierce glare. Our chance of succeeding may be small but it is not impossible. Not to mention you have me here. She reminded them all, while at the same time, raising their hopes since Yujito is the second strongest jonin Kumogakure has because of her Jinchuriki status. So far the chakra of a tailed beast is effective against the dead and not to mention they are for the moment unable to adapt to it. If the situation becomes dire enough then I will transform into my tailed beast form. One of the nearby jonin Kunoichi, who had dark brown hair tied in a bun asked pensively, do we know what type of zombie we're up against? It was reported that type 1s are what we are up against. Yujito replied informatively. But that can easily change. As you all most likely know type 1s are able to evolve to type 2s or 3s depending on the circumstance. And having fought all three types I know how difficult they are. She trailed off as she and everyone else in the defense force felt an unknown source of energy suddenly appear out of nowhere, in the direction of Yukigure. It did not take long for them to recognize that the mysterious energy signature was the one that had appeared near the land of waves the week before. Knowing just how mysterious the group that appeared one week ago was, and the connection they had with this unknown energy, Yujito to make her decision. She turned to the nearest ninja and with authority in her voice began her orders. She recognized the first two and addressed them. Akira. Get a group of four ready to mobilize and follow my lead. We need to reach Yukigure before the undead can. She then turned to the Kunoichi that was beside Akira. Asuka you take command here while I'm gone. Make sure no one abandons their post. A Chunin addressed as Akira, nodded his head frantically before speeding off to do what Yujito had asked of him. Asuka when given her orders merely saluted and immediately began to give out orders to inform the defense force that she is going to be in command for the time being. Meanwhile Yujito had already leapt off the wall and was making her descent to the ground. 
Using the skills she had gained from years of experience as a ninja the female Jinchuriki safely and expertly landed on the ground in a kneel, making a small smoke cloud that was filled with dirt and dust from the dying earth shoot up into the air around her. Huffing the blonde-haired woman leapt up like a cat and started sprinting in the direction where she had last felt the energy signature. That energy was exactly the same as the one that appeared at the Land of Waves. The very same energy that signified the mysterious group's arrival. If her hunch was right, if she continued moving in the direction she was going now, she and her group, once they caught up to her, would soon meet up with this mysterious group that made themselves famous in the elemental nations. Elsewhere at the exact same time, Jiraiya was making his way to the land of hot water. On his way to the abandoned country he too had felt the mysterious energy suddenly appear out of nowhere. The toad sage narrowed his eyes as he stopped his fast pace, and closed his eyes to concentrate in his sensing of the direction the energy had come from. Huh, now that is odd. The energy dispersed just as fast as it appeared so he was not able to completely pinpoint where the energy originated. Concentrating a little Jiraiya was able to detect a few traces of it left, not enough for him to point it down however. He isn't that much of a sensor without of sage mode but he is passable. As he felt for the energy he picked up something else that was almost smothered, coming from the northeast. Now that is interesting. A chakra signature? He mused to himself aloud as he scratched his chin. Jiraiya focused his limited sensing on the chakra signature. From the distance he is from it the chakra signature was coming in the direction of Yukigur and was barely noticeable. As if it was being suppressed. There is also feeling of familiarity to it. He wouldn't know why the chakra signature felt familiar to him unless he got closer. That chakra signature feels familiar. The toad sage said to himself as he opened his eyes. Could it be someone I know from Kanoha? He asked himself thoughtfully, before shaking his head. No, it isn't likely to be anyone from the land of fire. He told himself. It takes almost a month at the very least to reach Yukigur. The rumored, mysterious five is the likely answer, but why would one of them be someone I should know? No, a better question is why is there only one chakra signature instead of five? There are so many questions, and so little answers. And if he wanted the answers then he needs to go to Yugikur to get them. He decided to take a little detour from his original destination. Yugikur leads the way to the land of frost and that former hidden village fell a long time ago. There is nothing more than ruins and abandoned buildings there now. He also knew if the undead are to reach the land of frost, and in turn the Kumo defense force, they would have to pass through Yugikir first. XXXX Takeo blinked his eyes in bewilderment. He was no longer in that odd place with the others and in was in a different area. He quickly raised his Type 100 and carefully scanned his surroundings. He appears to be in an abandoned town that was filled with a lot of decay and rot with a battered-looking bridge nearby that would look like it would collapse if the slightest weight was pressed on it. The buildings now that he looked closely at them were covered in fungus and corrosion. Most likely the exposure to time in combination to the earth dying being the main reason for this. The buildings, even the bridge, are made from the resources the earth provides. It made sense they too would deteriorate as the earth did. How did he end up here again? Oh, that's right, Samantha got fed up with their indecision and teleported them down to the planet, to a completely random location, without their consent. Sighing in irritation Takeo allowed to the Type 100 to drop against his waist. With it in close proximity to his hand, he can easily grab it, bring it up and take aim in less than 10 seconds. Still. He had to admit to himself that something good did come out of this. Samantha had gotten them to a location and from what he can tell it is not near the defense force that had made the wall in the far distance. Wait a minute, Takeo squinted his eyes and made his way to the bridge to get a better look. A fair distance away, approximately three miles is his guess, there is a giant wall that seemed to stretch for miles. If he were to guess from where he was, the samurai would say the walls were about 40 feet in height. Maybe more. Takeo? The man heard Naruto loudly calling out. 
He was fairly close by too from how loud the boy's voice was. You around somewhere? Over here, Uzumaki. The former imperial officer yelled out in response without turning around. He had thought on not replying for a moment, but quickly threw that idea out of the proverbial window. Takeo was not that sort of person. Dempsey and Belinsky were. And in some cases so too was Samantha. But he was not. Nor will he ever be. His tactical mind knew how important it was for them all to regroup as soon as possible. The former imperial officer heard Naruto making an affirmative grunt before trying to make his way over to him. A few minutes later Naruto finally found Takeo standing by the bridge looking in the distance. The whisker face blonde immediately noticed something different about the man. The elemental staff that was strapped to his back was something even a five-year-old would notice. But it wasn't that, that had made Takeo look different. Instead of the, old, but wise man who can kick your ass five ways to Sunday look Takeo had about him, the Asian man was, less strained. He seemed younger for some reason. It wasn't until Naruto was close to the man that he was able to confirm the differences. Takeo had indeed gotten younger. The wrinkles that were on his face were now gone. The mustache that was above his upper lip now had a rough beard to go with it. He now looks to be in his mid to late twenties instead of his fifties. He still wore the same uniform when he had first met the man. The officer's uniform the samurai would wear when they are in the imperial army to signify their heritage. Takeo. Said man silently turned his head and looked at Naruto with curiosity at the nervous tone in his voice. What did the boy have to be nervous about? Do you feel different than you remember? Takeo narrowed his eyes in confusion. What sort of question was that? Why would he feel different than he normally would? He paused. Now that Naruto mentioned it he did feel a little different. He feels a lot stronger and more healthier than he remembered. Not to mention he feels like thirty years was taken off from his age. Now that it has been mentioned I do feel different. The man replied with a gesture of acknowledgement. He closed his eyes and steadily breathed in through his nose and out through his mouth. I feel younger. Stronger. Much healthier. I feel I can fight for several hours and then some. He opened his eyes and looked at Naruto once more. Why do you ask, young one? Rubbing his chin Naruto let out an analyzing sound as he looked Takeo over. Well you look a lot, lot more younger than I remember you being. He said to the man as he stared up at him. He didn't see Takeo being young necessarily as a bad thing. Takeo stared at Naruto in astonishment for a moment and quickly brought his hands to his face to look them over. While he couldn't see his own face Takeo knew his own body well enough to know its limits. He had seen the wrinkles on the back of his hands since he had came to his late thirties early forties. To see them without the wrinkles for the first time in almost thirty years was astounding for the samurai. He looked over his shoulder noticing the elemental staff for the first time he had arrived here. There was only one way that this was possible. It had to have been after he had got the staff. He saw that Naruto came to the same conclusion as he did, given the look the whisker-faced blonde was giving to the staff. Are you thinking what I'm thinking Takeo? Yes. It appears the elemental staff may have been the main cause of my decrease in age. They turned their heads around to look over their shoulder when they heard Dempsey loudly calling out. Nikolai. Naruto. Takeo. Where the hell are you all? They heard his voice from behind the fence. Takeo and I are over here tank. Is Samantha and Nikolai with you? Naruto called back, revealing their location to the former United States Marine. Both Takeo and Naruto heard the Marine grumbling incoherently under his breath while not answering the question he was asked. Naruto inwardly sighed in irritation. Of course Dempsey wouldn't answer his question about Samantha, he still did not trust her after all. Suddenly the fence was knocked down sending dust and splinters everywhere. 
Both Takeo and Naruto stared at the feet with wide eyes as an annoyed Dempsey emerged from the smoke with Nikolai and a sheepish-looking Samantha trailing behind him. The trio made their way to Naruto and Takeo at the bridge. After they were finally beside the duo Dempsey finally answered to the question Naruto had asked him two minutes before. Yeah, they're with me. Dempsey sniffed the air as he leaned against the bridge and sneezed violently. Man, it stinks here. What can you expect from a place that is literally rotting and decaying? Good point. Dempsey conceded. He looked around and seeing the wall from the real-time tactical map had asked, so any ideas on where the hell we ended up? Because I know for a fact we're not near the defense force seeing as the wall they made is all the way, way, way over there. Nikolai rubbed his armpit as he grunted thoughtfully at the back of his throat. Perhaps we are in land of waters? He stated, before shaking his head seconds after. No, that's not it. Hot waters? Duh. Land of hot waters. I remember now. To get to land of lightning the hellspawn would need to pass through the land of hot waters. Very perceptive of you, Nikki. Takeo said thinly. Both Naruto and Samantha knew that Nikolai can be frighteningly perceptive when he wants to be. Because of the way Nikolai is, a lot of people quickly forget that and think he is an unintelligent drunk. Holy fuck! Nikolai suddenly exclaimed in shock as he took in Takeo's youthful appearance. What the fuck happened to you Takeo? Dempsey and Samantha looked at Takeo and they too were shocked at how longer the samurai looked. Samantha however was able to keep her shock well under control. Tank Dempsey, not so much. He aimed his M-16 at the samurai with a suspicious look on his face. Are you serious? Naruto asked blandly, and with a blank expression upon seeing the marine holding Takeo at gunpoint. I am dead serious Naruto. Dempsey said seriously, never taking his eyes and gun away from Takeo who merely stared down at the barrel of the gun with an uncaring look. How do we know that this is the real Takeo? You spent the past five minutes standing beside him tank, and I was with him longer than that. Naruto pointed out in the same bland tone and expressionless face. Not to mention Dash, he pointed his index finger at the elemental staff that hanging from the samurai's back. He still has the staff we got from the wave village. Dempsey looked at the staff for a few seconds before looking back to Naruto. It could have been faked. Was the marine's stubborn reply. He knows where we've been and what we've done. Dempsey gazed between Takeo and Naruto for a moment. Really now, we'll see about that. And refocused his attention on the indifferent Takeo who of all things was looking bored. If you are really Takeo, then this should be easy for you since you were there when this happened, what is the most embarrassing thing that happened to me? Takeo arched an eyebrow at the question. There were a lot of embarrassing moments Dempsey had. But there was one that stood out. The time they were trapped in the frozen shut room that was filled with darkness. He answered that question by asking a question of his own. Is this before or after we reached Shangri-La? Before. Very well. Takeo much to the surprise of everyone had an uncharacteristic smile. Looking as if he was going to enjoy what he was going to do next. We were all trapped behind a frozen door at the time. I was vomiting, and the room we were all trapped in was dark. Richtofen was trying to find a light switch and in his search he dash. Okay. Okay. You are the real Takeo. Just don't mention that ever again. Dempsey frantically cut the Asian from finishing his sentence. The others stifled their laughter at Dempsey's frantic interruption and quickly silenced themselves when he glared dangerously at them. Daring them to laugh at his misfortune with Richtofen. Clearing her throat Samantha looked at everyone with a serious look. Joking aside V.E. need to prepare for Je Undead Zad V.E. will inevitably encounter. Knowing that Samantha was right they too became serious. Wanting to know how much time they had left, Naruto turned to Samantha since she is connected to the undead. She just can't take control of them anymore. Samantha do you know how long we have until they get here? 
Samantha narrowed her eyes and looked at Naruto in return. I will check. Samantha closed her eyes and a second later they snapped open, revealing a pair of glowing yellow eyes. Her skin also lost its color, becoming a pale white, like snow during the winter. This was Samantha's awakened state, where Samantha uses whatever remained of her power when she was controlling the zombies to help out the group. Having seen this a few times before and knowing she wouldn't harm them, it still made the others nervous to be around her. Even Naruto. Having seen those pair of eyes on all the zombies before Richtofen and Samantha switched bodies on the moon it became unnerving to see it on a girl like Samantha who always appeared so lively. While it did unnerve them they had to admit her being allowed to do that, despite being in a body not of her own, saved their hides multiple times in the past. Not only did that ability tell Samantha how many zombies there are, she also knew of their location. There was also a weird side effect that affected her speech pattern. Instead of having a German accent she had an American one. Strange, isn't it? Samantha narrowed her eyes as she looked to the east. I found them. They're coming from the south and are less than one mile away from us. My guess is they'll be here within the hour. She told them. Dempsey nodded in confirmation. Then we need to prepare for their arrival. He told them before taking command. Samantha do you think you can help us out by putting some weapon outlines and perk machines around this place? It will strain my already limited power but it can be done. That's all we'll need. We can change our weapons, or get more ammo, and increase our chances of survival by drinking those perka colas. He then turned to Takeo. Takeo do you think that staff would be of any use? He questioned regarding the elemental staff on his back. Takeo took the staff from his back and held it in front of him with the top facing the ground. He didn't know why but it felt he knew how to use it. As if the knowledge on how to use it was was engraved into his memories. There was a lever-like trigger near his left hand to make it fire, he would just have to pull on it. Yes. Takeo eventually answered. I believe the staff would be of use to us. It fires balls of molten lava. Naruto dryly pointed out. If that isn't useful then I don't know what is. Being able to melt the sons of bitches beyond recognition does sound useful. Dempsey stated with grim satisfaction in his tone. But to me watching them turn into red mist, when we tear their bodies apart with our bullets is much, much more satisfying. He added as an afterthought, what about blowing them away with thunder gun? You enjoy doing that more than any of us. Everyone had to give Nikolai a point there as he was speaking the truth. Dempsey did genuinely enjoy blowing zombies away with the thunder gun in both Kino der Toten and Ascension. What's not to enjoy? You blow them up into the sky. Plus it clears out rooms quickly enough. Not like the Wonder Waffle. Hey! That gun was awesome. You could clear out rooms with that too. Naruto said coming to the defense of the electric used weapon. What could he say? He freaking loved that gun. It was always a one-hit kill no matter what type of zombie they were or the distance you fired from. Of course you had to make sure that the bolt of electricity managed to connect with its target or it would have been a waste. But it was always a one-hit kill no matter the distance you were. If you were on top of a roof of a building then as long as the bolt hit its target, it would spread out to several more zombies like a chain and kill them instantly. Unlike the thunder gun you had to be close to the zombies in order for it to be a one-hit kill. Before you all get carried away we need to figure out where we can go to hold the zombies off. Samantha said reminding them of the oncoming threat. In her, are there any buildings we can use to defend against them? The buildings aren't safe enough to hide in. Naruto replied as he spun around with the others turning with him to look at the buildings. As you can see they're rotting and most of them look like they are going to collapse at any second. Not to mention taking shelter from the undead in any of these buildings will trap us from all sides as well. Samantha added in support of Naruto. Staying outside we would have an advantage of staying one step ahead of them. Staying in the open isn't safe either. 
countered Dempsey. They'll be swarming us from every direction. Inside these buildings we can funnel the freak sacks through the doorways or windowsills allowing us to easily pick them off. Not to mention giving us a better chance of survival. Both of your concerns on our situation have merit. Takeo butted in the conversation. Having gotten their attention he began to state his own points about staying in the open, or staying in the buildings. Staying in any of these structures, we would be at risk of having it collapse on top of us, and surrounded by enemies. But we would be able to combat the undead with great efficiency if they are focused on getting inside through the windows and doorways. However, staying outside, we would be at risk of getting separated and overwhelmed. Staying inside buildings for long period of time is not good idea then. Nor is staying outside. Nikolai said. He understood what Takeo was trying to say. Takeo nodded in confirmation glad that Nikolai was able to understand. The Asian then went on to tell the group to remember about their past experiences on their engagement with the undead, he brought up Doris and sure no Numa, as examples where they held their ground in the rooms Doris provided but moved on when they were being close to getting overwhelmed. For sure no Numa Takeo reminded them all how many close calls they had because they stayed in the open swamp instead of taking shelter in the buildings or huts that was close to them. The five of them nearly lost their lives in that godforsaken place because they never used their common sense and now while they were trying to plan on how to deal with the oncoming threat, he realized they were once again not using their common sense. While they did make good and bad points they conveniently forgot they can move to other buildings before they get overwhelmed. When Takeo finally got his piece said, Samantha nodded her head in agreement with Takeo and asked them in a questioning tone, why don't you do what you used to do when I was controlling the zombies? Move from building to building before you get overwhelmed? That was an effective strategy you used against me if I am honest. They all stared at her making the girl a little uncomfortable at the looks they were giving her. Then all of a sudden Naruto much to the surprise of everyone palmed his face and groaned at their stupidity for not using their common sense. You know instead of having this conversation we could have just done what Samantha suggested. The whisker face blonde said to Dempsey, Nikolai and Takeo without turning to look at them. Suddenly Samantha whipped her head to the south of their location her normally calm eyes going wide in distress. The others saw this and quickly raised their guns and carefully surveyed their surroundings. Anything that startled Samantha was bound to be bad for them in the long run. Samantha what is it? Questioned Dempsey as he scanned carefully scanned the building rooftops for any zombie activity. Having fought zombies that could teleport anywhere at any time, he knew they had to keep an eye on everything within their field of vision. The zombies. Said the girl in a faint whisper. They've started to run. The four turned to look at Samantha with confused yet startled looks before looking at one another worryingly. Their previous encounters with zombies told them they don't just suddenly run. Walkers don't run. Dempsey stated as his teeth bared to an angry snarl. Samantha, put those weapon outlines on the walls and get those perk machines down here ASAP. He ordered as he pulled the magazine out of the chamber of his M-16 to see how much ammo was currently in it. These are not walkers we're going to be dealing with. No shit. Nikolai exclaimed with a loud curse. He too was checking how much ammo he had in his drum magazine for his PPSH-41 by taking it off the slot where the magazine would go, and weighting it in his hand. It was heavy so Nikolai knew it was full. These are either runners or sprinters we are to be dealing with. Hopefully it's the former and not the latter. Naruto said to them urgently. Like the others he too was checking how much ammo was in the magazine of his assault rifle. However unlike the others he was checking how much bullets were inside his side arm as well. While the others were checking on how much ammo they had Samantha was doing what Dempsey had asked her to do. Glowing eyes closed in concentration Samantha used her already limited power to place weapon outlines on the walls of the abandoned village. Once that was done she then summoned the perk machines and spread them throughout the village so they would not be too close to one another. With the perk machines and weapon outlines in place, Samantha began to sway on her feet as she went back to her normal state. 
She promptly fell to her knees wheezing heavily and looking out of it. Naruto seeing this had already finished checking his weapons and quickly wrapped an arm around her waist, and helped her stay on her feet as she didn't have the strength to do it by herself at the moment. As Samantha mentioned before, her power was limited. She is unable to do what she was capable of doing before completely. She could bring perk machines, power-ups, and weapon outlines to aid her group. She can sense the presence of zombies from up to 10 miles in diameter but will not be able to control them like before. Unlike trying to discover where the zombies are in terms of location, bringing the perk machines and weapon outlines to her team strains the body she is possessing significantly. She would be weak for 10 minutes at the very least and would require the aid of the ones around her. However she was friends with Naruto, and on relatively good terms with the others. Figuratively speaking of course. She knows if she wasn't useful to them then Dempsey, Nikolai, and Takeo would have abandoned her long ago. Samantha, are you okay? Asked a frantically worried Naruto who had an arm under her arm to keep her on her feet. Samantha still wheezing nodded her head slowly yet tiredly in response. I am alright Naruto, I merely need to rest until I get mean strength back. Naruto nodded his head before looking around for the closest building to take shelter in. With Samantha immobile, as much as he didn't want to admit it, she would be a liability to them rather than an asset. Previous warnings of the buildings not being safe be damned he was going to find some place to put Samantha so she can rest, and where they can defend against the undead horde. They don't even know how far away the undead are now that they're running to this abandoned village. Seeing one structure that has a stiff door still on its hinge, Naruto with Samantha being held in one arm, made his way to the building. Without stopping the whisker face blonde turned to look halfway over his shoulder and yelled, Dempsey, Takeo, Nikolai, I'm going to take shelter with Samantha in one of the buildings. What happened to us not using the buildings? The Marine questioned as he and the others followed the two teens to the building. Plans change when you're facing a crisis. Was Naruto's hasty retort as they made their way across the road. Pressing his foot up against the door, Naruto put all his weight into pushing against it to see if it would budge or not. Seeing it wouldn't budge Naruto scared, and knocked the door of its hinges sending splinters everywhere. I'd say that having one of us immobile, while an army full of fleshing-eating zombies with no knowledge of how close they are to us, is a crisis. He added as he and Samantha went inside the building with the others following in after them. You won't get any complaints from me kiddo. I wonder if this building is sturdy enough to withstand added weight? Nikolai bounced on his feet on the floor of the building. Look sturdy to this Soviet exclaimed Nikolai as he kept bouncing on the balls of his feet. I do not think jumping lightly on the floor proves anything, Takeo deadpanned at the Russian, who rudely flicked him the middle finger in response. He scoffed and began to look around the room of the building they were going to be using for the time being. Surprisingly the inside of the building was in a much better condition than its outside appearance. There was a little corrosion on the walls and floor, but overall, the building looked sturdy enough to withstand the added weight of a few people. He wasn't sure about the added weight of all the zombies that are sure to try and get themselves inside. Fortune smiles upon us, for this structure will suit our needs. Stated the samurai after making his examination of the building's interior. Hopefully there will be an outline for a weapon somewhere in this building. I do not fancy fighting zombies and being unable to change our gun when we run out of ammo for it. Naruto said as he helped Samantha move to a nearby couch and laid her gently down on it. Dempsey grunted in agreement as he made his way to another section of the building. In that case I'll scope out the building. See if there is anything useful to us here. I will border up the windows and other access points. Nikolai yelled out before going off to do just that. Takeo sighed as Nikolai began to try and move a bookcase that was beside the doorway to block the entryway. Forgetting there was a currently broken door lying flat on the ground. In front of the doorway itself. Currently impeding Nikolai's attempt at moving the bookcase. 
shaking his head Takeo sighed in irritation at Nikolai forgetfulness, and, began to mutter incoherently under his breath as he made his way over to Nikolai, before yanking him away from the bookcase and pulled him to the front of the doorway while ignoring his indignant yelling and whining. He forced the drunk to look down at the ground, where Nikolai stopped his whining and yelling as he finally took notice of the knock-down door that was in front of the piece of furniture. How did that get there? Nikolai asked as he pointed at the down door lying in front of the bookcase. Takeo merely growled out as he palmed his face before dragging his hand downward. It wasn't Nikolai's fault he became the way he now is. He needed to down alcohol regularly otherwise he would become unresponsive, which is why he is always drunk. Takeo. Want to help me move this door out of the way? The man asked as he went down on his knees to try and lift up the door. Takeo sighed before getting on the opposite end of the door. Very well. He replied before kneeling down and slipping his digits under the edges of the door. On three. One. Two. Three. While they were busy moving the door out of the way Naruto was sitting on the ground beside the slouching Samantha with their hands clasped together. The girl was resting on the couch to regain her lost energy bringing those perk machines and weapon outlines to the village therein. Naruto in the meantime was keeping an eye on things around them. He took amusement in watching Takeo and Nikolai's antics in trying to shove the door out of the way so they could move the bookcase in front of the empty doorway. The door should be used to help us. Takeo argued with a glare. No. Door should be outside where it would not be in way. Nikolai argued back with a snarl pulling at his lips. As you could tell, the two did not agree with one another. Samantha opened her eyes and showing her annoyance tried to glare in the direction of the noisiness. When she couldn't do that she settled for lightly glaring at Naruto. Seeing the light glare Samantha was giving him, he gave her a flat look, his expression conveying his answer without the need to say anything. You are the closest one. Samantha uttered in a soft voice. Her light glare never leaving her eyes even as Naruto's expression became even flatter at what she said to him. You can speak for yourself. He pointed out to her in a lowered voice. Samantha gave him an are you serious look before replying. Jai are more likely to listen to you instead of me. Which was true since Nikolai and Takeo are more closer to Naruto and would therefore take his consideration more highly than her own. Then just as Naruto was about to make his reply Tank Dempsey made his presence known. Takeo. Nikolai. Keep your voices down for fuck's sake. Bellowed the man from upstairs. His voice was tinged with barely veiled annoyance. You'll bring the zombies down on our asses at the rate your argument is going. And just like that Nikolai and Takeo stared at the ceiling in stiff silence. Naruto and Samantha merely looked at one another in surprise before shrugging and making themselves comfortable. If they're both quiet now then that is all that matters to them. Quietness equals more rest, and more rest equals less time for Samantha to regain her energy. XXXX. Jiraiya was panted heavily as he stopped sprinting to take a break. The Toad Sage had pushed himself really hard to get within spotting distance of Yugacure. Two hours he had pushed himself for. Two miles of non-stop chakra enhanced running. And right now he was paying for it as it left him exhausted. The forests and gigantic trees the Land of Fire was well known for was long gone. Now the landscape was replaced by rocky terrain, also reduced to a barren wasteland like all the other countries affected by the undead hordes. In the far distance was the now abandoned former hidden village of Yugacure. Beyond that was a tall concrete wall that blocked off the border to the land of frost and in turn the land of lightning. Jiraiya had to make an appreciative sound at the sight of it. The wall looked impressive from where he stood. It must have taken a shit ton of chakra to make that. That must have been what that other chakra spike was. Ninja making that gigantic wall to delay the advancement of the undead horde. Now that he was much closer to Yugacure the lone chakra signature he picked up was a lot clearer. He could sense something that wasn't there before now he was closer to it. 
It felt odd to him to say the least. The familiarity the chakra signature was giving off was there. He could almost recognize it now. But there was something with the chakra itself that was preventing him from doing so. If he were to describe it, it would seem as if there was something tainting it. Like it was dying. But at the same time the chakra was regenerating itself, it was as if the person was dying but not dying at the same time. It was confusing but that description is as close as he could get. If my, contacts were right, then the walking dead, would need to pass, through Yugakur in order to, get to, the land of frost. Jiraiya said through deep breaths. After regaining his breath the toad sage stood tall and stared ahead of him. Given that familiar chakra signature never left Yugakur, and that mysterious energy signature never appeared again, it is safe for me to assume that this mysterious group that made themselves famous in the land of waves are still there. The toad sage narrowed his eyes in interest when he felt five more chakra signatures, one of them being massive in comparison to the other four suddenly appear within his senses. They came from the land of frost and were heading toward Yugakure at a rapid pace. The current toad sage rubbed his non-existent beard. Hmm, I guess the one with the largest chakra out of the five approaching signatures is one of Kumo's Jinchuriki. And with how fast they're moving, I'd say all five of them would reach Yugakure about the same time as I will. Slightly rested after taking that short break Jiraiya stretched his arms above his head with a strained groan escaping his throat. He lowered his limbs and stretched his legs to get the kinks out of the joints before continuing his chakra-enhanced sprint towards Yugakure. Meanwhile the squad Akira had made finally reached Yujito who was now a fair distance away from the border between the land of frost and land of hot water. Yugakure was within eyesight. Knowing just how serious this side mission was, Akira had foregone Genin ranked ninja and got the more higher rank to join him. As harsh as it may be Akira did not need any liabilities. Yujito can be one scary bitch when she wants to be and not having well-trained and experienced ninja brought with him will most likely bring out her bitch aside. Which was why the three ninja he brought with him are of Jonin and Chunin rank. Yujito looked to her left from the corner of her eyes as she noticed Akira and the ninja he brought with him catching up to her. Chunin and Jonin ninjas. I approve of your choice Akira. She told him when he and the three ninja were now running side by side with her. You three tell me your names. She ordered barkingly at the currently nameless ninja. I am Taiki Anno, commander. I am also known as T. Dare by my comrades. Taiki or T. Dare for short, introduced himself to his superior in a respectful manner. My name is Juro, commander Yujito. Juro was next to introduce himself. He kept his tone respectful and his introduction short. There was a bit of arrogance in his tone, though it was well concealed. My name is Kanon, Lady Yujito. Kanon the only female of the trio had introduced herself. She also held Yujito in high regard. All three of them appear to be in their late twenties to early thirties, they all wore the standard Kumogakure uniform, consisting of a long, grey top which gathers just at their waist, giving the shirt a sash-like appearance which matching colored bottoms. Over this they wore their white, one-strapped colored flak jacket with the sleeves torn off at the elbow, bearing their forearms to the elements. Their forehead protectors, were either around their arms, in the case of Cannon and Juro, like an ARM band and in the case of Taiki wore it around their waist like a belt. Taiki, Juro, and Cannon, I hope that Akira has given you three a debrief on where we're going? Yujito asked as she redirected her attention ahead of her. He told us we were heading to the abandoned village of Yugakure where that mysterious energy originated from correct? Taiki asked in a questioning tone. Yujito nodded in confirmation. Yes. It is essential that we reach Yugakure before the invading undead do. If you heard the rumor associated with the unknown energy, the group who appeared and made themselves known to the five great hidden villages one week ago are said to have appeared when a mysterious energy was detected just outside of the land of waves. And since the energy we detected is the same from the land of waves we're going there to investigate. 
Cannon concluded before her eyes went wide with realization. The mysterious five could be there, Yujito and nodded her head in confirmation. Yes and if we were to bring them back to help with our dilemma our chances of successfully delaying the zombies from advancing into the land of lightning will increase. Juro scoffed in dismissal at that. What makes you so sure they'll be able to help us? Two weeks ago the land of waves was under siege nightly. Yujito began stiffly. One week ago the mysterious five came out of nowhere, appearing on the outskirts of wave country. And on that same day they somehow stopped the nightly attacks. She turned to Juro in order to give him a fierce look and said in a serious tone. Considering what they've done, along with their instruments that are a more advanced version of the Kanai launchers from the Land of Spring, they will be able to help us with our dilemma. Everyone stop. Cannon suddenly yelled out as she came to an abrupt halt in mid-run. Juro, Akira, Taiki and Yujito all came to an abrupt stop as well and turned to look at the Kunoichi with questioning looks in their eyes. Juro looked more irritated however. What the heck is it Cannon? We're wasting valuable time. Juro hissed with a scowl on his face. Shut the fuck up Juro and listen. She snapped back causing the man to bristle at her in outrage. Do any of you sense it at all? Yujito frowned and extended her senses. At first she found nothing but after a minute or two she discovered something unusual. It was a chakra signature in the direction of Yugakure. But instead of five like she was expecting it was one. And it felt tainted. Yujito had relayed what she had discovered to everyone else. Everyone apart from Kanon herself was surprised. That can't be right. Juro stated. There should be five. Not one. Do you think it's a trap? Or a new type of zombie? Taiki asked them as no one recognized the chakra and given the tainted feel it was giving off, it could be a person who was unlucky enough to have been bitten. Or more frighteningly a new type of zombie. Yujito narrowed her eyes in contemplation as she crossed her arms beneath her bust. The likelihood of this being a trap is high. Time is against us here. In the likelihood that this is a trap fall back immediately. No questions asked. Do all of you understand? I understand. Yeah. Got it. We fall back, no questions asked. Understood Commander Yujito. Good. Let's move out. This, this was insane. People were dying everywhere. The armed guards stationed throughout the facility were getting overwhelmed and devoured by the zombies that were somehow set loose. The screams. Oh the screams. There were so, so many of them. The siren that was sounding off in the background sounded like it was being drowned out by the screams. The second Naruto and the others heard the screams and the siren going off Dempsey. Nikolai and Takeo immediately banded together and pressed themselves up against the door to keep it shut when zombies began bashing themselves against it in an attempt to get in the room. Naruto on the other hand was looking under the mattress of his bed for a makeshift weapon he had smuggled in weeks ago. He pulled out four combat knives from beneath the mattress, he was lucky enough to have gotten these from how tight security was lately. These were stolen from soldiers who were unlucky enough to have been bitten by zombies who went berserk during the months they started experimenting on them. No one commented on where the knives went. They never paid attention to bodies for some strange reason. Smiling grimly at the knives Naruto stood up and turned halfway to look at the others who were trying and failing to keep the door closed. Eyes narrowing Naruto turned around completely and made his way to the others. Takeo, Nikolai, Dempsey. He called to them prompting them to turn around halfway while keeping their weight against the door. He held the combat knives out to them hilt first. Take this, they'll make killing those fuckers easier. Where'd you get those? Dempsey asked in complete astonishment as he and the others took the knives from Naruto. Stole them. They do tend to forget with dead people trying to bite your own head off. Naruto easily responded. It was pretty easy stealing when the person you took the knife from was already dead. Just so we're clear on this, 
does anyone know how to kill something that is already dead? Dempsey asked as he wanted to know if anyone excluding himself knows how to kill something that is already dead. I have seen Germans shoot hell spawn in head. Maybe we stab them there they will die for good, no? Nikolai answered before grunting in exertion when the door almost gave in on them. That is something I too have seen from these, disgrace for peeper. Takeo said his thick Japanese accent replacing the L's with his R's in his sentence. He bared his teeth in frustration as he felt his feet slip against the floor. When I get out of here I will send these her demons back from whence they came. And I'll help. Naruto exclaimed as he joined in, on trying to keep the door closed. And as for me knowing how to kill them? Yes. I know how to put them down. Shooting or stabbing them in the head seems to do the trick. The four of them tensed up and held their breath when they heard gunfire close by. The zombies on the other side of their door stopping banging against it and walked towards the sound. The group heard the zombies stumbling away while at the same time the gunfire got closer and closer before it cut off abruptly. The gunfire started up again followed by the deathly wails of the undead shortly after. Dempsey, Nikolai, Takeo, and Naruto shared a look with one another before they cautiously opened the door enough for one of them to peek outside. When they saw that the coast was clear the door opened completely. Takeo cautiously leaned his head out of the doorway and looked in both directions. You see anything? Dempsey whispered. The path is clear. Takeo replied stoically. This is our chance to ARM ourselves against these demons. With that said and done Takeo beckoned the others to follow him as he cautiously moved out of the room and into the corridor. Fucking hell. Naruto heard Nikolai and Dempsey say lowly in shock. The corridor looked something out of a horror. The walls were sprayed with FRESH blood either from zombies who were gunned down, or by the soldiers and scientists who weren't lucky enough to escape from them. Piled together on the floor are bodies of zombies, soldiers and scientists with chunks of flesh spread across the ground around and among them. There was a trail of blood that led outside to their left and and their right a trail of bloodied footprints led to a staircase. Naruto tore his eyes away from the disturbing scene and looked in both directions. They now have a choice, if they went outside there is a chance they would find a survivors to join up with. But the likelihood of them encountering zombies is increased and with them being armed with only combat knives they won't survive for long. If they went up the staircase there is a good chance they will run into more zombies and would be forced to fight them with only a knife to kill them with. However they all have been taken through the entire facility enough times they were able to discover rooms that contained weapons. However since they have been injected with doses of element 115 regularly remembering where these rooms are is going to be the difficult part. Seeing as they needed weapons they all made their way to the staircase. It would be on their weapon search that they would have their fated encounter with the future antagonist Dr. Edward Richtofen and team up with him in an attempt to save the world. XXXX In the land of hot water, the former hidden village Yugakura one hour later. As the newly arrival Jiraiya walked through one of the many empty streets of Yugakura, he could not help but feel dismayed at the piss-poor condition he found it in. Mold. Erosion decay and more. This is what he saw. The former hidden village was well known for its hot springs and its sights, not it was reduced to a shadow of its former self. As he came to the bridge leading to the land of frost he saw the Kumo team he had detected a while ago appear on the opposite end. He snorted in amusement, he was right about what he thought a little while back when he was still making his way here. The group that were heading to Yugikure did arrive around the same time as he did. He noted with a small amount of surprise that the largest chakra signature out of them all was one of Kumogakure's strongest jonin and second Jinchuriki, Yujitoni. What the, the Jiraiya of the Sanin? What are you doing here? Kanon asked in surprise. It wasn't every day you meet a legendary figure like the Toad Sage of Kanahagakure. He was rarely seen nowadays ever since the undead came out of nowhere three years ago. I came here because I was close by when I picked up an unknown energy signature that was found twice in the land of waves. 
he told them briefly while he surveyed his surroundings. And seeing that you're here I'm going to take a guess and say you detected the unknown energy from the border between the land of hot water and the land of frost? He asked them, we have. Yujito answered honestly while her comrades shared a nervous look with one another. The man's appearance alone made them nervous. Seeing as he had personally trained the fourth Hokage himself, and they knew the man in front of them was in a league of his own. I'm going to guess that you two have detected the odd chakra signature as well? Jiraiya nodded in confirmation. He wasn't surprised they found out about the tainted chakra. He was surprised they weren't expecting him however as they should have known he was nearby the second he came within their field of range. Yes. I was originally on my way to help you defend the border to the land of frost from an undead army that recently appeared not too far from here. But when that energy appeared I had to delay my journey to investigate it. The chakra signature appeared not long after. He informed them before he started looking around again for the location of the source of the chakra signature. Yujito, Taiki, Juro, Kanon and Akira shared a look an unspoken question being transmitted amongst them. A minute later they all nodded simultaneously, seemingly coming to an agreement with something before Yujito stepped forward. With the threat of the undead looming upon us we have a limited time to be here. I suggest that we join forces so the amount of time we waste searching is lessened. The Jinchuriki of the two-tailed cat offered. Jiraiya stared at the woman contemplatively as he thought about the pros and cons of her offer. On one hand teaming up with them would decrease the amount of time they waste searching the one-time hidden village. Not to mention they would likely have more success in searching for this chakra signature together than separated. On the other teaming up would give them a chance to backstab him when he would least expect it. Kanoha and Kumo, after three years of being allies, still have tensions between them. With the zombies running about killing everyone in their path. No one would think him going missing would be suspicious since people are being zombified by the hundreds every day. Right now the Toad Sage didn't have much of a choice in concerning what he wanted and what he didn't want. They were both here for the same thing and with the threat of an undead army bearing down on them didn't leave them much of a choice. With that in mind he made his decision. The Walking Dead are a threat to everyone and everything in this world. And being that we are here searching for the same thing, and knowing there is an army of zombies bearing down on us, teaming up would be the ideal decision. I will accept your suggestion to join forces. Yujito and the others looked relieved to hear that. Do you know what we're looking for? Taiki asked Jiraiya. Unfortunately not. The man replied. The chakra signature is close by but something is keeping me from knowing the exact location. We're having the same problem. We know the person that owns the chakra is here within close proximity to us. While the ninja were busy discussing on how to proceed they didn't know they were currently being watched. Dempsey was peeking out from the window on the top floor of the building he and the others had taken shelter in. From where he was right now he had a good overall view on them. ANS while they were talking loud, the distance and the wind made hearing what they were saying a little difficult. Not to mention they were too far to read lips. It was annoying for him. Because during the few hours he and the others were here, they were laying down some traps in advanced preparation for the zombies' eventual arrival. But because of these asshats coming out of nowhere they would risk setting them off. Not to mention from what little he heard from them, thank God for them speaking English, they were here looking for someone who had a chakra signature. While he may not know much about chakra in general Tank Dempsey knew that Naruto is the only person in the entire group that is able to use chakra. And if that was the case, these people would be able to find out where he is if he stays in one place for too long. Fighting them was an option, but with Naruto telling him the ninjas here are capable of defying logic that was out of the window. Not to mention Takeo and Nikolai are at the moment somewhere else in this place, setting down traps in strategic positions where they would deal the enemy the most losses. And this left him alone with Naruto and Samantha who were busy memorizing the building so they would know where the quickest exit is when shit hits the fan. 
If these people were looking for Naruto then there is a good chance they would be looking for himself, Takeo, Nikolai and Samantha purely by association. If they happen to be hostile and attack, well, he'll do his damned best to make sure that would be the last thing they do. Dempsey? What's going on out there? Said man quickly raised a hand to silence Naruto before he's alert the people outside to their position. Without turning around he gestured the teenage boy to come beside him. Narrowing his eyes in confusion Naruto did as Dempsey asked of him and went to his side. He quickly took cover underneath the windowsill when he saw people outside next to the bridge. Taking a deep breath to calm himself the whisker-faced teen leaned up so he could peek outside. Who are they? Naruto asked in a quiet whisper. How the heck am I meant to know? I never seen the six of them before in my life. Was Dempsey's rhetorical response. He turned his head to the right far enough so he could see Naruto from the corner of his eye, while keeping the people outside within his field of view. I think they're looking for you though. What? Why would they be looking for me? Naruto asked in a harsh whisper. I think it's because they somehow found out we're here. Dempsey replied in a dry tone as he returned his full gaze on the people outside. I heard them talk about detecting a chakra signature or some shit. And out of the entire group you're the only one who can use this chakra thing they happen to be talking about. So what's the plan? Naruto asked after a moment of silence. If these people could detect chakra then they can track him down no matter where he is. That can't happen. We need to find out what their intentions are. Since they happen to be looking for the energy thing you can use, you will have to be the one that approaches them. What? Why me? Naruto demanded in protest. Because you're the only person in this group who is able to use what they're tracking more on. Dempsey bluntly stated in a no-nonsense tone. When he saw Naruto about to protest again, he growled in annoyance with the boy's stubbornness and quickly added, you're smarter than this for crying out loud. What do you think is going to happen if Takeo, Samantha, or God forbid Nikolai or myself go out there? Naruto thought on this and not a second later he went pale in the face. If they can track Chakra then anyone except him going out there would be at risk. They might come to a hasty conclusion that Dempsey, Takeo, Nikolai and Samantha are new zombie types or something. It unlikely that will happen but, you know what they say, human stupidity knows no bounds. What's worse Nikolai and Takeo are still out there somewhere setting traps for the approaching zombies. Oh crap. He muttered after he looked out of the window. Oh crap, is right kiddo. Since you barely remember anything about this world we don't know if they need this chakra shit to live or not. No, not that kind of, oh crap. Tank. Naruto replied in a harsh whisper before he pointed outside in a frantic manner. I mean, oh crap, they're not out there anymore. He added conclusively, and. Dempsey blinked as the words slowly registered in his head before he snapped his head in the direction of the window hastily. Shit. They were just there a second ago. No, more like a minute ago. Naruto, don't be a smart ass. They knelt there behind the windowsill while keeping their breathing rate as low as possible so they are able to hear where they've gone to. Minutes went by and they heard nothing apart from their own steady breathing. It was like they weren't even there in the first place. So. Naruto began, breaking the tense silence, while shifting on his knee to move to a more comfortable position. Am I still going out there? He asked as he glanced at Dempsey uncertainly. He did not want to go out in the open where he is open for an attack. Dempsey nodded his head in confirmation. Yep, you're still going out. My gut tells me they're still out there somewhere. And if my hunch is right, then they'll be closer to us than we think. As much as he didn't want to go out there he knew he had little choice no matter what he said or did. If he choose to stay then Tank Dempsey would kick his ass in gear and shove him out in the open. He did that several times in sure no Numa when he was too tired to move. But when he collapsed the second they made it to one of the huts, that made them walk through a swamp they were forced to take it easy until he had gotten his strength back. 
Richtofen the psychopathic prick that he is, said he didn't like having liabilities, and threatened to leave him to the walking corpses as bait. Suffice to say everyone turned their guns on the mad doctor as if to dare him to push his luck. All right, tank. I'll get my assault rifle and go outside. He sighed out in reluctance before going off to do just that. Hopefully these so-called ninja won't attack me on sight. He murmured under his breath as he made his way to the M-16 assault rifle he had placed next to the doorway before making his way out of the room and down the stairs. He had to make this quick. While he couldn't hear anything the zombies were going to be here any moment now. And knowing Takeo and Nikolai, the explosions they obtained by two of the weapon outlines, the M-18 Claymore Mine and the S-Mine also known as Bouncing Bettys, spread across the village would be placed in spots where the zombies would be likely to funnel in the most. Which to be honest was practically anywhere and everywhere. Nevertheless both these mines would be used to alert them to the presence of the zombies and kill them at the same time. It was killing two birds with one stone. Entering the front room Naruto immediately noticed that the front door was barricaded by the bookcase. Nikolai and Takeo worked together on throwing the door that blocked them from doing so, literally out of the building. The windows were bordered up from the outside with planks. Suffice to say Samantha was able to provide them with some help, even in her exhausted state when it came to keeping zombies out of the building. She literally materialized planks out of thin air and set put them on windows of every building on the ground floor. Samantha thought the look on their faces was priceless. She had a good laugh at their expense. Sighing a little nervously to himself Naruto made his way to the back door. These chakra users are far more experienced than he is. He did not know they could trace it, and while they did not know the exact location he was at, which was a blessing, he couldn't use his chakra ability to trace them back as he had no idea on how to do that. He could train himself on how to do it, or get someone else to train him and to do that he would have to go to any of the five major hidden villages. But let's face it, there was no way in hell he was going to tie himself to any of them. With what little he remembers, they aren't that all advanced, and knowing how militaristic they are they would likely stop at nothing to reverse engineer or possibly replicate these weapons once they manage to get their greedy little hands on them. He won't put it past him if these morons tried to use his team as leverage. Which is why he will not trust any of them and would keep them at arm's length. Making his way out of the back door Naruto raised his assault rifle so he would be ready to fire at a moment's notice. Quickly scanning his surroundings including the rooftops, Naruto cautiously made his way to the front of the building as he kept an eye on everything around him. With chakra allowing them to do supernatural and inhuman feats these people could be anywhere. Including the rooftops. Dempsey with Samantha with him should be safe where he is. Samantha is far beyond these so-called ninja, she would be able to take care of any of them before they could blink if they try to pull a fast one on him. Then again his assault rifle fires small projectiles that goes faster than the eye can see, he would be able to cut them down if they do try to pull one on him. Though he hopes they aren't smart enough to put him in a choke hold from behind. He wouldn't be able to defend himself from that. After several minutes of walking and taking several turns, and having the feeling of being watched Naruto eventually came to the fence that Dempsey kicked down and walked out in the open with his rifle raised in front of him. Stopping near a few inches away from a railing that kept people from falling down the steep cliff, Naruto lowered his rifle a little so the barrel was facing the ground and straightened as he looked around for the ninja. They were close by. Watching him from some place he wouldn't be able to see them. He could feel it. After taking another scan of his surroundings, and coming up with nothing, Naruto tutayed when he still couldn't find anyone. Scowling visibly and feeling uncomfortable at the thought of being watched Naruto decided to go for the direct approach. I know you're here. The blonde loudly called out his voice echoing. I saw you. Come out, before I make you. For a moment Naruto thought he felt the wind suddenly pick up behind him. Jeez, kid, calm down would ya? A rough masculine said to the left of the teen. I'm right here. No need to get violent. 
Upon hearing this unknown man speak all of a sudden behind him Naruto quickly spun on his feet, bringing up his assault rifle to aim at the person that had somehow snuck up on him with his knowing. Naruto lowered his weapon slightly when he took in the man's appearance. He is a tall man with waist length, spiky white hair tied back into a ponytail, with two shoulder-length bangs framing both sides of his face. He also had red lines that ran down from his eyes and wore a horned forehead protector that had a kanji for oil engraved on it. He also has a noticeable wart on the left side of his nose. Jiraiya wore a green short shirt kimono and matching pants, under which he wore mesh armor that showed out of the sleeves and legs of his outfit. His outfit was completed with hand guards, a simple black belt, traditional Japanese geta, a red heori with two simple yellow circles on each side, and a scroll on his back. All in all, the man was weird and frickin' awesome looking at the same time. Seeing him for the first time Naruto was getting deja vu vibes just from looking at him. He felt like he knew the man somehow, but for the life of him he could not remember. Similar to the Wave Village. XXXX Jiraiya while he kept his cool on the surface was inwardly having something of a panic attack. When he saw the teen stepping out of the building and got a really good look at him thought he had almost went in catatonic shock. While he dressed and acted differently, the teen looked like an older and mature Naruto. He had the eyes the whisker marks and the same spiky hair. The Kyumo ninja were just as shocked as the toad sage. To them the teen looked like a miniature Minato Namikaze, the yellow flash and the late fourth Hokage of Kanahagakure. Both the Kyumo ninja and Jiraiya had almost managed to confirm where the chakra signature was emitting from. Jiraiya knew who the boy was, and thankfully the Kyumo ninja were still clueless on the boy's parentage. Unsurprisingly they found the chakra signature they were tracking to be moving exactly where the boy was moving. They saw him moving through the many alleyways of Yugakure, while keeping an eye on his surroundings for any activity before making his way to the open next to the bridge where they were previously in fact. They watched as the teen lowered the odd-looking launcher in his hands, and straightened himself as he took another scan of his surroundings. After a minute the teen scowled visibly before calling out in a loud demanding voice, I know you're here. I saw you. Come out, before I make you. Seeing the Naruto look alike call out to them in a demanding tone. Jiraiya made a quick second decision. He had to know if that teenager was actually his godson. To the shock of the Kyumo ninja the toad sage wordlessly body flickered down off the roof and on the ground a few yards to the boy's left. Geez, kid, calm down would ya? Yeah? I'm right here, no need to get violent. Jiraiya told the teen in a placating manner after he appeared on the ground next to the Naruto lookalike. Jiraiya quickly raised his arms in a non-threatening manner when the teen swiftly turned on the soles of his feet, while raising the advanced-looking kunai launcher at him. The boy lowered his weapon slightly as he gave him a full-body look over. While the boy did that Jiraiya did his own examination on the boy's appearance. On his upper boy the teenage boy wore a light green jacket, with the sleeves rolled up to show off his bare arms. Underneath the jacket he wore a short-sleeved low-cut black shirt. Clipped around his shoulder was a hand-arm holster containing an engraved M1911 that had a silver cameo on it. The hand-arm holster itself was located at the right side of his waist for easy access. For his lower body the teen wore olive-colored trousers, and a pair of black boots dirted with mud and the dried blood of zombies. Strapped around his waistline was a belt with two medium-sized pouches on it. Those are most likely containing projectiles like kunai or shuriken. Jiraiya incorrectly stated under his breath incoherently. Not knowing those pouches contained magazines for Naruto's M-16 assault rifle and M-1911. He was what Naruto would have looked like when he was older. He had the same colored eyes as his godson although they were dulled than he remembered. The three whisker marks are there on both his cheeks. But that was where the comparison ended. He was calm and in control of himself while the Naruto he knew was brash and exuberant. Jiraiya was taken out of his thoughts when the boy started with squinted eyes. You, you look familiar. The boy slowly said with squinted eyes much to his shock. 
I think I saw you somewhere before. But I can't quite remember. I think I saw you at a place that had a lot of steam. Jiraiya stared at the boy with wide eyes. While the boy admitted he doesn't quite remember, what he said almost confirmed his identity for him. Those last words at the end no one else, apart from his late teacher knew he had met and trained with Naruto for the first time at Kanoha's hot springs. But he had to know. What's your name? He asked while he slowly made his way over to the teenager. He immediately stopped moving and raised his hands when the teenager raised his weapon at him. Don't. Move. Naruto firmly told the man with a fierce stare. Okay. Okay, no need to get violent kid. Jiraiya said calmly before he slowly lowered his arms. I just wanted to know your name is all. He added after his arms were at his sides, why do you want to know my name? Naruto demanded hotly. Because you said I looked familiar to you, and you have claimed to have seen me before. He told the teen. And for me you look exactly what someone I knew three years ago would appear if he wasn't missing now. Not to mention your chakra signature is very familiar. Naruto stared hard at the man, the deja vu vibes from before acting up again. Then he winced as he felt a sharp pain in the back of his head. And just like that he remembered who this man is. Jiraiya a perverted man who happens to be a living breathing legend in the elemental nations, whose origins come from Kanahagakur. He had found the man peeking at women from behind a fence in a hot spring he was brought to by someone in black clothing and glasses, before proceeding to knock the said man out. He suddenly started chuckling to himself shaking his head and lowering his assault rifle completely. While he doesn't like people from Kanahagakur in general he knew he could trust this man. Doesn't mean he'll let him get close enough to touch him though. I remember who you are now. The blonde began, immediately capturing Jiraiya's interest. I met you for the first time at a hot spring, when you were peeking at women from behind a fence that blocked off the women's side. You easily knocked out a creepy-looking guy who wore clothes that was all black. And that was all he remembered. He saw Jiraiya knocking out the man, and after training him to walk on water for a bit he found there was something wrong and told him to lift up his shirt. He then touched him on the stomach that had some kind of swirling tattoo on it with blue glowing fingers. Then he told him to walk on water. After that he can remember nothing else. It was blank. Only a few people know of that. One of them, my own teacher, is dead. Jiraiya said lowly, staring at the teen with unblinking eyes as if taking his gaze off him just for a second would make him disappear. The other one was the man I had knocked out. Another one was one of your old teachers. And lastly there was you, Naruto Uzumaki. Nice to know someone from my past is around. Naruto said, giving Jiraiya a small yet confident smile. Maybe now I can get some answers. Answers? Kid you're talking as if you barely remember me. Jiraiya laughed thinking Naruto was doing one of his pranks he was famous for. However that humor slowly changed to shocked disbelief when Naruto did not deny his statement. Naruto, please tell me this is one of your pranks. Because if it is then it's not funny. He asked pleadingly. Naruto stared at Jiraiya incredulously. Prank? Dude, why the fuck would I prank about something as serious as this? Because of this fucking amnesia I have had for the past three years I can barely remember anything about my past. He said before raising a hand. My birthday, I don't remember. He lifted a finger to tick it off. My age, I don't remember. His middle finger was next. Where I was born I can barely remember. His ring finger was the next digit to go up. I just barely remembered you a few seconds ago. Every word Jiraiya listened to was like a punch to the gut. While he did not want to believe that his own godson and student does not remember him it did make sense. When they were still a team Tsunade once said a person with a severe case of amnesia can undergo a change of personality and preferences. Taking in his earlier analysis, the Naruto he knew was brash and exuberant. 
If he took what Tsunade said about amnesia and the side effects it can possibly have then the Naruto in front of him has a severe case of it. He was calm and had a mature air around him. He also seemed fairly intelligent in comparison to his previous self. Naruto, what do you think of the color orange? Jiraiya asked suddenly, wanting to know if this Naruto still thinks orange is a cool color. Naruto looked at the man questioningly but decided to humor him. Orange is a nice color to look at when the sun is going down. It's a fucking terrible color when the tone of it on your clothes is very high though. Seeing the questioning look Jiraiya was giving him Naruto sighed and elaborated. If you want to wear orange, make sure it is not so bright that the fucking dead can see it from miles away. Jiraiya nodded his head as he inwardly sighed in relief. Profanity aside, his preference for the color orange is still there only not as much as it used to be. He now hates the blaring brightness of the color. So are you going to stand here and have a conversation that I cannot be bothered with? Or are you going to get the other five to come out? Other five? What are you talking about? The toad sage asked as he acted clueless about the Kumo ninja being called out. Do you take me for an idiot? Naruto said in a flat tone, I saw the other people out here with you before you all suddenly vanished. He added while yelling out at certain parts to allow the Kumo ninja know that their cover was blown. Just because he can't see them right now doesn't mean he can't let them know, that he knows that they are currently watching them from their hiding spot. Sighing Jiraiya pinched the bridge of his nose before he turned to the buildings and did the universal signal to come out. The Kumogakure ninja came out of hiding several minutes later by body flickering Kumogakure style, which is basically lightning striking the ground they appeared at, with the Kunoichi Yujito and Kanon appearing first in that order and the Shinobi Juro, Akira and Taiki appearing last in the order they have been listed. Juro sked when he stared down at the whisker face blonde. This is one member of the so-called, Mysterious Five? The ninja scoffed in arrogant, yet dismissive manner after he gave Naruto a full body scan. Looking at Naruto as if he were beneath him, this boy doesn't look like much. I don't see how he became famous in a small amount of time. Naruto looked at Jiro with narrowed eyes. What's the matter little boy? Didn't like me saying that? What are you going to do about it? The man arrogantly demanded with a sneer pulling at his lips. Yujito turned a glare at Juro. Juro. That's enough out of dash, her reprimanding was abruptly cut when a resounding bang, took everyone by surprise and made them jump figuratively jump out of their skin. Juro fell to the ground like a sack of potatoes, a large portion of his head missing. Everyone was staring at the corpse with shocked eyes before they all redirected their gaze to the culprit. Naruto was staring at the corpse with a detached look with steam coming out of the barrel of his assault rifle. Naruto. Jiraiya shouted turning to his godson with a furious glare. What the hell did you do? Naruto looked at the shocked Jiraiya with the same detached expression. He was taunting me. So I killed him. He answered in a straightforward manner. Killing someone for something as petty as that is a terrible thing to do. He knows that, but there was no way in hell he was going to allow any of these ninja rejects to taunt or annoy him and get away with it without repercussions. You didn't have to do that though damn it. Jiraiya shot back heatedly with his glare becoming more menacing. The Naruto I know would never murder someone in cold blood. Naruto then glared up at his former teacher. News flashed Jiraiya, I am not the Naruto you knew and the chances of him coming back are very, very slim. He said with his teeth bared in a nasty scowl. The blue-eyed blonde then glared at the remaining four Kyomo ninja and pointed his rifle at them in a threatening manner. I'll make this clear for you all, if any of you try something, my team along with myself will put you down faster than you can fucking blink. Cannon, while surprised at the murder of one of her comrades did not feel angry with his death. From her own personal opinion Juro had it coming. There are others here with you? The Kunoichi questioned as she keenly scanned the buildings with squinted eyes. You have to be lying, I can't sense any other chakra signatures. Of course you can't. 
Naruto grunted out dismissively. Unlike you ninja rejects, who are so dependent on your chakra it's not even funny, the guys I'm with don't have it. And if they don't have it. He trailed off allowing them to fill in the blank. Then we will not be able to detect them. Jiraiya concluded with restrained anger while ignoring the jab Naruto took at their profession. He was angry, no, borderline furious that his godson had murdered someone in cold blood. All because of something as petty as being taunted. The remaining Kyumo ninja on the other hand were at first surprised to see Juro die in front of them but easily shrugged the surprise off. Remembering that when Juro was in front of his superiors he would be polite and well-mannered. He was an arrogant son of a bitch to those below him in rank. Yujito herself when she became a fully-fledged jonin saw how Juro would abuse his jonin rank in front of those who are of jenin or chunin status. Even the jenin and chunin at the border between the land of hot water and the land of frost were complaining about his disrespect and abuse of rank. He had made a lot of enemies in his ninja career, and, suffice to say he would not be missed by the majority of Kumogakure's shinobi forces. Did you have to kill him though? Akira asked as he stared at Juro's corpse that now had a pool of blood around the body. Naruto turned his narrowed gaze to Akira and replied. I didn't have to kill him. But I wanted to kill him. So I did. He narrowed his blue eyes at the Kyumo ninja and Kunoichis in confusion as they didn't seem to be all that upset at him killing one of their own in cold blood. You four don't seem to be angry that I straight up killed one of your own people. That's because the four of us are not upset. Yujito replied as she took her eyes off the corpse. Juro was an arrogant bastard and almost everyone back in Kumo that worked with him disliked the prick. He made a lot of enemies during his career, and so, a lot of people won't bat an eyelash at his passing. In fact I'd say you have done us a favor of killing him off yourself. Just like that? Naruto and Jiraiya asked at the same time with great disbelief in their voices. Just like that. Yujito, Akira, Kanon and Taiki all replied concurrently. Naruto unsure of what to make of this looked at the Kumogakure ninja warily but nodded in acceptance. Right. Well. Naruto began, nervously clearing his throat before bringing their attention to the situation they're going to be facing at any moment. Now that is out of the way. I take it you five already know about the zombies who are on their way here as we speak? We know of them. Since they're type 1 zombies we still have enough time to try and get you and your team out of here and back to the land of frost before they arrive. Taiki answered. Now that, right there, may be a problem. XXXX. Upon hearing a voice none of them recognized the shinobi and kunoichi quickly turned to meet and engage the person. They quickly halted their engagement when they finally got a look at the man. A middle-aged man was walking to them with the same weapon as Naruto's. His blue eyes had the look of a war veteran and has military cut blonde hair. His attire consisted of an open-buttoned light green military grade jacket with the sleeves rolled up. Underneath he wore a black shirt with dog tags hanging loosely from his neck. A cartridge belt was over the jacket with a sheathed combat knife held securely underneath. His combat trousers which were the same color as his jacket. His leather leggings and brown boots were covered in dry mud and blood. He had three pouches around his waistline for his guns. Walking beside him was a teenage girl with wild and unruly dark hair who is about the same age as Naruto. Her attire consisted of a pair of dark brown trousers, a short sleeve jacket and a light purple blouse underneath. She wore a pair of shin-length boots and had a combat knife, currently sheathed, strapped to her left arm for easy access. Slung over her shoulder was her MP-40 and like Naruto the girl had a belt with two medium-sized pouches strapped around her waistline. Jiraiya and the team from Kumo noticed and neither of the two possessed any chakra just like Naruto said they wouldn't. They also fit the description they had received of them from Kanoha. Three members of the Mysterious Five were in front of them right now and two more were still unaccounted for. While their appearances may be deceiving they knew better than to pick a fight with people they have no knowledge of. I mean look at where it got Juro. 
lying on the ground with a large section of his head taken off. Samantha tooted with her head shaking in disappointment upon seeing Juro's corpse. Really Naruto? Are you murdering people now? She questioned, while ignoring the stares she was getting from Jiraiya, Yujito, Kanon, Akira and Taiki for her thick German accent. Naruto looked affronted Samantha's question. Hey! It wasn't my fault, that one guy looked like a zombie. He exclaimed in protest as he recounted shooting some poor homeless-looking man in the head. He was splattered in guts and blood and from where he stood the man looked like a zombie. It was an easy mistake, honest. Besides, that guy down there was pissing me off, so I stopped him from being a pain in my ass. He jerking a thumb at Juro's corpse with a look of indifference. Besides, what I did, would have been tamed to what Tank would have done in my place. He added as an afterthought. Jiraiya was almost hesitant to ask, what would he have done? He did ask anyway and saw the Kyumonin were almost interested in knowing who this Tank person would have done in his godson's place. The five all looked at Dempsey who was chuckling lowly in a sinister manner. I would have torn his guts out and then force fed them to him. Tank said with a sneer. I would have made him watch himself eat his intestines too, if he lived long enough that is. The Kumo Ninja and Toad Sage were staring at Dempsey with horrified looks. The image he provided was rather graphic and made them question the man's sanity. Jiraiya on the other hand was staring between Naruto and Dempsey, with worried and suspicious eyes. Worry for Naruto and suspicion for Dempsey. That look Dempsey had along with his sentence was enough to make him worry for his godson's sanity. Having amnesia with little recollection of his past, he would be easy to influence and from what he saw of the foreigner some of his influence had already gotten to Naruto. I'll give you a 9 out of 10 for the drama. And a 5 out of 10 for the execution. Naruto suddenly said, breaking the tense air that was around them all. The Kumo Ninja plus Jiraiya stared at the two as if they were insane, as they saw he and Samantha were actually holding up scorecards with numbers 9 and 5 on them respectively. Where they had gotten them was anyone guess. And just like a switch had been flipped, the sinister aura was gone. Dempsey stared at Naruto in disbelief. What? Why the hell was I given a 5? I had them by the balls for fuck's sake. He exclaimed even as everyone was staring at the three in mounting disbelief. Naruto raised his hands in a placating manner, his scorecard now gone. Hey don't blame it on me tank. It was Samantha who gave you the five for the execution. You traitor. Samantha cried out as she looked at her friend with a look of exaggerated betrayal. She looked back at Dempsey and saw him staring at her, arms crossed, with an expectant look. Oh. Very well. She uttered out reluctantly, before like magic she quickly changing the card so it showed an 8 instead of 5. I will instead give you an 8 for je execution. That's better. Dempsey said, nodding his head with satisfaction in getting his own way. Throughout this the ninja were staring at them in disbelief that increased with every passing second. Their thoughts were unknowingly similar to one another wondering if the other's members of the mysterious five were like Dempsey, Samantha and Naruto. They had no idea how right on the mark they were. Considering one of them they have yet to meet is a violent alcoholic, whose antics are almost hilarious to witness once he is hammered enough, the other is a former samurai who slaughtered his entire family because they were insolent to him. So, Tank would not have done that then? Cannon slowly asked as she stared at the former marine raider with wariness. What? Tear his guts out and force feed them to the guy that's dead? When he received nods from Yujito, Akira, Cannon, Taiki and Jiraiya, Dempsey scoffed and said in a dry tone of admittance. I would have ripped his guts out, yeah. But I wouldn't have force fed them to him. I'm not that sick in the head. You sure about that? Naruto asked, bringing everyone's gaze back to him. What about that time you mentioned you gnawing your way through your captors? Once you escaped from a bamboo cage after gnawing your way through that. Don't remind me. 
Dempsey replied with a light scowl. That was a major pain in my ass. My jaw was throbbing in irritation for weeks. He said rubbing a hand against his jawline. Not to mention there was not much I could use to fight off my captors with. So I to improvise on what I had at my disposal. Improvise? Dempsey gave the Kumo ninja that spoke a grim look. Let's just say that anything and everything around you can be used as a weapon, if you're imaginative enough on where to find it and how to use it and leave it at that. He answered in a tone that brokered no argument. This is true in the case of him being armed with only a bobby pin and his medal of honor, which he used against his heavily armed captors from the Imperial Army. Long story short, don't piss him off. You'll live longer that way. Naruto told them warningly prompting them to nod their head in understanding while they stared at Dempsey with disturbed looks on their face, having seen a lot of disturbing things in the past three years from an enemy that was already dead you would have thought they would be immune to such things by now. However there were things in the world that they have not seen as of yet. Meeting a small group of people who don't have a shred of chakra in them was a disturbing thought. They would be invisible to just about everyone in sight. They're just like zombies in the sense they cannot be harmed or affected by chakra-based attacks. Dempsey seeing their expression smirked darkly at them, as if he knew what they were thinking. And seeing they had somehow trailed off from their original conversation Dempsey got everyone back on track. We need to get back to the original point here before we got carried away. Dempsey said. If you had planned to get us out of here with you, then I'm sorry to tell you that your mission is going to be difficult. Why would it be difficult? Are we not just dealing with an army of walkers? Akira asked with a questioning look on his face. Naruto, Dempsey and Samantha shared a look before bringing their gaze back to the ninja. V had better bring you five up to speed. Samantha told them all with a serious expression. V are not dealing with walkers. V.E. are now dealing with runners or sprinters that came almost an hour ago. We also spent the past hour or so fortifying and booby-trapping the surrounding areas for the eventual confrontation with them. Seeing as they swarm from every direction they can get through we are setting traps any place we can. Naruto added. That explains why there are only three of you instead of five. I'm guessing the other two are setting up the traps? Jiraiya asked oddly calm in spite of the fact he was told there was an army of possible type 2 or 3 zombies coming. They are. And with a lot of traps already set up we'll know when they've arrived. Naruto replied with confidence. How do you figure that? Kanan asked. As if answering her question several explosions went off in the background signaling the arrival of the zombies. Several more explosions were heard and was followed by submachine gun fire from Takeo and Nikolai's respective weapons. Without as much as a word Dempsey, Samantha and Naruto quickly shared a look, nodded, and as one they spun on the heels of their feet and rushed in the direction of the explosions. Their weapons were raised and ready to fire the second the zombies put themselves in their line of sight. Jiraiya, Yujito, Kanan, Akira and Taiki meanwhile were taken by surprise at the explosions that suddenly came out of nowhere and thought they were under attack. However they all remembered being explained just a moment ago there were traps planted just for the zombies and they would know when they would arrive once they were set off. Without a word the five of them sent Chakra to their legs and leapt to the rooftops, and quickly followed Naruto, Dempsey and Samantha as they ran through the streets as more and more of their traps went off in an explosive fashion. Seeing as only Naruto has chakra they would have to keep Dempsey and Samantha within their line of sight otherwise they would lose them, which was a lot easier considering they were on the rooftops and the three they were keeping an eye on was on the ground. Not to mention they had chakra, so they would be able to keep pace with the three zombie slayers. As they kept their pace the gunfire was getting louder and louder. The explosions were also getting closer. They could faintly hear the moans and groans of the zombies too in between the gunfire and the explosions. Several minutes later the ninja finally came across the last remaining members of the mysterious five, who are wearing clothing just as outlandish as the other three. The two of them were working together in fighting off the zombies and are slowly being pushed back into a corner. 
In front of them was a large pile of corpses that had most of their torsos torn off, revealing their rib cages and intestines, their limbs ripped off by bullets. Their heads were blown off their shoulders too showing how deadly rapid fire from their automatic weaponry are. However despite how many zombies the two of them killed they were close to having their position being overrun. Naruto, Samantha and Dempsey once they found their comrades being close getting overwhelmed quickly stopped moving, took aim and unloaded on the walking corpses. This effectively brought most of the horde's attention away from Nikolai and Takeo and on to them. The zombies which were revealed to be a combination of type 2s and 3s, were able to close the distance to their new found targets at a shocking pace before they were cut them themselves from the Naruto's, Samantha's and Dempsey's combined firepower. Narrowing his eyes as the zombies made their way to his godson, Jiraiya quickly went through hand seals for one of his offensive techniques, and using his chakra he changed his saliva into oil before he leapt off the rooftop and on top of another building on the other side as he spat the oil out of his mouth. Fire Style, Flame Bullet He bellowed out as he used his chakra to ignite the oil before landing on the other building safely. Naruto, Dempsey and Samantha were taken by complete surprise as they saw a massive torrent of flames come out of nowhere from the sky and completely engulf the zombies approaching them within seconds. However knowing from personal experience they weren't dead, and would still move even if they were on fire, the five continued unloading their magazine in the flames, even as they listened to the zombies' screams. Fire style, flame bullet acted similar to the flamethrower. Once you're caught in the oil, the flames would continue to burn you until you manage to put the fire out. Considering how difficult it is to put out an oil-enhanced flame, it only takes a matter of seconds for someone who was unlucky enough to get caught in it to die from having their skin literally melt off of their bones. Given how zombies ignore their injuries as if they weren't even there, flamethrowers were not as effective on them as they are to living things. Not to mention it takes a bit of time for the zombies to drop dead. It is the same case here. However while the oil-enhanced fire didn't kill them, the flames had done enough damage to the zombies that they were easily taken down by the advanced weaponry of Takeo and Dempsey, Naruto and Samantha and Nikolai than they normally would have. Jiraiya seeing as he took out the horde that were heading towards his godson turned his attention to the rest that were intent on overwhelming Takeo and Nikolai. Quickly going through the same hand seals for fire style, flame bullet. He spat the oil out of his mouth and on the undead that were funneling their way through the alleyway they were coming from and ignited the oil while loudly calling out the name of his technique once more. Fire Style, Flame Bullet The flames like the last time had completely consumed the zombies within seconds. And since they were all coming in from one direction it served as an ideal barrier to burn any other undead that attempted to get out of the alleyway. They were easily cut down by Takeo and Nikolai who had just finished reloading their submachine guns and provided more fuel for the fire to burn. Dempsey, Naruto, and Samantha coughed and covered their noises as their nostrils were overtaken by the smell of rotting, burning flesh. Holy shit! This came from Tank Dempsey as he, Naruto and Samantha stared wide-eyed at Jiraiya using his ninja skills to utterly decimate the zombies within seconds. Blinking his eyes repeatedly Tank brought his gaze to Naruto. Okay I know you said these people are able to defy logic, but how are they are losing ground to these freak bags if they're able to do that? From start to finish Dempsey's tone changed from shocked to incredulous, with his facial expression matching the second tone as he wildly gestured to the carnage in front of them. Naruto looked between Dempsey and the burning corpses. I have no clue. Three years is a long time tank, you have to remember these zombies, are likely not affected by most chakra-based techniques the ninja here are capable of. Not to mention they changed minutes after Samantha detected them, it's like they changed when they were discovered. Seeing the contemplative look on the teen's face Dempsey frowned as he turned to glare at the burning corpses. These flesh addicts are like the ones back home. He growled. And for them that was a very bad thing. Yeah. Seems so. And we all know how that turned out. Naruto said softly remembering how they, by the persuasion of Ludwig Maxis, 
blew up the earth in an attempt to deduce the amount of zombies Richtofen would be able to control, only to make things worse by almost destroying the planet itself and breaking it into several large pieces. Then let's hope it will not come to Zat. Samantha told them before staring at the burning zombies in front of her with a thoughtful look. She was wondering just what caused them to start running all of a sudden. Having zombies running at you before you did anything? That wouldn't happen unless there was something out there to buff them. If that is the case then they are dealing with a type 6 zombies. She should know. She made George A. Romero into a type 6 zombie in Siberia to fight against those actors who had inadvertently helped Richtofen in dooming the world. One of Romero's few special abilities was being able to turn runners to sprinters by just yelling. He could also buff up their attacks by giving them electricity to give them an extra kick when they attack. If they are dealing with one of those, then killing it is going to be very difficult. And the weapons they have at the moment will not do a thing to them. They will need some powerful weapons to take them on. Something on your mind? Dempsey asked, seeing the thoughtful expression on the girl's face. Samantha nodded her head in confirmation. I think VE are dealing with more than Valkers and Sprinters. She said looked up at Dempsey with narrowed eyes. Seeing the prompting look he was giving her Samantha continued. VE may be dealing with a Type 6 as well. A Type 6? Like those fucking astronaut zombies you were sicking at us on the moon? Dempsey asked as he observed the flaming in front of himself, Samantha and Naruto finally dying out. He gestured Naruto and Samantha to follow him as he walked through the dying flames while talking. Those meat sacks are tough to kill. If one of those wankers are here, we'll need better gear to take them on. You need to take what on? Jiraiya asked as he landed in front of them in a crouch to absorb the impact of the leap he took from the rooftop. Behind the three Yujito and her comrades landed on the ground from their leap off the rooftops. We believe there is another zombie type here, instead of runners and sprinters. Dempsey replied with a roll of his shoulders. What makes you think that? Taiki asked with curiosity. Walkers without outside interference do not suddenly run. Takeo expertly said as he approached the assembled group, while joining in the conversation at the same time. Nikolai was following him, while keeping a close eye on the flame barrier with his PPSH-41 in case the zombies try to make another attempt at getting in. Therefore the actions of a powerful enemy is at work. The samurai concluded as he and Nikolai stopped in front of the group. Nice to see you kept yourself alive Takeo. Naruto said with a smile that was filled with relief. It will take more than an army of dishonorable demon spawn, to defeat a warrior such as I. Takeo replied back with a smile of his own. Nikolai scoffed lightly at Takeo's boasting as he checked the drum magazine for his PPSH-41, but never said anything. Takeo scowled lightly as he briefly glanced at the Soviet before redirecting his attention to the ninja in front of him. Are these people who came from the large wall? He asked Naruto and Dempsey and Samantha in a questioning manner referring to the large concrete wall that appeared at the border between the land of frost and the land of hot water. These five did. Replied Tank as he gestured to Yujito, Akira, Kanon and Taiki respectively. This guy on the other hand did not. He added jerking a thumb to Jiraiya. Apparently he and Naruto knew one another from before. What is his relationship with Uzumaki? Takeo suddenly asked in a demanding manner. All the while he was glaring dangerously at Jiraiya who was alarmed at Takeo's sudden aggressiveness. Even Nikolai had stopped what he was doing to glare at the 54-year-old man. The four of them know a little of Naruto's past treatment in his home. It wasn't surprising for Naruto to see the two of them get a little aggressive and protective of him. Well... Dempsey and Samantha trailed off at the same time as they turned to look at Naruto. What? Why are you looking at me for? Naruto asked in bewilderment upon seeing Tank and Samantha staring at him expectantly. He blinked in confusion and his expression became flat when Samantha pointed at him and then at Jiraiya. Oh for gods, I can barely remember him. 
but with what memories I have regained, that man dash. Jiraiya. The man corrected. I mean Jiraiya is someone who once taught me before everything went to hell. He isn't like the majority of those people in the village hidden in the leaves that ignored me and acted as if I didn't exist. Naruto stated to them with honesty in his voice while correcting himself by adding Jiraiya's name. In case you need help Nikolai I'll dumb things down for you. The oddly dressed looking guy used to teach Naruto, and isn't like the rest of the people in his birthplace. Dempsey added for Nikolai's benefit. He knew the drunk would need someone to dumb things down otherwise he would likely not understand. Nikolai squinted his eyes at Dempsey for a moment before redirecting his gaze to Jiraiya. After several minutes of nerve-wrecking silence the alcoholic nodded his head in acceptance. Okay. That is good. I won't have to kill him like I did to second wife. Nikolai said with bluntness. Second wife. What happened to the first? Yujito asked as she stared at Nikolai with a wary expression. Killed that bitch by blowing her head off. Bang! Her fucking head exploded and went everywhere. Nikolai exclaimed as he did a fairly poor mimic of someone having their head blown off their shoulders before laughing uproariously at the memory. Dempsey and Samantha, Takeo, and Naruto did not bat an eyelash at Nikolai's admittance. Funnily enough Nikolai was married nine times, and he murdered at least five of them. Rather brutally I might add. Dempsey said with a pointed smile. Those were good times. Nikolai said, reminiscing to himself about the times he had murdered his wives for any viable reason. From being a bitch to him to being annoying. There was an awkward silence as the ninja stared at Nikolai warily. Yujito and Kanon were very disturbed when they learnt Nikolai actually enjoyed killing five of his wives in a brutal manner. While they knew these people had no chakra to use, they couldn't underestimate them either as they saw the five of them killing zombies with their advanced kunai launchers with efficiency. Not to mention Juro had most of his head missing when Naruto shot him. Being beside Naruto when he fired his M-16, Jiraiya didn't see any projectiles coming out of the gun's barrel, nor did he see the projectile connecting with the man's head. Underestimating these people because of their lack of chakra would be the worst thing they could do right now. They make up their lack of chakra for the effectiveness of their guns. Seeing as the awkward silence was making the ninja nervous Dempsey quickly asked Takeo and Nikolai. So, did you two find anything of use out here? Found a perk machine. The one that gives us increased strength or something? Nikolai answered before trailing off at the end in confused thought. Increased strength? Don't you mean Juggernog? Naruto asked. Duh. Juggernog soda. That was the one. Nikolai said. Found it in building over there. He added as he pointed to the building in question. The structure is a two-floor house. The windows on the ground floor are boarded up just like every other building in Yugacure. And like all the other buildings in this place the outside of the structure is covered in fungus and was being corroded by the exposure to time. Beside the fire was the wall of flames that was still burning thanks to the brainless undead that are stupid enough to try and run through the flames, while stepping over the burning bodies of the formerly walking corpses that were cut down by Takeo's and Nikolai's combined firepower. Dempsey as he followed the direction Nikolai was pointing wondered why hadn't the fire spread to the other buildings yet. Then he remembered it was a part of what he had dubbed plot convenience. What this meant is you can't expect things you think would happen to actually happen because of the story plot. Why? Because fuck logic. There is also a weapon outline within as well. Takeo added when Nikolai wasn't going to include the other discovery. A gun outline? That is a relief. There was no way he was going to pass up on getting a new weapon. If the pattern was the same then this outline should either be an M-14 battle rifle or an Olympus shotgun. If that's the case I'll check it out. Dempsey loudly declared before running off toward the building without a care in the world. The crew knew better though. Dempsey is always keeping an eye on his surroundings. 
always listening for the slightest disturbance even when it looks like he isn't. What is a, weapon outline? Taiki questioned as he watched Dempsey quickly running up to the building and entering it. He unknowingly voiced the thoughts of everyone that was not part of the dubbed, Mysterious Five. Also, what is a perk machine? He added as an afterthought. A, weapon outline, is a chalk outline on a wall. We use them to either change our weapons for something more powerful, or we can use them to resupply ourselves when we're running low on ammunition. Takeo seeing Naruto wasn't going to continue speaking picked up where the teenager left off. A perk machine, is a mechanical device that grant us abilities that increase our chance of survival against these unholy demon spawn. That had instantly gotten their attention. When you say abilities, what do you mean by that exactly? It depends. Naruto began after giving Takeo a pointed look. There are a lot of them. The one Nikolai mentioned kind of acts like a flak jacket. Juggernog soda once you drink it boosts our endurance to let us stay on our feet longer. Can you tell us of any others? Jiraiya asked, as he began to think of a way to find these, perk machines and get them to Kanoha. From what he was told of this Juggernog and what it is capable of, it is too much of an asset to ignore and if these other perks provided similar effects then it is crucial that he gets them to Kanoha to replicate and reproduce. Naruto turned and stared at Jiraiya with an unreadable look on his face. I could. But I won't. He told the man in a firm tone that brokered no argument. What? Why? Jiraiya demanded in exclamation. They can be a major asset to the hidden villages and give us a better fighting chance in combating the walking dead. The Kumo ninja excluding Yujito were nodding their heads in agreement. The reason Yujito wasn't was because she felt there was something more to these perk machines than Naruto was letting on. She had proved herself right right when Naruto answered, because if I tell you, then you will want them to be placed in the hidden villages where everyone can gain access to them. Sadly for you there is a chemical inside the drinks that can kill you if the person is not immune to it. He was referring to element 115. The perk machines were developed with element 115 as the core ingredient. Originally the perk machines were meant to be manufactured by group 935 and distributed to the front lines, in the late year of 1943 to aid the German war machine. After several experiments it was discovered that 4 out of 10 people that drunk from the soda bottles became sick and would eventually die almost 2 weeks later. Those who survived were able to do things they were unable to do before. Such as being able to drop to the ground from a lethal height and walk it off as if nothing had happened. Being able to dive to the ground from a tall place and letting out a lethal explosion around you once you touched the ground, to being able to heal people twice as fast than you normally are. Fortunately or unfortunately depending on which side of the war you were on, the distribution of these perk bottles was cancelled because the losses were unacceptable to Adolf Hitler the Führer of Nazi Germany. Since then the perk machines were only found in places Group 935 were once located. The others were taken aback by the revelation. There was something in the drinks that could potentially kill them? Please tell me that isn't true, Naruto. I'm begging you to tell me that it isn't true. Jiraiya said pleadingly to his godson. It is true. Naruto replied with a sigh much to the dismay of Jiraiya. But I along with Takeo and Dempsey, Samantha and Nikolai have been drinking the stuff for three years and were still alive and kicking. That was a partial lie of course, Samantha got with them recently but she too was immune to element 115. Not to mention it worked best with people who are immune to the negative effects of element 115. Before Dempsey was captured and experimented on by group 935 it was proven that he was immune to the soda's negative effects. Proven when he and his recon team had used the perks in Verruckt and they were sent to recover Peter McCain. Jiraiya sighed in frustration. That was a major kick to the balls if he ever saw one. Those sodas with the advantages they had would have benefited them greatly in this war with the undead. However, with them losing more and more people every day, and having them to lose even more people because of the sodas it is not worth the risk. If only there was a way to know who is immune and who isn't. 
then they would be able to minimize the loses they take. Jiraiya blinked his eyes as he came to realize something. What a minute, how can there be perk machines if they weren't here during the several times I came past this place? Naruto and Samantha, Takeo and Nikolai all gazed at one another in awkward silence. Something that was not missed by the ninja around them. XXXX. When Dempsey made his way through the door and into the building he immediately began his search for the juggernaut machine and the chalk outline. The chalk outline was the first thing to be found. It is on the wall in the worn-down front room where Dempsey literally walked in the second he came through the front door. He was a little annoyed when he found out the chalk outline was for a sidearm. He didn't know what type it was though. Though it was a little different than anything else he had seen. The juggernaut machine was located elsewhere, out the back where he would be exposed to being attacked from behind annoyingly enough. Knowing having more effective firepower was a must right now Dempsey went to change his sidearm first. Knowing his Colt. M1911 would be ineffective against the likes of runners and sprinters. Walking in front of the chalk outline the former United States Marine slung his M-16 over his shoulder and pulled out his M-1911 out of its holster, knowing if he didn't he would lose his assault rifle and gain a new side arm in its place. And he did not want that to happen. Sighing Dempsey placed his palm flat against the chalk outline. He felt the familiar energy being taken from his body as he purchased his new weapon, and his M1911 being taken and quickly replaced. Looking down at his hand that held his new weapon Dempsey was surprised to see a Remington Model 1858 revolver in his grip. A weapon that has not seen action since the Franco-Prussian War back in the late 1900s. He was one of the few people that used this weapon in the First World War. It was a reliable weapon and then it was replaced by the more advanced sidearms such as the Colt, M1911. Nevertheless, the revolver sidearms are easily the most powerful weapon you can have. Except for the wonder weapon known as the ray gun. That sidearm is in a class of its own and trumps all other weaponry apart from other wonder weapons. Nodding in approval Dempsey skillfully twirled the Remington revolver in his palm before putting it in the holster that has conveniently changed to fit it. Dempsey long ago stopped questioning why the holsters would change every time he gained a new sidearm. It was deemed best if no one thought on it because no one knows how it was possible in the first place. With his new sidearm acquired Dempsey made his way through the building and out the back garden where the juggernaut machine lay. The machine is thin with a red and white paint job. On the front, on the top white half had the quote, Drink Juggernaug, in bold letters. On top is a circle that that has an image of a shield with a medic symbol with a bullet crossing over it. The Juggernaug machine was up against the wall to his left. Smiling to himself Dempsey made his way over to the machine and spent the needed amount of currency he had built up from the recent zombie kills. He hummed to the jingle that would activate every time someone bought a soda from it. While Dempsey was busy getting the bottle from the machine, he never noticed something climbing its way over the fence and into the garden and slowly make its way over to him. It was a skinny-looking thing, and had some human characteristics to it. However it was mutated to the degree where it bared little resemblance to humans at all. The creature when moving would use all four of its limbs like an animal, where its fingers and toes would be now had claws in their place. It had a slimy, greenish-gray shade of skin and wore only a pair of torn black trousers. It had no eyes and taking up most of its face was an oversized angler mouth that showed a row of shark-like teeth. It was constantly emitting a faint trail of green gas. This is what is known as a gas crawler. A type 5 zombie that releases a special toxic gas that can disorientate you and kill other zombies upon its death. There is another type 5 zombie that has its exact appearance. It is known as the phasing zombie that can literally teleport in front of you without warning. Sniffing the air as he drank from the bottle Dempsey narrowed his eyes as he picked up a nasty scent he had not smelt since that theater in Germany. Taking one last mouthful Dempsey took the bottle away from his lips and looked to his left from the corner of his eyes. Suddenly Dempsey spun around and threw the bottle the bottle at the crawler who tried to sneak up on him. The bottle hit its mark, 
smashing to pieces when it collided with the crawler's face the pieces cutting into its face and mouth. The crawler roared in anger as it staggered back using one of its hands to claw at its face in an attempt to remove the glass pieces from its mouth and face, only to make it worse than before. With a deep scowl pulling at his lips Dempsey took his Remington Model Army revolver out of its holster, took aim and pulled the trigger. The gas zombie let out a death-like roar as the bullet entered through the front of its head tearing through it and exiting through the back like paper. Its last action was to flip on its back, curling itself up similar to a spider, and release a cloud of green gas. Having been on the receiving end of that fucking gas many a times in the past Dempsey quickly backed away while covering his mouth and nose with his free hand. With the other he was using his revolver as he scanned his surroundings for any other gas zombies since his previous battle experience with them showed they liked to travel in packs. Dempsey narrowed his eyes even further as he heard more gas zombies roaring out challengingly nearby. Snarling aggressively Dempsey used the hand that was covering his mouth and nose to unsheathe his combat knife and now that the green-colored gas was finally gone, and with the hand that was holding the revolver, he aimed in the direction of the fence just as several crawler zombies climbed over it. Getting down to one knee Dempsey knew he had to play this smart. The others would have heard the gun shot and would assume he was test firing it. They would come running if he fired more than once. Right now he only has five rounds left in the cylinder, and there are more gas zombies than he has bullets chambered. Not to mention the gas they let out once they're dead can disorientate him if he breathes it in. The second the first zombie came in his line of fire he pulled the trigger. The bullet went through the front and out the back of its head with little resistance. The zombie fell back off the fence, letting out a death howl. He saw the green gas raise up past the fence even as more and more crawlers appeared. He shifted his arm to take aim at the next crawler and pulled the trigger, firing the third bullet. The crawler fell off the fence and to the ground where it landed on its back and curling up before the gas expelled from its body. Unlike the zombies that would die if they were close to the gas when it was expelled crawling zombies are unaffected by the gas as they're immune to it. Dempsey fired another three times, two of them hitting their intended destination while the third hit its one on the shoulder, dislocating it from its socket. Growling the marine slashed and stabbed his knife at the crawlers that managed to get to him. Easily killing them with a stab to the skull. The crawlers did flip to their back and curl up on itself, but did not expel the dangerous gas. Getting to his feet Dempsey took a quick glance over his shoulder as he backed away from the approaching crawling zombies, to see where he was going and to make sure he doesn't accidentally pin himself down. At the same time he pulled the cylinder out of its slot and turned the gun upward so the barrel was facing toward the sky. The empty bullet cartridges easily fell out the cylinder and to the ground and was quickly replaced by a new six ones. The cylinder was then pushed back in the slot and was now ready to fire once more. By this time Dempsey who had to take a quick glance over his shoulder every few seconds because he was backing away was already forced in the house. He took aim at the crawlers who were funneling their way into the building through the one doorway with his revolver and taking precise aim so the crawlers were lined up he pulled the trigger. The bullet of the Remington revolver tore through the crawlers with little to no resistance. Fucking creepy crawlers. Dempsey cursed under his breath with hatred of the things lathing his voice. Sheathing his knife Dempsey grabbed a grenade, pulled out the pin and drew his arm back and held it there. Let's see how they'll like this. Three seconds later Dempsey with all his might tossed the grenade through the doorway and into the crowd of crawlers that were making their way to the house. Two more seconds later the grenade exploded. Taking the crawlers with it. If the others didn't hear his gun firing then they had to have heard the grenade going off, if they haven't then he was going to tear them a new one. Tutaying with annoyance at seeing more and more crawlers coming at him, even after he threw a fucking grenade at them, Dempsey quickly put his revolver in its holster and grabbed his M-16 that was hanging harmlessly from the sling. Scowling the former marine got down on one knee as he raised his rifle so the butt of the gun was pressing against his shoulder, took aim down the sights and burst fired into the crowd of crawlers. He heard footsteps rapidly approaching his position even as he burst fired on the crawlers that were determined on getting inside the building. Dempsey sharply looked towards his left when submachine gun fire was heard. 
Right there standing in front of the doorway, leading to the front room was Takeo Masaki himself, his Type 100 firing on the crawlers with no mercy. Nikolai was there standing beside the Asian, unloading his entire drum magazine on the crawling zombies. He had a deep, fierce scowl pulling at his lips that showed his deeply ingrained hatred for them. Naruto, Samantha and the ninja were nowhere in sight. They were unknowingly to him ditched by Takeo and Nikolai who left them to appease the curiosity of the ninja as to how there are perk machines in Yugikura when they weren't there before. They would have stayed and help explain to them, but, being the helpful men that they were they decided to leave the responsibility of answering their questions to Naruto and Samantha while they went off to help tank fighting off the zombies. You both took your time in getting here. Dempsey yelled over the gunfire as he sidestepped his way over to them. He took the opportunity to replace the used magazine for a new one now that Takeo and Nikolai were taking the pressure off of him. Where did these fucking things come from American? Questioned Nikolai, who also yelled over the gunfire as he changed out his now empty drum magazine for a full one for his PPSH-41. Dempsey growled in anger. I dunno. I saw them climbing over the fence after I finished drinking from the bottle. He loudly replied even as he was standing directly beside the two men. We gotta back off and regroup with Naruto and Samantha now that these creepy crawlers are here. Indeed, being able to scale over any surface would make them difficult foes for those which have not encountered them. Takeo said in agreement as he referred to the ninja with Naruto and Samantha. While those shinobi and kunoichi have faced zombies for the past three years, it is still possible they have not encountered these type 5 zombies yet. If these crawlers are like the phasing zombies they had faced on the moon then they were going to have problems. Being able to expel a gas that disorientates you once it is inhaled after they die is complete and utter bullshit. Then again the possible reason they didn't die when they inhaled the gas could be because they're immune to it. Think about it. All zombies in existence, they have thus far fought, were made by the exposure to element 115. The wonder weapons, such as the ray gun, the wonderwaff DG-2, the thunder gun, the Gersh device, the winter's howl all of these weapons were made by element 115. The perk machines was made with element 115. Takeo, Nikolai and himself along with Naruto and Samantha were experimented on by Group 935 with Element 115 and had no negative side effects, like death and reanimating as a zombie, affecting them. Mostly. Everyone excluding Samantha had suffered from a severe case of amnesia, but were otherwise as healthy as a horse. There is a pattern going on here. You'd have to be blind to not see it taking a few pot shots at one of the crawlers that got through the doorway. Dempsey and Takeo and Nikolai backed themselves up in the front room while supporting one another and keeping the crawling zombies from advancing. Speaking of which why aren't Naruto and Samantha with us? Dempsey asked when he finally took notice of their absence. The ninjas were asking questions on where perk machines came from. So we ditched the two and left them both to answer their questions while we came to help was Nikolai's straightforward answer. Dempsey stared at Takeo and Nikolai with a bland look. So in essence you threw them both to the wolves. He flatly said to them before bringing his gaze back to the crawlers and opening fire on them. The three were slowly forced to back away when the green gas began to spread through the room before dispersing into the air. Nikolai took a moment to think on his answer. Duh. We have. Dempsey had an eye twitching at the answer while Takeo rolled his eyes in annoyance. The zombies were still getting in the house. Crawling over the corpses of their own unhindered. They're speedy little buggers, and could cross several yards in less than 15 seconds. It was as if the bodies weren't even there. Even as the crawlers were dying to them Dempsey, Takeo, and Nikolai were getting pushed back nonetheless. The green gas just helped speed things along in the crawler's favor. Getting sick of their relentless pursuit Nikolai pulled out a grenade, cooked it and threw it in front of the crawlers before turning tail and run. Takeo and Dempsey saw the grenade being thrown in front of the crawlers. 
Instantly the two turned on the heels of their boots and booked it out of there just as Nikolai turned and ran away. And because they weren't sure of the stability of the house, the three of them made their way out the front to Naruto, Samantha and the ninjas just as the house exploded. Then the building collapsed on itself with a cloud that was filled with smoke and ash raised around it. Everyone in the vicinity all stared at the collapsed building with their eyes widened in disbelief and shock, before redirecting their gaze on Takeo, Nikolai and Dempsey who were in front of said collapsed building. Their backs to them. Slowly the three turned around and slowly walked away. I think throwing grenade was overdoing it a little. Nikolai said aloud in a questioning tone. The marine nodded his head. Yeah. I'd say it was, but, good work man. Dempsey replied, as he patted the Soviet on the shoulder both in complimentation and in thanks. Then suddenly he stopped in mid-step, prompting Nikolai and Takeo to stop and look at him questioningly. They became nervous and worried when they saw his eyes were blank and face devoid of all emotion. Suddenly Dempsey looked toward Nikolai and gave him the most scathing glare he was able to muster. I take those last words back. You just destroyed the building that had ammunition for my Remington revolver damn it. 